The Doll's Bad News By James Hadley Chase Chapter 1 Fenner opened one eye as Paula Dolan put some elegant curves in her fluffy head round his office door. He regarded her vaguely, and then settled himself more comfortably. His large feet rested on the snowy blotting pad, and the swiveled desk chair inclined perilously at an angle of forty-five. He said sleepily, away, dizzy, I'll play with you later. Right now I'm thinking. Some more curves filtered through the half-open door, and Paula came to the desk. Up, Morpheus, she said, V he got a client. Fenner groaned. Him to go away. Tell him we've gone out a business. I gotta catch up some sleep sometimes, haven't I? S your bed for. Paula said impatiently. Don't ask questions like that, Fenner mumbled, settling himself. Further down in the chair. Snap out of it, Dave, Paula pleaded, s a passion flower waiting. Outside, and she looks as if she's got a load of grief to share with. You he asked. Fenner opened an eye again. S she like. Maybe she's collecting for some charity. Paula sat on the edge of the desk. I wonder why you keep that plate on your door. Don't you want to do business? Fenner shook his head. If I can help. It, he said. We're in the dough, ain't we? Let's take it easy. Repassing up. Something pretty good. Still, if that's the way you feel. Paula slid. Off the desk. Hey, wait a minute. Fenner sat up and pushed his hat off his eyes. She really a passion flower. Paula nodded. Guess she's in trouble. Dave. Okay, send her in, send her in. Paula opened the door. She. Said, you come in. A voice said, you, and a young woman came in. She walked slowly past Paula looking at Fenner with large, smoky blue eyes. She was a shade taller than average, and pliantly slender. Her legs were long, her hands and feet narrow, and her body was very erect. Her hair, curling under her prim little hat, was raven black. She wore a severe two-piece costume, and she looked very young and very scared. Paula gave her an encouraging smile and went out, shutting the door quietly behind her. Fenner took his feet off the desk and stood up. Down, he said, tell me what I can do for you. He indicated the armchair by his desk. She shook her head. De rather stand, she said breathlessly. I may not be here very long. Fenner sat down again. Can do just what you like. Here, he said soothingly. Place is anyone's home. They remained. Looking at each other for a long minute. Then Fenner said, No you'd better sit down. You've got a lot to tell me, and you look tired. He could see she. Wasn't scared of him, she was scared of something that he didn't know. Anything about. Her eyes were uneasy, and she held her high-breasted body as though she was ready to jump for the door. Again she shook her head. Want you to find my sister, she said. Breathlessly. Am so worried about my sister. What will it cost? I mean. What are your fees? Fenner squinted at the inkwell by his hand. You. Don't worry your head about the cost. Just relax and tell me all about. It, he said. Me who you are for a start. The telephone jangled at his elbow. The effect on the girl was startling. She took two quick, graceful steps away from the, and her eyes went cloudy and big. Fenner grinned at her. Guess I get the same way, he said quietly. Pulling the receiver towards him. I fall asleep and the bell goes off. I guess it scares the shirt right off my back. She stood very tense by the door, watching him. Fenner said, me a moment, 
as he took off the receiver. Yeah, he said. There was a lot of crackling on the line. Then a man said with a very liquid accent. Dot. Moment now, Fenner, a girl is going to call in. And see you. I want you to hold her until I get round to your office. I'm on my way now. Do you understand? Fenner let his eyes fall on the girl, and he smiled at her reassuringly. Don't get it, he said to the telephone. Well, listen, only get this right. A girl will come and see you about a story of her missing sister. Well, hold her for me. She's suffering from delusions. She got away from an asylum yesterday, and I know she's heading for your office. Just hold her for me. Fenner pushed his hat onto the bridge of his nose. In hell are you, he said. There was more crackling on the wire. LL explain when I get around. I'm coming right away. Your fee will be paid on a generous scale if you do this. Fenner said, okay, you come on up. The girl said, he say I was crazy. The hand that wasn't holding her bag fluttered up and down. The seam of her skirt. Fenner put the receiver on its prong. He nodded shortly. She shut her eyes for a second, then her lids rolled back like a doll's. That has been set up suddenly. She said desperately, s so difficult. Not to believe him. Then she put her bag on the desk, stripped off her gloves and hastily pulled off her coat. Fenner sat quite still, his hand on the telephone, watching her. She gave a little sob and then, with trembling fingers, she began to undo her shirt blouse. Fenner shifted. Don't have to do this, he said uneasily. I'm interested in your case without any act. Once again she caught her breath in a sob and turned her back on him. She pulled the blouse off. Fenner's hand strayed to the bell. Maybe this dame was nutty, and was going to hold him up for assault. Then he stiffened and took his hand away. Her back showed distinct, livid bruises, startlingly vivid against her white skin. Some of them were in the shape of fingerprints. She put on the blouse again, fastened the buttons, and then put her on her coat. Then she turned round and looked at Fenner with her eyes bigger than ever. Now do you believe I'm in trouble, she said. Fenner shook his head. Didn't have to do that, he said. Came to me for help. Okay, why look further? You don't have to be scared. She stood there, torturing her lower lip. With her glistening teeth. Then she opened her bag and took out a roll of notes. She put them on the desk. That do is a retainer, she said. Fenner touched the roll with a thick finger. Without actually counting the money he couldn't be sure, but he was willing to bet that there was at least six grand in that roll. He got up swiftly, picked up the roll, and stepped to the door. Stay here, he said and went outside into the outer office. Paula was sitting at the typewriter, her hands in her lap and her eyes. Expectant. Fenner said, your hat quick, and take this baby to the Baltimore Hotel. Get her a room there and tell her to lock herself in. Take this roll and when you've fixed her, sock it in the bank. Find out all you can about her. Tell her I'll look after her. Give her the Yuri and good hands dope. Feed her a good line of syrup. She's got the jitters, she's in trouble. And she's still young enough to need a mother. He went back to the office. S your name, he said. The girl beat her hands together. Get me away from here, she said. Fenner put his hand on her arm. I'm sending you out secretary. She'll look after you. There's a guy on W.I. at AMIP who's interested in you. I'll take care of him. 
Hi you what's your name? Daily, she said. Then she swallowed and went. On hurriedly, shall I go, Paula came in, pulling on her gloves. Fenner nodded. Go with Miss. Dolan, Lai said. Down the back way. You'll be okay now. Don't get scared anymore. Marion Daly gave him. A timid little smile. Am glad I came to you, she said. See, I'm in a lot of trouble. It's my sister as well. What can she want with twelve? Chinese. Fenner blew out his cheeks. Me, he said, lead Ji her to the door. She likes Chinamen. Some pee in now. Just take it easy until I see you tonight. Do, you k pie. He stepped into the passage and watched them walk to the elevator. When the cage shot out of sight he wandered back into the office. He shut the door softly behind him and went over to his desk. He opened the top drawer and took out a .38 police special. He was playing hunches. He put the gun inside his coat and sat down behind the desk. He put his feet up again and shut his eyes. He sat like that for ten minutes or so, his mind busy with theories. Three things intrigued him, the six thousand dollars, the bruises on the girl's back and the twelve Chinese. Why all that dough as a retainer? Why didn't she just tell him that? Someone had bruised her instead of stripping? Why tell him twelve Chinese? Why not just say, did she want with? Chinese? Why twelve? He shifted in his seat. Then there was the guy on. They. Was she fresh from a nut farm after all? He doubted it. She had. Been badly scared, but she was normal enough. He opened his eyes and. Glanced at the small chromium clock on his desk. She had been gone twelve minutes. How long would this guy take to come? Up? As he was thinking, he became aware that he was not concentrating as he should. Half his mind was listening to someone whistling outside in the corridor. He moved irritably and brought his mind back to the immediate problem. Who was Marion Daly? Obviously she was a rich girl of the upper crust. Her clothes must have cost a nice pile of dough. He wished. The guy outside would stop whistling. What was the tune, anyway? He. Listened. Then very softly he began to hum the mournful strains of Chloe. With the whistler. The haunting tune held him, and B stopped humming his index finger on. The back of his hand. Then he suddenly and listened to the fluting. Sound. Beating out the time with felt a little sea at Lied. Whoever was. W at Isling was not moving. The low penetrating sound kept at the same degree of loudness, as if the. Whistler was standing outside his door, whistling to him. Fenner took his feet off his desk very softly and eased the chair away. Gently. The mournful tune continued. He though there was only one. Entrance to his office, and that. Put his hand inside his coat and felt the butt of the point three eight. Al. Was through the outer office, he had an exit in his own. Office, which he kept locked. This door led to the back entrance of the. Block. It was from outside this exit that the whistling was coming. He walked to the door and softly turned the key in the lock, carefully. Keeping his shadow from falling on the frosted panel. As he eased the. Door handle and gently began to open the door, the whistling stopped. Abruptly. He stepped out into the corridor and looked up and down. There was no one about. Moving fast, he went to the head of the. Staircase and looked down into the well. The place was deserted. Turning, he walked the length of the corridor and looked down the well. Of the other flight of stairs. Still nothing to see. Pushing his hat onto the bridge of his nose, he stood listening. Faintly, he could hear the roar of the traffic floating up from the street, the whine of the elevators as they raced between floors, and the 
persistent ticking of the big clock above his head. He walked slowly back to his office and stood in the open doorway, his nerves a little tense. As he went in and shut the door the whistling started again. His eyes went very bleak and he walked into the outer office, the point three eight in his hand. He stopped just in the doorway and grunted. A small man in a black shabby suit sat hunched up in one of the padded chairs reserved for visitors. His hat was pulled so far down that Fenner could not see his face. Fenner knew by just looking at him that he was dead. He put the gun into his hip pocket and moved nearer. He looked at the small yellow bony hands that rested limply in the man's lap. Then he leant forward and pulled the hat off the man's head. He was not a pleasant sight. He was a Chinese all right. Someone had cut his throat, starting just under his right ear and going in a neat half circle to add s left ear. The wound had been stitched up neatly, but just the same, the Chinese was quite a nightmare to see. Fenner blotted his face with his handkerchief. A day, he said softly. As he stood, wondering what the bell to do next, the telephone began to ring. He went over to the extension, shoved the plug in and picked up the receiver. Paula sounded excited. S gone, Dave she said. Got as far as the Baltimore and then she vanished. Fenner blew out his cheeks. Mean. Someone snatched her. She just took a run out on me. I was fixing up. Her room at the desk, turned my head, saw her beating it for the exit. And by the time I got into the street she'd gone. About the dough. Fenner said. Gone too. S safe enough. Right now that's in the bank. But what am I going to do? Shall I come back? Fenner looked at the Chinese. Around the Baltimore. And buy yourself a lunch. I'll come on out when I'm through. Right now I've got a client. Dave, what about the girl? Hadn't you? Better come now. I'm are you at nine? Fenner was inclined to be impatient. This office, he said shortly. Minute I keep this guy waitin' he gets colder and colder, and believe. Me, it ain't with rage. He dropped the receiver into its cradle and straightened up he looked at the Chinese unemotionally. Come on. Percy, he said. And I gotta take a walk Paula sat in the Baltimore. Lounge until after three o'clock. She had worked herself up to a severe tension when, at quarter past three, Fenner came across the lounge fast, his eyebrows meeting illy. Heavy frown of concentration and his eyes hard and frosty. He said. Pausing just long enough to pick up her coat lying on a vacant chair. Beside her, on, baby, I want to talk to you. Paula followed him into the cocktail lounge, which was almost empty. Fenner led her to a table. At the far end of the room, opposite the entrance. He took some care to pull the table away from the wall, so that he could sit facing the swing doors. Are you us in booze as perfume these days he said, sitting down, do. You think we can get some hard liquor in this joint? That's a nice crack, s Paula said, else can a girl do in a place like this? I've only had three martinis. What's the idea? I've been sitting on my tail. For three hours now. Fenner beckoned to a waiter. Don't say tail. It's vulgar. He, ordered two double scotches and some ginger ale. He I I. Sat with his back turned to Paula and watched the waiter order the drinks and bring them all the way back. When the waiter had set them down he reached out and poured one of the doubles into the other glass. Filled the empty glass half full of ginger ale and pushed it over to Paula. Gotta watch your complexion, Dizzy, he said and poured half the neat scotch down his throat. Paula sighed. Come on, she said impatiently, me in on the ground. Floor. 
I've been out of circulation for three hours Fenner lit a cigarette and leant back in his chair. Re quite sure Ness Dale walked out on you without any persuasions why Paula nodded. It was like I told you. I went up to the desk and started making arrangements for a room. She was standing behind me. I came and I felt sort of lonely too off my glove to sign the book I looked round and there she was drifting into the street. She was on her own and moving fast by the time I'd got through the revolving door she'd gone. I tell you, Dave, I got a nasty shock. What was worrying me more than anything was I'd got all that money on me. I guess you were nuts to have given it to me. Fenner grinned unpleasantly. You don't know just how smart I was, baby, he said. Guess I did. Myself I a turn. Sending you out with that dough. Anyway, go on. I went back to the hotel, asked for an envelope, put the money in and gave it to the cashier to hold. Then I shot out into the street and bat. A look round, didn't get anywhere, so I you. I Fenner nodded. If you're sure she ran out without some guy pushing her to it, we'll let it ride for a moment. Paula said, am positive, now let me tell you something. There's something mighty phony about this business. Someone planted a dead chink in the outer office after you'd gone, and tipped the cops. Paula sat up. Dead chink. Fenner smiled M at Esley. Yet. This chink bat a slit in his throat and had been dead some time. He would want some explain in a way. Soon as I saw him, I asked myself. Why? Either that guy was left as. Warnin' or else a plant. I wasn't. Talking, any chances, so I moved him out quick and tossed him in an empty. Office at the end of the corridor. Well, I was right. It was a plant. I hadn't got back more than a few minutes before three tough bulls bust in. They were looking for that chink, and, believe me, it took all I had not to laugh in their faces. Why? Paula asked, her eyes very wide. Suppose they found him there. I should have been taken due to the station and held. That's what was wanted. To get me out of the way long. Enough to catch up with this daily dame. These bulls softened up a lot. When they found nothing to holler about, but they searched the two. Offices. I had my fingers crossed. If they had found that six grand it might have. Taken a little explain in a way. Paula said, what's all this mean? Me. It just amuses me, but it don't mean anything yet. What did you get? Out of Miss. Daily. Paula shook, head. She just wasn't talking. I. Asked her the usual line for our records, but she said she would only. Talk to you. Fenner finished his scoich and stubbed out his cigarette. Investigation seems about to peter out, he said. Re six grand to thee. Good and no work to do for it. You won't sit around doing nothing. Not? She paid me the dough, didn't she? Then when I fix it so she can. Talk in comfort she blows. Why should I worry? When she wants more. Advice she'll contact me. An elderly man with a lean face, all nose and. Chin, came into the lounge and sat down a few tables from them. Paula. Looked at him seriously. She thought by the look of his eyes he'd been. Weeping. She wondered why. Fenner broke into her thoughts. What did you think of this daily dame, he said abruptly. Paula knew what he wanted. Was educated. Her clothes were class and. Cost plenty. She was scared about something. I could guess at her age. But I'd most likely make a mistake. I'd say twenty-four. I might be six. Years out either way. If she was anything but a good girl, she was a good actress. Her makeup was mild and she'd been living in the sun a lot. 
She was modest Fenner nodded his head. Was waiting for that. Sure she. Was the modest type. Then why should she take off her clothes? To show me her bruises. Paula put her glass down and stared at him. Is a new one, she said. Oh, I'll get round to everything in time. Fenner waved his glass at the waiter. Don't know about the guy who me while I was talkin', to He, and, told me she was nuts. That's when she went into the strip tease. That's what's getting me. It don't line up with her type. She just in. Her brassy six re. It don't add up took off her coat and blouse and stood. Around the off ice had bruised her, seven I I'll say someone had bruised. Her. The marks on her back looked like they were painted on, they were. So vivid. Paula though. Ugh fit for a moment. She was scared that. You'd think she was crazy and, by showing you that, you'd see she was in. A jam at Fenner nodded. While the weight might go like that, but I don't like it R was fixing. Him another drink, Paula glanced at the eaterly man again. She said to. Fenner, T. Look now, but there's a. Interest in you men over there taking a great. What of it? Fenner said impatiently. He likes my face. It couldn't. Be that. I guess he thinks you, remade up for the film's uncertain, and. He looked so sad that Paula G.A., he stood the elderly man got up. Abruptly and came over in Kura. V. Him and Jing smile. He addressed. Himself to fair you ear. You'll excuse me, he said, are you Mr. Fenner? S. Right, Fenner. Said without any enthusiasm. My name's Lindsay. Andrew Lindsay. I help Fenner shifted restlessly. Wanted your. I'm glad to know you, Mr. T. Be any help to you. His eyes wandered to Paula. And say, Paula said. I but Paula wouldn't see it. Sat down. On with a show of manners that almost embarrassed Fenner. Fenner's a very busy man, but I've never known him to turn down anyone who was in trouble. Fenner thought, this little smarty's gain to get smacked. When we're alone. He nodded his head at Lindsay because he had to. He said. What's bit in you? Fenner, I've read about how you found. The blandish girl when she was kidnapped. I'm in the same trouble. My little girl disappeared yesterday. Two tears ran down his thin face. Fenner shifted his eyes. Fenner, I you to help find her. She was all I had, and God knows what am asking has become of her. Fenner finished his whiskey and put the glass down on the table with a click. You've Told the police, he said abruptly. Lindsay nodded. Kidnapping is a federal offense. I can't do better than the FBI. You. Must be patient. They'll turn her up. Mr. Fenner Fenner shook his. Head. He got to his feet. I'm sorry, but I can't get round to it. Lindsay's face puckered like a disappointed child's. He put out his hand and held on to Fenner's sleeve. M.R. Fenner, do this for me. You won't regret it. You can charge what? You like. You can find my little girl sooner than anyone. I know you. Can. Mr. Fenner, I beg you to do this off his arm gently but firmly. He said. And my own Fenner's eyes were chips of ice. He took. Lindsay's hand boss. I don't work for anyone. If I want to take an assignment, I take it. If I don't, I turn it down. Right now, I've got something that's giving me an itch. I'm sorry your kid's got herself into trouble, but I can't do anything about it. The FBI is big. Enough to take care of your daughter and hundreds of other guys. Daughters. I'm sorry but I'm not doing it. He jerked his head at Paula and walked out of the lounge. 
Lindsay dropped his hands helplessly, and began to cry very quietly. Paula patted his arm. Then she got up and went out of the lounge. Fenner was standing waiting for her. He said savagely, as she walked up. You must start crimpin'. What the hell do you think we're running a dog's home? Paula gave him a mean look. Old guy's lost his daughter, doesn't that mean anything to you? Means a pain in the neck. To me, that's all, Fenner snapped. On back to the office, we've got work to do. Are times when I think you're cute. Paula said bitterly. Moving towards the reception hall. Right now I'd swap you for a lead. Nickel and a bad smell. A tall young man uncurled himself from one of the big lounges and stepped UIP to Fenner. M. Grosset of the DAS. Office. IWANT to talk to you Fenner grunted. I, in busy right now. Pal, he said. Round at my office tomorrow sometime, when I'm out. Grosset apologetically indicated two big cops in plain clothes who stood. Right in Fenner's exit. Kin talk here, or at my office, he said. Primly. Fenner grinned. Hold up. Okay, let's talk here and quick. Paula. Said, V.E. forgotten something. I'll be right back Say was still. Sitting there. She sat down beside him. She left them and went back. Into the cocktail lounge. Lind you mustn't feel that Mr. Fenner means to. Be unkind at she said softly. S got a case that's worrying him. He gets. Like that. He doesn't mean anything. 9. Lindsay raised his head and looked at her. Shouldn't have asked him. He said Belle guess I girl means a lot to me Plesley, my little. P. Paula o and her bag and took out a flat notebook. Give me the facts. She said. Can't promise anything. But I might be able to persuade him. The heavy eyes it up a little hopefully. Can do that, he said. Huskily. Facts do you want? In the lounge outside, Fenner followed. Grosset to a quiet corner and sat down with him. Distrusting. He was very watchful and. Grosset was smooth, just a shade too smooth. He flicked open a thin gold. Cigarette the case and offered it to Fenner. He then lit the two. Cigarettes with a gold lighter. Fenner said dryly, guys live well. Grosset said, L don't think we've run into you before. He crossed his legs, showing black and white check. Socks. V E checked your license. You were the guy who made so much. Money O-U-T of the Blandish kidnapping case. That was when you were a down at heel investigator new on the job. You got a lucky break and you pulled out of Kansas and put up a plate here. That's right, isn't it? Fenner forced a long stream of smoke down his nostrils. You're telling the story, he said, V.E. got it right up to now. Gross it looked wise. V.E. been in New York six months. You don't seem to have done much in that time. Fenner yawned. Pick and choose, he said. Indifferently. We got a pretty hot tip about you this morning. Fenner sneered. Pleasantly. So hot you sent some bulls out to haul me in and they went away with fleas and T. Grosset smiled. Then, we've looked over the block areas he said. V. E. found a murdered Chinaman in an empty at. Fenner raised his eyebrows. You squawking about. Office near yours. Want me to find who killed him for you. Tip we. Got this morning was about a dead Chinaman who was to be found in your office. T that said. What happened? Did they plant him in the wrong room? Grosset dropped his cigarette butt into the ashtray. Listen, Fenner, you and I don't have to fight. I'll put my cards on the table. That chink had been dead 36 hours. The tip was clumsy and we guessed it was a plant, 
but we had to look into it. Well, we're interested in this Chinaman. We want to get a line on him. Suppose you give us your angle of this. Fenner scratched his nose. Brother, he said, feel like I want to beat a drum in the Salvation Army after that speech. If I knew a thing about it, I'd tell you. If that chink meant anything to me I'd give it to you fast, but he doesn't. I've never had a chink in my office. I've never set eyes on your dead chink, and I hope to God I never will. Grosset looked at him. Thoughtfully. V heard you were like that, he said gloomily. You. Like to run on your own. And then turn the whole thing over to us after. You've got it sewn up. All right, if that's the way you want to play it. Go ahead. If we can help you, Vuffel, Budifujdi at ta trouble us, hard UG. Think the Empire act to his feet. Set, he said. You work to do. Seeing you watched up with have you, Dave, L she said, V e bin. Talking to Mr. Lindsay. I've got a record of what's been happening to his daughter. Wouldn't you have you look a tight, Fenner regarded her with a cold eye. You. We're in, your armor platen, LW howls it to you what I'm wearingly. When I get you back to the office I'm gain to apply something pretty. Hard to it, and baby, you'll kept perpendicular for a fortnight after I'm. Through with you. And listen, not another word about Lindsay and his. Daughter. I ain't interested, I've never been interested, and I never will be. Interested. I've got enough on my mind to last me a lifetime. Considering the size of your mind, it doesn't surprise me, Paula said. Coldly, and followed him out into the street. Back in his office, Fenner went straight to his desk and sat down. He lit a cigarette and shouted to Paula. On in, Dizzy. At me. Paula slid through the door and sat down at his elbow, her pencil poised. Over her notebook. Fenner shook his head. Ain't dictating he said. Want you to keep me company. Paula folded her hands on her lap. She. Said. LLB your stooge Fenner brooded. I could get an angle if I. Turned that money over to the cops to track up. I should be let in at M. And if I did. Gross it. Worried about the chink. Hill. We'll see our A state buoy fennel your th gross it and again before I dogs, and. The I Paula came out o fenner as he move o bin, keep his eye on me. Any ad I do is gain to be shared that bright boy. Not. He might find. The girl for you if you let him have a chance. Fenner shook his head. Am still playin' hunches, he said. Tells me that the cops are best. Out of this. Paula glanced at the clock. It was getting on to five. V. Got some work to do, she said. Won't get anywhere right now. Fenner. Said impatiently, around, stick around. Ain't you on my payroll no more. Paula settled herself more. Comfortably. When he was like this she knew it was better to let him. Have his way. Unless this dame contacts me, the case will peter out. I've got no lead to go on. I don't know who she is. She might come from. Anywhere. All I know is she's got a sister who's interested in twelve. Chinamen. If the dead chink was one of them, there are only eleven for. Her to be interested in now. Why did she give me all that dough, and. Then take it on the lamb. She saw someone she knew, got scared, and. Lost her head. Paula put in softly. Fenner thought this one over. You see anyone who might have given her. A scare. Paula shook her head. Know what the Baltimore lobby's like. That time of day. S an idea. Fenner got up and began walking up and. Down the gaily patterned carpet. That's how it went, then we've gotta. Stick around t us telephone for her to ring back. Maybe she won't ring, but if she does. 
I want to know about it quick. Paula groaned. Yeah, I guess you'd better run home, pack a bag and move in. You can. Sleep on the lounge. Paula got to her feet. Go home and sleep in your. Nice warm bed, I take it. Mind what I do. I'll let you know where you. Can get me. Paula put on her hat and coat. The office downstairs. Knows that I'm sleeping here, they'll begin to think things. S all. Right they know I'm particular. It won't blow out into a scandal Paula. Swept out shutting the door with a firm click behind her. Fenner grinned. And grabbed the telephone. He dialed a number. D.A. office. Give me Grosset. Tell him Fenner wants him. Grosset came. Threw after a barrage of crackles. Fenner. You changed your mind and want to talk. Fenner at Ed into the. Receiver. At an, CT at it yet, pal, he said. Want you to talk instead. S you found lying around. Did you find an at, on him that might help? Grosset laughed. God, Fenner. You've got a nerve. You don't expect information from me, do you? Fenner said seriously, Grosset, this case hasn't started to break. Yet. I got a hunch that when it does, someone's gain, to yell murder. I. Want to stop it before it starts. Warn you, Fenner, if you're holding. Back anything it's going to be just too bad for you. If something. Happens that I could have stopped, and I find you knew about it, I, am. Going to ride you. Fenner shifted in his chair. Skib. It, Jughead, he said impatiently. No I'm in my rights to. Keep my client covered. If you like to play ball and give me the. Information, I'll turn it back to you with interest if I think. TRC, Ubel Starden. How's that? Rhea Smoothbird, Grosset said. Doubtful. Still, why what I know won't be much good. We found nothing. Did they get him in, wasn't so difficult. They brought him in a big. Laundry basket, up the trade entrance, and unpack in an empty office. Before shooting him into your arcade him t try to pull that one fenner. Said. Boom um didn't bring him to me. They left him in an empty officer. Grosset made a noise like tearing calico. Did anyone see the guys who brought him, Dot? Thanks, pal. I'll do. The same for you one day. Not been else? Nothing that seemed odd to you, no, I don't think so. Someone had cut his throat and sewn it up for him, that's odd, I suppose. But I could see that. Nothing else, hey. Guess not. Fenner hung the receiver on its prong. He sat staring at the telephone. For several minutes, his face blank, and a puzzled look clouding his eyes. Paula, coming back a couple of hours later, found him sitting slouched. In his chair, his feet on the desk, tobacco ash all over his coat, and the same puzzled look in his eyes. She put a small suitcase on the lounge and took off her hat and coat. Break. Fenner shook his head. It wasn't for that dead chink, I'd. Write it off as easy money. Those guys wouldn't have escaped carting the. Stiff all the way up to my office unless they were mighty anxious to get. Me out of the way. Paula opened her case and took out a book. V had. My dinner, she said sitting in the padded chair near the desk. I'm all set. If you want to be excused, you can go. Fenner nodded. He got up and brushed himself down. Okay, he said. LL be back in a little while. If she rings, tell her. I want to see her bad. Get her address and still feed her syrup. I want to get close to that dame. Was afraid of that, Paula murmured, but. Fenner went to the door without hearing her. Just outside, two men, dressed in black suits, 
stood shoulder to shoulder. They looked like Mexicans, but they weren't. Fenner thought. They were spicks, but then he wasn't sure. Each of them had his right hand in the coat pocket of his tight-fitting suit. They were dressed. H, all in black, black fedoras, white shirts and dazzling ties. They looked like some turn that comes first on a vaudeville bill, only. When you got a look at their eyes you began to think of snakes and things that haven't any legs. Fenner said, to see me. He knew without being told that two guns were pointing at his belly. The bulge in the coat pockets couldn't lie. The shorter of the two said, we thought we'd drop in. Fenner moved back into the office. Paula slid open the desk drawer and put her hand on Fenner's point three eight. The short guy said, it. He talked through his teeth, and he made his message convincing. Paula sat back and folded seven her hands on her lap. The short man walked into the Zero Uter office and looked round. There was a puzzled expression on his face. He went over to the big cupboard where Paula kept the stationery and looked inside. Then he grunted. Fenner said, you'll care to wait, we can give you a hot meal and a bed. We like you guys to feel at home. The short man picked up the heavy ashtray that was by his hand and looked at it thoughtfully, then. He smacked Fenner across the face with it very hard. Fenner dropped his head on his chest, but he didn't move quickly enough. The embossed edges of the tray caught him high up on the side of his face. The other man pulled out a blunt-nosed automatic from his pocket and jammed it into Paula's side. He jammed it so hard that she cried out. The short man said, something and will spread the twist's guts on the mat. Fenner pulled out his handkerchief from his breast pocket and held it to his face. The blood ran down his hand as he did so, and stained his shirt cuff. We'll meet again, he said through his teeth. Back up against the wall. R want to look this PL at CE over, the short man said. Gain before I bang another one on you. Fenner suddenly recognized them as Cubans. They were the kind you ran into on the waterfront of any coast town if you went far enough south. He stood with his back to the wall, his hands raised to his shoulders. He was so furious that he'd DVE taken his chance and started something if Paula hadn't been there. He somehow felt that these two were just a shade too tough to take chances. The short Cuban ran his hands over Fenner. Your coat off and give it to me, he said. Fenner tossed it at him. The Cuban sat on the edge of the desk and felt through the lining very carefully. He took out Fenner, S note RISE and examined that. Then he dropped the coat to the floor. Again he went up to Fenner and patted him all over. Fenner could smell the spiced food he had been eating recently. His fingers itched to grab him R.C. the neck. The Cuban stepped back and grunted. He then turned his head. You, come. Here. Paula's mouth set in a line, but she stood up and took a step. Forward. T. Put your filthy hands on me, she said quietly. Aid. Something to the other man in Spanish. The Cuban s the other man jerked his head at Fenner. Come here. Fenner moved across the room, and, as he went past the short Cuban hit. Him on the back of his head with his gun butt. Fenner went down on his. Knees, dizzily, and fell forwards on his hands. Paula opened her mouth to scream, but the other Cuban poked her with his. Gun barrel low down. Instead of screaming, she caught her breath in agony and folded up at the knees. The Cuban caught her under the armpits and held her straight. The short man searched her. He didn't find what he was looking for. The other Cuban tossed her on the lounge and then sat on the armor of the table. The short Cuban searched the office quickly. 
he didn't make any mess. And he acted as if he'd done that sort of job many times before. Then he went into the outer office and searched that, too. Fenner heard him moving about, but he couldn't get his muscles working. He tried to get up, but nothing moved at his frantic efforts. A red mist of rage and pain hung like a curtain before his eyes. It was only when they had gone, slamming the office door behind them, that he managed to drag himself up from the floor. He put his hand on the desk to support himself, and looked round the office wildly. Paula was sitting in a huddle on the lounge. She was crying with rage. T look at me, damn you, she said. Don't look at me. Fenner lurched into the outer office and into the small washroom on the left. He ran the cold water into the hand basin and bathed his face carefully. The water was very red when he had finished. He walked a little more steadily to the wall-covered end. Found a ha at the of scotch end. Two glasses. He took a long drink. Miss head ached like hell. The scotch burnt him, but it knitted him together. He poured another two ounces into the other glass and wandered back into the office. Paula had got herself straightened out. She was still crying quietly. Fenner put the scotch on the edge of the desk, near her. Put it down, baby, he said. S what you want. She looked at men and then at the scotch. Then she reached forward and snatched up the glass. Her eyes blazed in her white face. She threw the kiski in Miss' face. Fenner stood very still, then he took out his blood-stained handkerchief. And that ived his face. Paula put her face in her hands and began to cry. Properly. Fenner sat down behind his desk. He unpeeled his wisat soaked collar and dropped it into the trash basket, then he wiped his neck. Carefully with the handkerchief. They sat there for several minutes, the silence only broken by the harsh sound of Paula's sobs, Penner felt like hell. The back of his head threatened to split open. The side of his face ached with a deadly throb, and the grazed, livid bruise on his neck smarted from the whiskey. He selected a cigarette from his case with fingers that trembled a little. Paula stopped crying. You think you're tough, she said, without taking her head from her hands. Think you're good, do you? You let two cheap gunmen walk in here and do this to us? My God, Dave. You're slipping. You've got soft and you've got yellow. I teamed up with you because I thought you could look after yourself and you could look after me, but I was wrong. You sat around and got soft, do you hear? You're yellow. And you're soft. Then what do you do? You let them walk out of here and you crawl to the bottle. Okay, Dave Fenner, I'm through. She beat the cushions with her clenched fists and began sobbing again. Then she said, Dave, Dave, how could you let them do that to me? While she had been talking Fenner just sat there, his face wooden. His eyes were half shut, and they looked like chips of ice. He said, when she had finished. Rewrite, honey. I've been sitting around too long. He got to his feet. I run out on. Me now. Just take things easy for a day or so shut up the office. I'm. Gain to be busy. He jerked open his desk drawer, snatched up the point three eight, shoved it down the front of his trouser band and adjusted the points of. Vest to cover the butt. Then he walked quickly out of the office. Shutting the door behind him. An hour later, changed and neat again, Fenner thumbed a cab and gave a downtown address. As he was rushed through the heavy evening traffic he sat staring woodenly before him. Only his tightly clenched fists, that lay on each knee, indicated his suppressed feelings. cab swerved off 7th Avenue and plunged into a noisy back street. 
A moment later it stopped, and Fenner climbed out. He tossed a dollar to the driver and picked his way across the pavement, avoiding the group of fighting kids milling around his feet. He ran up a long flight of worn steps and rang the bell. The door opened after a while, and an old, disreputable woman squinted at him. I can, he said shortly. Who wants him? Tell him Fenner. The old woman slid the chain on the door and pulled it open. How you go up, at stir, she said. Ike's restless tonight. Fenner pushed past her and mounted the dark stairs. The stench of stale cooking and dirt made him wrinkle his nose. On the first landing he rapped at a door. He heard a murmur of voices, and then a sudden hush. The door opened slowly and a slim, muscular lad with a pointed chin like a hog's looked him over. Yeah, he said. Tell like I want him. Fenner's the name. Bing, the lad shut the door. Fenner heard him say summit then he pulled the door back and jerked his head. On in, he said. Ike Bush was sitting at a table with four men, they were playing poker. Stood just behind Bush. The Fenner wandered in and other men looked at him suspiciously, but went on playing. Bush studied his cards thoughtful. Man with a red rubbery Y. He was a big, fat face and in-growing eyebrows. His thick fingers made the playing cards look like a set of dominoes. Fenner watched him play for a few minutes. Then he leaned over and whispered in Bush's car, regained to take an awful. Hydenel Bush studied the cards again, cleared his throat, and spat on the floor. He threw down the cards in disgust. Pushing back his chair, he Climbed to his feet and led Fenner to the other end of the room. You. Want, he growled. Two Cubans, Fenner said quietly. Dressed in black. Black slouch. Hats, white shirts and flashy ties. Black square shoes. Both little. Punks. Both wear rods. Ike shook his head. Tino, he said. Don't belong here. Fenner regarded him coldly. Find out quick who they are. I want to get after those two fast Ike shrugged. V.E. they done to you, he said. Want to get back to my game Fenner turned his head slightly and showed the gash on his cheekbone. Two punks came into my joint, gave me this, and got away. Ike's eyes bulged. He said. He went over to the telephone that stood on a small table across the room. After a long whispered conversation he hung up and jerked his head at Fenner. Fenner went over to him. Them. Dot. I rubbed his sweaty face with the back of his hand. V.E. been in town five days. No one knows who they. Hell they are. They've got a joint out Brooklyn way. I got the address. Here. Seems they've taken a furnished house. Got dough, and no one knows what their racket is. Fenner reached out. And took the paper on which Ike had written the address. He got to his. Feet. Ike looked at him. You gain into action, he asked curiously. Want. One or two of the boys. Felmer showed his teeth in a mirthless smile. Can manage, he said shortly. Ike reached out and picked up a dark bottle without any label. He looked inquiringly at Fenner before ye go, he said. Firmer shook his head. He patted Ike on his shoulder and walked out. They. Cab was still waiting. The driver leaned out as Fenner ran down the steps. T think that was your home, he said with a grin, I hung. Around. Where to? Fenner pulled open the door. Might get far, he. Said. You been Lehman your job by mail. The driver said seriously, things. Are pretty bum these days. You gotta use your nut. 
Where to, Mr. Other side of Brooklyn Bridge. I'll walk the rest. The cab shot away. From the curb and headed for the lights of 7th Avenue. Someone been knocking you around, the cab driver asked curiously. Nal Fenner grunted. Aunt Fanny likes to keep an edge on her teeth. Tough old lady, hey, the driver said, but after that he piped down. It was almost dark by the time they crossed Brooklyn Bridge. Fenner paid the cab off and went into the nearest bar. He ordered a club. Sandwich and three fingers of rye. While he bolted the sandwich he got the girl who waited on him to find out where the address was. She took a lot of trouble, finding it on a map for him. He paid his bill, had another short rye, and went out. Again. Ten minutes quick walking got him there. He found his way without asking. And without making a mistake. He walked down the street, looking closely. At every shadow. The house he wanted was on the corner. It was a small two-story affair. With a square box hedge so arranged that it masked the front door. Completely. There were no lights showing in any of the windows. Fenner pushed open the gate and walked up the slightly inclining path. His eyes searched the black windows for any sign of movement. He didn't stop it. The front door, but went on round the back of the house. There were no lights there. He found a window that was open a few inches at the top, and he shone his small torch into the room. It was empty of everything. He could see the dust on the floorboards. It took him a few seconds to raise the window and step into the room. He was careful not to make any noise, and he trod on the boards tenderly. Quietly he tried the door, pulled it open and stepped into a small hall. The light of his torch picked out a carpet and a large hall cupboard. The stairs faced him. He stood listening, but no sound came to him X. T the faint hum of distant street traffic. P. He went up the stairs, the point three eight in his hand. His mouth was drawn down a little at the corners, and the muscles of his face were tense. On the landing he paused again, listening. He was conscious of a strange unpleasant smell that was vaguely familiar to him. He wrinkled his nose, wondering what it could be. There were three doors facing him. He chose the center one he turned. The handle softly and edged the door open. The smell came to him stronger now. It reminded him of the smell from a butcher's shop. When he got the door half open he paused and listened. Then he stepped in AD pushed the door to behind him. His torch it up. F at E light and he snapped it on. Switch and he looked round the well-furnished bedroom, his finger itching on his gun trigger. There. Was OOLE there. He he was turned and twisted the key in the lock. T. Talking's chances. Then he wandered round the room thoughtful. A woman's room. The dressing table had the usual stuff. The bed was small, and a big night dress case ill the shape of a flaxen-haired doll lay on the pillow. Fenner went over to the wardrobe and looked inside. There was one costume hanging on the peg. Nothing more. There didn't have to be anything more. That Marion Daly had worn when she, it was the costume called on him. Fenner touched it thoughtfully while he tried to visualize Marion Daly. He took the costume out of the cupboard and tossed it on the bed. There was M.O.E. Spring in his step as he went over to the chest of drawer in. The top drawer was the prim little hat. He tossed darts on the bed t. Another drawer he found a bundle of underclothes, O.A.O. Zolzen Pender. Girdle, stockings, and shoes. He threw all these onto the bed. Then he went over to the dressing table and jerked open the small drawer under the mirror. Stuffed inside was her handbag. He pulled it out with difficulty, and walked with it across the room. He sat on the bed, slapping the bag on his open palm and staring hard at the carpet. 
he opened the bag and spilled the contents onto the he didn't like this. At all. Bed. The usual junk a woman carries around clattered into a small. Rather pathetic pile. He stirred the pile with his finger and then. Looked in the bag again. There was nothing there that he could see, and. He put two fingers inside and ripped out the lining. Crumpled at the. Bottom of the bag, either hidden there, or else slipped through the. Lining, was a piece of paper. He spread it out and peered at it. It was. A letter on a single sheet of note paper in a large careless hand. It read, Key West. Dear Marion, don't worry. Noalan has promised to help me. P.I.O. doesn't. Know anything yet. I think things will come out all right now the letter. Was unsigned. Fenner folded the paler carefully and put it in his cigarette case. He. Sat on the bed, thinking. Key West and the two Cubans. Something was. Beginning to add up. He got to his feet and made a systematic search of. The whole room, but he found nothing else. Then he unlocked the door. Snapped off the light and stepped quietly into the passage. He eased us way into the room on the left. His torch showed him that it. Was a fair-sized bathroom. Making sure that the curtain was drawn over. The window he reached out for the light switch. The smell in the room. Was making him feel a little sick. He knew now what it was and he was. Stealing himself to turn on the light. It flashed on as he turned the. Switch down with exaggerated care. In the hard light the room looked like an abattoir after a full day's. Work. The bath stood against the wall and was covered with a. Blood spotted sheet. The wall was marked red and the floor by the bath. Was red. A table stood near the bath and that, too, had a blood soaked. Towel on it. Fenner could see that it covered something. He stood very still, looking round the room his face. White and set. He took a slow step forward and, hooking his gun barrel under the towel. He flicked it off the table. A slender white arm rolled off the table. And fell on the floor at his feet. Fenner felt the cold sweat of sickness break out all over him. He. Hastily swallowed the sudden rush of saliva that filled his mouth. He. Looked at the arm carefully but he couldn't bring himself to touch it. The hand was narrow and long, with carefully manicured fingernails. There was no doubt about it. The arm and hand belonged to a woman. With a hand that shook a little, he lit a cigarette, drawing the smoke down into his lungs and forcing it through his nostrils, trying to get rid of the nauseating smell of death. Then he walked over to the bath and turned back the sheet. Fenner was tough. He'd been in the newspaper racket for years, and sudden death didn't mean much to him. Violence was just another headline, but this business shook him. It shook him more because he'd known her. She was his client, and only a few hours before she had been a living woman. The thing in the bath told him he couldn't be wrong. The telltale vivid bruises still decorated her body. Fenner dropped the sheet and stepped out of the room. He pulled the door gently to and leaned against it. He'd have given a lot for a drink. He stood there, his mind blank, until the first shock drifted away from him. Then he wiped his face with his handkerchief and moved to the head of the stairs. Gross had had to hear about this. He'd got to get those two Cubans fast. He stood thinking. That was it. They were planting her somewhere and they'd be back to get rid of the body. Fenner's eyes narrowed. All he had to do now was to wait for them to come back, and then give it to them. Before he could make up his mind. Whether to hunt for A and get in touch with Grosset or to just wait and handle it on his own, he heard a car draw up outside and a car door. Slam. He stepped quietly back into the bedroom, letting the .38 slide into his hand. He stood inside the room, holding the door open a few inches. 
he heard the front door open and shut. Then a light snapped on in the hall. He moved out a little and peered over the banisters. The two Cubans were standing in the hall. They were very tense, listening. Fenner remained awe them exchange glances. Where he was, motionless. He s then the short one murmured something to the other, who put his case down and came up the stairs fast. He came up. So fast Fenner hadn't time to duck back. The Cuban saw him as he rounded the bend in the stairway and his hand flew to the inside of his coat. Fenner drew his lips off his teeth and shot him three times. The noise of the gun crashed through the still house. The Cuban caught his breath in a sob and six ENT forward, holding himself low down. Fenner jumped forward, heaved him out of the ways and dived down the stairway as if he were taking a header into the water. The short Cuban had no chance to get out of the way, the sudden crash of gunfire had paralyzed him, and although his hand went unconsciously to his hip, he could not move his feet. Fenner's fourteen stone of bone and muscle hit him like a shell. They both crashed down onto the floor, the sea underneath. The Cuban had given one high-pitched squeal of terror as he saw something coming at him. Then Fenner was on him. The crash made Fenner's head spin and for a second or two he was so dazed that he could only lie, crushing the of out of his hands as he went Cuban flat. IES gun had SH down, and as he struggled to his knees, he was dimly conscious of a jabbing pain in his arms. The Cuban didn't move. Fenner cautiously got to his feet and stirred him. With his foot. The odd angle of the Cuban's head told him all he wanted. To know. He'd broken his neck. He went on his knee and seached the Cuban's PC its, but he didn't find. Anything. He looked inside one of the suitcases, but it was empty. They. Smear of blood on the lining confirmed his idea that they were taking. The body away in bits. He found his gun and cautiously went upstairs to have a look at the. Other Cuban. He, too, was as dead as a pork. Chop. He lay twisted in a. Corner, his mouth drawn up, showing his teeth. Fenner thought he looked. Like a mad dog. A quick search revealed nothing, and Fenner went. Downstairs again. He wanted to get out of this fast. He turned off the. Light in the hall, opened the front door and stepped out into the night. Outside, the car still waited. There was no one in it, but Fenner let it. Stay. He walked down the street, keeping in the shadow, and it was only. When he got into the Fulton Street crowds that he relaxed at all. A taxi took him back to his office. During the short ride he had decided. On a plan of action. He took the elevator up to the fourth floor and. Hurried down the passage to his office. A light was still burning, and for a moment he hesitated before. Entering. Then, keeping his hand on his gun, he turned the handle and. Walked in. Paula was sitting in an armchair before the telephone. She jerked up her head quickly as if she'd been asleep. Why haven't you gone H.E.? Fenner said shortly. She said quietly. Paula indicated the telephone. Might have rung. Fenner sat down beside her wearily. Paula said, I'm sorry about skip it Dave said, patting her hand. Blow off. Right now things are happening we're right to got hold of. That girl and killed her. I caught them Cartin. Those two Cubans. Her away. They. Re-dead. I killed both. Don't interrupt. Let me tell you fast. The cops must be kept out of this. This is between. Me and whoever started it. Are only the dress and those cheap punks. They ain't the whole salad. Take a look at that, he gave Paula the. Letter he'd found in Marion's bag. Paula read it through. Her face had gone a little pale, but otherwise. She was calm. Fenner's smile was M. West, she said. 
Paula puzzled. Earthless. Make you think. Dame wanted to FMD her. Sister. She said she didn't know where she was. Why didn't she tell me? Key West? You know, baby, it looks like a plant. There's something very funny. About this business Rose P.I.O. Paula said, reading the letter again. Who's no Allen? Here was a hard look in his eyes. Fenner shook his head. T don't know, baby, but I'm 90 in to find out. I've got $6,000 of that girl's money, and if I have to spend every dollar of it, I'm going find out. He went over to the telephone and dialed a number. While the line was connecting, he said, S gain to earn some of that. Do I've been at Ibn him. The line connected with a little plop. Fenner said. He waited, then he said, him Fenner. Tell him if he don't come to this at once, I'll come down and kick his teeth in. He waited again, his right shoe kicking the desk leg continuously. Then, Ike's growl came over the wire. All rent, all right, Fenner said. Hell with your game. Key West. Do you know anyone down there? He's got a this is urgent. I want to find someone I can contact in. Have an in with the guys that count. West. Key West. I grumbled. Don't know anyone in Key. Fenner showed his teeth. Bustle up someone who does. Ring me back. Right away. I'll wait. He slammed the receiver down on its cradle. Paula said, going down there. Fenner nodded. S a long way, but I think that's where it'll finish. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm going to see. Paula got to her feet. I go with you. Stick around here, baby. If I think something's gained to start, I'll have you down. Right now you'll be more of a help here. Gross it's got to be looked after. Tell him I'm out of town for a few days, but you don't know where. LL go over to your place and pack a bag for you. Fenner nodded. He said, that. When she had gone, he went over to his reference shelf for Florida at 12.30. He glanced at his watch. It was and checked the Pan American Air timetable. There was a five past eleven. If I back quickly, he could just make it. He sat behind his desk and lit a cigarette. He had to. Twenty minutes. Before the jangled. He snatched the receiver. The guy you want is Buck Nightingale, Ike said. S got his finger in. Most pies down there. Treat him easy, he's got a brittle temper. Have. I, Fenner said unpleasantly. It for me. Ike. Tell him that Dave Ross will be down on the next and wants. Introductions. Give me a good build up. I'll tell Paula to put a check. In the mail for five hundred bucks for your trouble. Sure. Ike's. Voice was quite oily. LL fix it for you, and he hung up. Fenner dialed another number. He said. With that packing. I'm. Catching the 12.30. Meet me at the airport as fast as you can make. It. He pulled open a drawer, took out a checkbook and signed five. Blank checks quickly. He put his hat and coat on and looked round the. Office thoughtfully. Then he snapped off the electric light and went. Out, slamming the door behind him. Chapter 2. Fenner arrived at Key West about MNE. He checked in at a nearby hotel. Had a cold bath and went to bed. He was lulled to sleep by the drone of an electric fan that buzzed just above his head. He had two hours catnap, then the telephone woke him. The telephone said morning. He ordered orange juice and toast and told the voice at the other end to send him up a bottle of scotch. While he was waiting, he went into the bathroom and had a cold shower. 
It was half past eleven when he left the hotel. He walked south down. Roosevelt Boulevard. All the time he walked he kept thinking about the heat. He thought if he was going to stay long in this berg he'd certainly have to do something about the heat. He stopped a policeman and asked for Buck Nightingale's place. The cop gaped at him. Renew here, hey. Fenner said, I'm the oldest inhabitant. That's why I come up and ask you. I want to see if you know the answer, and he went on, telling himself that he'd have to be careful. Already the heat was doing things to his temper. He found Nightingale's place by asking a taxi driver. He got the information and he got civility. He thanked the driver, then spoiled it. By not hiring the cab. The driver told him he'd take him all over the town for 25 cents. Fenner said that he'd rather walk. He went on, closing his ears to what? The driver said. It was too hot to fight, anyway. By the time he reached Flagler Avenue his feet began to hurt. It was like walking on a red-hot stove. At the corner of Flagler and Thompson. He gave up and flagged a cab. When he settled himself in the cab he took off his shoes and gave his feet some air. He'd no sooner got his shoes off than the cab forced itself against the oncoming traffic and pulled up outside a small shop. The driver twisted his head. Is it, boss, he said. Fenner squeezed his feet into his shoes and had difficulty in getting his hot hand into his trouser pocket. He gave the driver twenty-five cents and got out of the cab. The shop was very clean and the windows shone. In the right-hand window stood a small white coffin. The back of the window was draped with heavy black curtains. Fenner, fascinated, thought the coffin looked lonely all by itself. He read the card that stood on a small easel by the coffin. May we look after your little one if Tim Lord does not spare. F.H.M. Fenner thought it was all in very eud taste. He went over to the other window and inspected that, too. Again, it was draped in black curtains, and on a white pedestal stood a silver urn. A card bearing the symbol. Inscription to dust impressed him. He stepped back and read the fascio over the shop. D. Nightingale's funeral parlor. Well, well, he said, a joint. He walked into the IHOP. K.S. he opened. The door the electric buzzer started, and stopped as soon as the door. Shut. Inside, the shop was even more impressive. There was a short counter. Dividing the room exactly in half. This was draped with a white and purple velvet cover. Several black leather armchairs dotted. The purple pile carpet. On the left of the room was a large glass. Cabinet containing miniature coffins made of every conceivable material. From gold to pine wood. On the right was a six-foot crucifix cleverly illuminated by concealed. Lights. The figure was so realistic that it quite startled Fenner. He felt that he'd wandered into a church. Long white, black, and purple drapes hung behind the counter. There was no one in the shop. Fenner wandered over to the cabinet and examined the coffins. He thought that as a permanent home the gold one was a swell job. A woman came quietly from behind the curtain. She wore a tight fitting. Black silk dress, white collar, and cuffs. She was a blonde, and her big, gash-like mouth was very red with paint. She looked at Fenner and her mouth shaped into a smile. Fenner thought she was quite something. She said in a low, solemn voice, I help you, please? Fenner scratched his chin. You sell these boxes, H said, jerking his. Thumb in the direction of the glass case. She blinked. Why, sure, she said. Rejust models, you know, but was that what you wanted? Fenner shook his head. He said, was just 
curious. She looked at him doubtfully. Fenner went on, in. You want to see him particularly. S.Y.I. Asked, baby. Tell him Ross. She said, I'll see. He's very busy right. Now. Fenner watched her go away behind the curtain. He thought her. Shape from behind was pretty good. She came back after a while and said, you come up. He followed her. Behind the curtain and up the short flight of stairs. He liked the scent. She used, and halfway up the stairs he told her so. She looked over her. Shoulder at him and smiled. She had big white teeth. Do I do now, she. Said. My face go red. He shook his head seriously. Eleven just like to. Tell a dame when she's good, he said. She pointed to a door. S in there, she said. Then, after a little. Pause, she said, like you. You've got nice eyes, and she went. Downstairs, patting her blonde curls with long white fingers. Fenner fingered his tie. Frill, he thought, and turned the door. Handle and walked in. The room was obviously a workshop. Four coffins stood in a line on. Trestles. Nightingale was screwing a brass plate on one of them. Nightingale was a little dark man with thick lensed steel rimmed. Glasses. IES skin was very white, and two large colorless eyes blinked. Weakly at Fenner from behind the cheaters. Fenner said, M. Ross. Nightingale went on screwing down the plate. Yes, he said. You want to see me? Ross, Fenner repeated, standing. By the door. Think you were expecting me ver and looked at him. Nightingale put down the screw drat. So I was, he said, as if. Remembering. I was. We'll go upstairs and talk. Fenner followed him. Out of the workshop and up another short flight of stairs. Nightingale. Showed him into a room which was large and cool. Two big windows opened. Out to a small balcony. From the window Fenner could see the Mexican. Gulf. Nightingale said, down. Take off your coat if you want to. Fenner. Took off his coat and rolled up his sleeves. He sat by the window. Nightingale said, a drink. Dot. When the dfias were fixed, and Nightingale had settled himself, Fenner sparred for an opening. He knew. He'd have to go carefully with this little guy. He didn't know how far. He could trust him. It was no use getting him suspicious. He said at last, far you carry in me. Nightingale fingered his glass. With his thick weak fingers. He looked a little bewildered. The way he said. S what you want. Isn't it? Fenner stretched out. Want to get in with the boys? No. York's got too hot for me. Can do that, Nightingale said simply. Said you were an all right guy and I was to help you. Crotty's been good. To me, I'm glad to even things up with him. Fenner guessed Seati was. The guy I got on to. Maybe five C's would be more concrete than love and crotty, he said. Drilly. Nightingale looked a little hurt. Don't want your dough, he said. Simply. Said help this man, and that's enough for me. Fenner. Twisted in his chair. It quite shocked him to see that the little man. Was sincere. Swell, he said hastily. T get me wrong. Where I come from there's a different set of morals. Can give you introductions. But what is it? Exactly that you want? Fenner wished he knew. He stalled. I guess I gotta get into the money again, he said. One of your crowd could use me. Says you've got quite a reputation. He says you've got notches on your gun. Fenner tried to look modest and cursed Ike's imagination. Get along, he said casually. 
Maybe Carlos could use you. Fenner tried a venture. Thought no Allen. Might be good to throw in with suddenly flashed. Nightingale's watery eyes no Allen's the south end of a horse. So. Has no Allen with his pants down. You won't get any place with a piker. Like no Allen. Fenner gathered that no Allen was a washouts he tried again. Surprise me. I was told no Allen was quite a big. Shot around here neck and deliberately spat on. Nightingale stretched his the floor. He said. Wolves Carlos, R. S. the boy. Nightingale got back his good hum now, P.I.O.'ll get you somewhere his. Nim, P.I.O. Fenner slopped a little of his scotch. Carlos, S. got this burg like that he held. Nightingale nodded. Out his small S.E.U. 8 hand and closed his thick fingers into a small. Fist. That, see, you. Fenner nodded. He said, I'll be guided. By Nightingale got up and put his glass on the table. I've of a little. Job to do, and then we'll go down and meet the nine to go running around. Boys. You rest here. It's too hot ug height. When he had gone, Fenner shut his eyes and though is quicker than he'd. Imagined. The lid was coming off th he'd have to watch his step felt a little. Draft and he opened his eyes. The blonde had come in and was gently. Shutting the door. Fenner heard her turn the key in the lock. Jump in. Snakes, he thought, is she's going to me. He swung his legs off the. Chair Nightingale had sat in, and struggled to his feet. Stay put, she said, coming over. Want to talk to you me, honey, he. Fenner sat down again. S your no said, stalling for time. 39. She said. Call me Curly round here. Name, Curly Fenner said. S on your mind. She sat down in Nightingale's chair. Me type, she said, keeping her. Voice low, nine go home. Imported tough guys don't stand up long in this. Town Fenner raised his eyebrows. Told you I was a tough guy, he said. I don't have to be told. You've come down here to set fire to the place, haven't you? Well, it won't work. These hoods here don't like foreign competition. You'll be cat's meat in a few days if you stick around. Fenner was quite touched. You're being a very nice little girl, he said, I'm afraid it's no soap. I'm down here for a livin'. And I'm stickin' L. She sighed. Thought you'd take it like that, she said, getting up. If you knew what's good for you, you'd take a powder quick. Anyway. Watch out. I don't trust any of them. Don't trust Nightingale. He looks. A punk, but he isn't. He's a killer, so watch him. Fenner climbed out of his chair. Okay. Baby, he said. I'll watch him. Now you'd better blow, before he finds you here. He. Led her to the door. She said, I'm telling you this because you're cute. I hate seem a big. Guy like you headin' for trouble. Fenner grinned, and, swinging his. Hand, he gave her a gentle smack. T worry your brains about me, he said. She leaned towards him, raising her face, so, because B thought she was pretty good, he kissed her. She wound her arms round his neck and held him. They stood like that for several minutes, then Fenner pushed her away gently. She stood looking at him, breathing hard. Eleven you sigh, am crazy, nine. She said, color suddenly flooding her face. Fenner ran his finger round the inside of his collar. Am a bit of a bug. Myself, he said. Scram, baby, before we really get to work. Beat it, and I'll see you in. Church she went out quickly and shut the door. Fenner took out his. Handkerchief and wiped his hands thoughtfully. 
I think I'm going to like this job, he said aloud. It might develop. Into some a by and he went back and sat down by the open window again. Nightingale led him through the crowded lobby of the Flagler Hotel. Fenner said, Guy does himself well. Nightingale stopped before the elevator doors and thumbed the automatic button. He said, Did I tell you? Pio's the boy to be in with. Fenner studied the elaborate wrought ironwork of the gates. Retellin' me, he said. The cage came to rest and they stepped in. Nightingale pressed the button for the fifth, and the cage shot them up. Now I'll do the talkin', Nightingale said, as the lift stopped. Maybe. You won't get anything, but I'll try. Fenner grunted and followed the little man down the corridor. He stopped outside number 47 and rapped three times fast and twice slowly, on the door. Secret signs as well, Fenner said admiringly. The door opened and a short Cuban, dressed in a black suit, looked them over. Fenner shaped his lips for a whistle, but he didn't make any sound. Nightingale said in his soft voice, S all right. The Cuban let them in. As he shut the door after them, Fenner saw a bulge in his hip pocket. The hall they found themselves in was big, and three doors faced them. The boys in yet? Nightingale asked. The Cuban nodded. He sat down in an armchair by the front door and picked up a newspaper again. As far as he was concerned they weren't there. Nightingale went into the center room. There were four men lounging about the room. They were all in shirt sleeves and they all were smoking. Two of them were reading newspapers, one of them was listening to the radio, and the fourth was cleaning a rod. They all glanced at Nightingale, and then fixed wooden looks on Fenner. The man with the rod got up slowly. Is it, he said. He'd got a way of speaking with his teeth shut. He wore a white suit and a black shirt with a white tie. I.E.S. wiry black hair was cropped close. And his yellow-green eyes were cold and suspicious. Nightingale said, Is Ross. From New York. Crotty knows him. He's all. Right. Then he turned to Fenner. Riger. 41. Fenner gave Riger a wintry smile. He didn't like the look of him. Riger nodded. Do, he said. And long. Fenner waved his hand. Other. Guys friends of yours, or are they just decoration? Riker's eyes. Snapped. Said, stay in long, he said. Fenner eyed him. Heard you. It ain't no goddamn business of yours, is. It. Nightingale put his hand on Fenner's cuff. He didn't say anything. But it was a little warning gesture. Riker tried a staring match with. Fenner, lost it and shrugged. He said, Kane by the radio. Borg on the. Right. Miller on the left. The three other men nodded at Fenner. None. Of them seemed friendly. Fenner was quite at ease. To know you, he said. Won't ask you guys. For a drink. Maybe you don't use the stuff. Riker turned on. Nightingale. S this, he snarled. Who's this loud-mouthed punk? Miller, a fat, greasy-looking man with a prematurely bald head said, he's dug out a an ash can. Fenner walked over to him very quickly and slapped him twice across his mouth. A gun. Jumped into Nightingale's hand and he said, Don't start anything. Don't start anything, please. Fenner was surprised they took any notice. Of Nightingale, but they did. They all froze solid. Even Riger looked a little sick. Nightingale said to Fenner, away from him. Miss Voice had enough. Menace in it to chill Fenner a trifle. Curly was right. This guy was a killer. 
Fenner stepped away from Miller and put his hands in his pockets. Nightingale said, won't have it. When I bring a friend of mine up. Here, you treat him right. I'd like to measure some of you heels for a box. Fenner laughed. Tee that against etiquette, he said. Or do you take it both ways? Dump and bury. Nightingale put at Rod. Away, and the others relaxed. Pa Iger said with a little forced smile, at his heat plays hell lie. Went over to a cupboard and set up, R.I.S. Fenner sat down close to Riger he thought this one was the meanest of. The bunch and he was the one to work on. He said quietly, heat even makes me hate myself. Riger looked at him. Still suspiciously. It, he said. You're here, make yourself it. Home. Fenner rested his nose on the rim of his glass. In, he said. Riger's eyes opened. Ain't got time for visitors, he said. One comma eleven tell. Him you've been in. Fenner drained his glass and stood up. Nightingale. Made a move, but Fenner stopped him with a gesture. He stood well, I'm. Glad looking round at each man in turn. He said, I looked in. I thought. This was a live outfit, and I find I'm wrong. You guys are no use to me. You think you've got this town by the shorts, but you're fat and lazy. You think you are P the big shots, but that's where you're wrong. I think. 1, 11 go and see no Allen. That guy's supposed to be the south end of a... horse. All right, then I'll make him the north end. It'll be more amusing than playing around with guys like you at Riger. Slid his hand inside his coat, but Nightingale already had his rod out. It, he said. The four men sat still, their angry faces made Fenner want to laugh. Nightingale said, asked him to come along. If he don't like us, then. Let him go. A friend of Crotty's s a friend of mine. Fenner said, LL. Drop round sometime and see you again. He walked out of the room, past the Cuban, who ignored him, and took the elevator down to the street level. The commissioner at the door looked as if he had some brains. Fenner asked him if he knew where he could find Noalan. The commissioner said he'd got an office off Duval Street, and beckoned a cab. Fenner gave him a fin. Though the commissioner helped him into the cab as he were made of China. Noalan's office was over a shop. Fenner had to go up a long flight of stairs before he located the frosted glass paneled door, when he got inside, a flat-chested woman, whose thirty s were crowding up on her, regarded him suspiciously from behind a typewriter. No Allen in, he asked, smiling at her, because he felt she could do with a few male smiles. He's busy right now, she said. Is it? They? Tell him Ross. Dave. Ross. Tell him I ain't se at any at, and I want to see him fast she got up. And walked over to a door behind her. Fenner gave her a start, then he. Took two strides and walked into the room with her. Noalan was a dark, middle-aged man, growing a paunch. He'd a double chin and a hooked nose. I.E.S. eyes well hooded and mean. He looked at Fenner and then at the woman. S this, he snapped. The woman irked round, her eyes popping. Wait outside, she said. Fenner pushed past her and wandered over to the big desk he noticed a lot of spots on Noalan's vest. He noticed the dirty nails and the grubby hands. Nightingale was right. Andolan was the south end of a horse. Fenner said, is the name. How do? Noalan jerked his head at the woman, who went out shutting the door with a sharp click. What do you want, he asked, scowling. Fenner put his hands on the desk and leant forward. 41. Want a hook up in this burg? I've seen Carlos. 
He won, T play. Your. The XT on my list at so here I am at at Oalen said, where you from? Crotty. Noalan studied his dirty fingernails. Carlos couldn't use you. What's the matter with him? There was a sneer in his voice. Carlos didn't see me. I saw his flock of hoods and that was enough for me. They made me puke, so I scrammed. Come to me. Fenner grinned. They told me you were the south end of a horse. I thought maybe we could do something about a faint red crept into Noalan's face. They said that, did they? I, with me, you might have a lot of fun with that. Gang. Fenner hooked a chair towards him with his foot and sat down. He leant forward and helped himself to a thin greenish cigar from a cigar box on the desk. He took his time lighting it. Noalan sat watching him. IES eyes intent and bright. Look at it this way, Fenner said, stretching in the chair, for my way. I've come from Crotty. I want a chance like the rest of you for some. Easy dough and not much excitement. Crotty said either Carlos or Noalan. Carlos's mob is too busy. Big shotting to worry about me. I can't even get in to see Carlos. You. I walk in and find you sitting around with a flat-chested bird outside. As your muscle guard. Why did Crotty tip you? Maybe you've been someone. And Crotty's getting behind in the news. Maybe you are someone, and this. Is a front. Take it all round, I think you and me might get places. Noalan gave a little shrug. He shook his head. Not just now, he said. Don't know Crotty. I've never heard of him, and I don't believe you've come from him. I think you're a punk gunman bluffing himself a job. I don't want you and I hope I'll never want you. Fenner got up and yawned. S swell, he said. Can now grab myself a little rest. When you've looked into things, you'll find me at the Hayworth Hotel. If you no Nightingale, have a word with him, he thinks I'm quite a boy. He nodded to Noalan and walked out of the office. He went down the stairs, called a cab, and drove to his hotel. He went into the restaurant and ordered a turtle steak. While he was eating, Nightingale came in and sat down opposite him. Fenner said, with his mouth full, T you got any boxes to make, or is business bad? Nightingale looked worried. Was a hell of a thing to do. Walking out like that. I always walk out when I get a Bronx cheer. Why not? Riger ain't soft. That ain't the way to handle Riger. Gail ordered some brown bread, cheese, and a gone away he said, the order, and when she had makes it difficult for me little B. Fenner. Put his knife and fork down. He s at lead at the Owen like you. He said. Re the one guy who, s given me a handle, to now. Soul, J, os you stick. Around, I might do you some food. Nightingale peered at Fenner Fro. Under his hat. The sun, coming at through the slatted blinds, reflected. On high glasses. Might do me s me harm, too he said dryly s Fenner. Resumed his eshing. Hell. H at laid. Hell of a burg, ain't it? I s is a. When they had finished their meal, Fenner pushed his sea lair away and. Stood up. Pal, he said. LLB seeing you Nightingale s. Hopefully. Aid, might talk some time. He said it. Fenner took off his hat and ran his fin ars through his hair. Don't. No he said vaguely, don't techno. He nodded to the little ma at, and went out to the office. The hotel mappager was busy at the desk. He looked up as Fenner passed, and gave an oily smile. Fenner said, am gain to sleep. This place is Kaiyuan, me. Before the manager could at I at nothing, 
he went on up the stairs to his bedroom. He shut the door and turned the key. They, he took off his coat and hat and lay on the bed he went to sleep almost on his mouth. At Eddie Lee, a pleased smile th, the wk him. He sat up with a irk. Anstead had slept for twi 91 for o hours, and reached out. E over to the Flagler Hotel right away. THTI up his eyes. The boss I came this morning. I don't six he lay. Back or, there a minute or so I the same voice so like being kept. Wait in. I at you lay me and glass of milk. He kept his eye until the waitress. Brought Fenner said, Carlos to come out here, or tell him to go roll a hoop. He put the receiver on the prong with exaggerated care. He didn't bother to answer the when it rang again. He went into the little bathroom, bathed his face, gave himself a short shot from the scotch, put on his end coat, and went downstairs. The heat of the afternoon sun was blistering. Hotel lobby was deserted. He went over and sat down near the entrance. He put his hat on the floor beside him and stared out into the street. He knew that he wasn't going to get very far with this business unless he turned up. Marion Daly's sister. He wondered whether the cops had found the two Cubans and the remains of Marion. He wondered what Paula was doing. From where he sat he could look into the hot, deserted street. A big touring. Car suddenly swept into the street, roared down to the hotel, and skidded to a standstill. Fenner relaxed into the long cane chair and, reaching down, picked up his hat and put it on. There were four men in the car. Three of them got out, leaving the driver sitting behind the wheel. Fenner recognized Riger and Miller, but the other guy he didn't know. They came up the few steps quickly and blinked round in the semi-gloom. Riger saw Fenner almost at once. He came over. Fenner looked up at him and nodded. To see anyone, he said casually. Clerk's gone bye-bye. Riger said, wants you. Come on. Fenner shook his head. S too hot. Tell him some other time. The other two came and stood round. They looked mean. Riger said softly, on your dogs, or do we carry you? Fenner got up. Slowly. It's like that, he said, and went with them to the car. He knew Riger was itching to slug him and he knew it wouldn't do any good. To make too much fuss. He wanted to see Carlos, but he wanted them to think he wasn't too interested. They drove to the Flagler Hotel in silence. Fenner sat between Riger and Myler, and the other man, whom they called Bugse7y, sat with the driver. They all went up in the small elevator and along to number 47. As they entered, Fenner said, could have saved yourself a at P by play in ball this morning, Riger didn't say anything. He crossed the Room and rapped on another door and went in. Bugsy followed behind. Fenner. Carlos lay on a couch before a big open window. He was dressed in a cream silk dressing gown, patterned with large red flowers. A white silk handkerchief was folded carefully in a stock at his throat, and his bare feet were encased in red Turkish slippers. He was smoking a marijuana cigarette, and round his brown, Harry wrist. Hung a gold at Ed bracelet. Carlos was young. Maybe he was twenty or maybe he was twenty-four. M.S. Face was the color of old parchment and he had very red lips. Red, just. Like someone had slee over the wound above his ch re wide nostrils, and. His ear, Ms. eyes were large and fring he had no expression in the of. Black glass. Miss Hare grew away for all s forehead on either side of his temples. It was black, glistening, and inclined to wave. Take a quick look at Carlos, 
and you'd think he was a pretty handsome guy, but when you looked again you got an eyeful of his mouth and his lobeless ears, and you weren't sure. VN. You got to his eyes you were dead certain that he was bad. Riger said, is Ross, then he went out with Bugsy. Fenner nodded to Carlos and sat down. He sat a little way from the sickening smoke of the marijuana cigarette. Carlos looked at him with his blank eyes. Is it, he said. His voice was hoarse and unmusical. This morning I came round to see you, but your hoods told me you were busy or something nine. I ain't used to being handled that way, so I went back to my dump. I ain't sure I want to talk to you now. Carlos let his leg slide off the couch onto the floor. M. A cautious man, he said, have to be. When I heard you been in, I got on long distance to Crotty. I wanted to know more about you first. That's reasonable, I think. Fenner's eyelids narrowed. Sure he said. Crotty says you're all right Fenner shrugged. What? Can use you. But you gotta show me you're my type of guy. Let me hang around for a bit. Maybe you ain't my type of guy either. You've got a Carlos smiled. There was no mirth in it. Lot of confidence. That's all right in its way. Fenner stood up. I get along, he said abruptly. Do we go from here? Carlos got off the couch and talked to the boys, he said. We'll go down to the waterfront. I've got a little job to do. It'll interest you. Fenner said. I come on your payroll. We say a hundred bucks until we get used to each other. V.E. got to get used to each other pretty quick. Fenner said without humor. S. Chicken feed to me. He went out and shut the door behind him. Fenner, Carlos, Riger, and Bugsy entered a coffee shop an hour later. The place was full, and curious eyes watched them walk to the back. Through a curtained door and out of sight. Was a short, thick-set man, very much inclined. Fenner found that Bugsy was ready to be friendly. He to fat, with a round mottled face, gooseberry laughing eyes, and lips like sausages. Riger hated Fenner, and they both knew it. He walked with Carlos, and Fenner and Bugsy tagged along behind. They went down a short passage and down a flight of stairs. It was dark and rank in the passage, and very silent. At the bottom of the stairs was a door. Carlos unlocked it and went in. The room was very large, and Fenner noticed, when Bugsy pushed the door. Too, he had to use a lot of beef, the door was solid and shut to with a thud. The room was dark but for two clots of brilliant light at the far end. Carlos and Riger went towards the light and Fenner stood still. He looked inquiringly at Bugsy. Bugsy pursed up his mouth. Is his office, he said in a low voice. What do we do, just stand around? Bugsy nodded. Carlos sat down at a big table under one of the pools of light. He said. To Riger, him in. Riger went into the darkness, and Fenner heard. Him unlock a door. A minute or so later he came back dragging a man with. Him. He led him by the front of his coat just like he was a sack of coal, not looking at him, not seemingly aware that he was bringing him in. He went over to a chair close to Carlos and dumped the man into it. Fenner wandered a little nearer. The man was Chinese. He wore a shabby black suit and he sat huddled in the chair, his hands under his armpits and his body bent double. Fenner looked at Bugsy who again pursed his lips, but this time he didn't say anything. Riger dragged the Chinese's head back. Fenner made a slight movement forward, then stopped. The man's face glistened in the bright light. His skin was so tightly stretched that his face was skull-like. His lips had shrunk off his teeth, and only black shadows showed where his eyes were. Carlos said, 
gain to write that letter now. The Chinese just sat. There, silent. Riger jerked on his pigtail, wrenching his head back and then jerking it forward. Carlos smiled. Obstinate punk, ain't he, Riger? He pulled open a drawer and took something out, which he put on the table. His hand on the table. Riger put his hand on the skinny wrist and pulled. The man kept these hands hidden under his armpits and Fenner could see the tremendous effort he made to keep them there. There was a long silence while Riger struggled. Fenner could see the coming inch by inch from its sanctuary. Beads of perspiration started out on the Chinese's face and a low moaning sound came through his teeth. Fenner said to Bugsy, the hell's this? Bugsy waved at him, but said nothing. He just stared at the group at the table as if fascinated. Beyond speech. The thin claw-like hand gradually came into view and Riger, his mouth set in a hard grin, forced the hand onto the table. From where he stood, Fenner could see red-stained rags tied round each finger. Carlos pushed a cheap pad of notepaper, a small bottle of ink and a brush towards the Chinese. He said. The Chinese said nothing. He did nothing. Carlos looked in Fenner's direction here, he said, want you to see. At point one. I can see where I am, Fenner said evenly. Carlos shrugged. He picked up the object that he had taken from the drawer and carelessly fitted it onto one of the man's fingers. Fenner turned his back slowly on the group and took Bugsy's arm. If you don't tell me what this means, I'm going to stop it, he said. Hoarsely. Bugsy's face was like green cheese. He said, old guy's got three sons. In his hometown. Carlos wants him to send for them, to hook them up in. At Bia's racket. Those three guys are worth four grand ahead to Carlos. A. Sudden exclamation came from the other end of the room. Fenner turned. His head. The Chinese was writing. Carlos got to his feet, his dull eyes watching every stroke of the pen. When the letter was fufished the man fell back in the chair. Carlos put his hand inside his coat and pulled a .25. He took a quick step towards the Chinese. Put the muzzle of the gun at the back of his head and squeezed the trigger. The crash of the gun sounded incredibly loud in the silent room. Carlos put his gun away and walked over to the table. He picked up the letter, folded it carefully and put it in his wallet. Tell Nightingale to get rid of him he said to Riger, then walked directly over to Fenner. He stood and looked at Fenner narrowly. Do you like my racket, he said. Fenner itched to get his hands on him. He said very gently, maybe. You've got a reason, but right now I think it's a little too tough. Carlos laughed. Upstairs. I'll tell you about it the coffee shop had. An air of reality, not like the room. Downstairs that gave Fenner the jitters. He sat down at a small table in a corner and took three quick, deep breaths of hot air. Carlos sat down opposite him. Bugsy and Riger went out and disappeared down the street. Carlos pulled out a pouch and began to roll a cigarette. The tobacco was stringy and yehow brown. A mulatto girl with enormous eyes brought two small cups of very strong black coffee. When she had gone, Carlos said, re in this game now. If you don't like it, say so and you can get out. If you want to go ahead, I'll tell you how it works. Once you know how it works, you'll have to stay and get the idea. He smiled bleakly. Fenner nodded. M stickin, he said. Carlos said, T rush it. A guy who knows too much about my affairs is likely to run into a lot of grief if he wants to get out sudden. Have you gotta worry about? If I don't like it, that's my funeral. Carlos sipped his coffee and stared across the cafe with blank eyes. 
then he said abruptly, s a big demand on the west coast for cheap Chinese labor. When I say cheap, I mean cheap. The authorities look on chinks as undesirables, so they won't lot them in. Now, that's a cockeyed way of doing things. The demand's there, but the guys who want them can't get them. Well, that's my racket. I get lem in. Fenner nodded. Mean. You smuggle them in. S easy. On this coast there are hundreds of places I can get them in. The coast guards don't give me no trouble. Sometimes I'm unlucky, but I get along. Fenner scratched his head. Ain't any dough in this line, is at there. Carlos showed his teeth. You ain't q eat got the angle, he said. At it this way. First. The chinks are crazy to got in here. I've got a guy in Havana who. Contacts them. They pay him to smuggle them across the gulf. These. Chinks are so hot to get in that they'll pay as much as five hundred to. A thousand dollars. We take a load of twelve chinks at a time. Once. Those guys have got on one of my boats and have coughed up the dough. They become my property. I see them to the west coast, and a good chink. We'll fetch again as much as five hundred bucks. Fenner frowned. You mean the chinks pay to get in, then you sell them once they're in. Carlos nodded. That's it, he said. Two-way pay off. It's quite a game. I've shipped fifty chinks over this week. Taking everything into consideration, I'll pick up around thirty grand for that bit of work. Tiu's quite startled Fenner. He said, why in hell don't these chinks squawk? What happens to them? Can they squawk? They got no right to be here. They can't go to the cops. It mean jail and being deported again. We... Send them up the coast and they get their food and that's all. You can. Find work in everywhere. In wash places, restaurants, laundries. Everywhere. Did you want the old guy to write that letter? Carlos. Looked at him. Am telling you quite a lot, ain't I? Fenner met his. Glance. Your age. You don't have to worry what you tell me. Old. Guys got three sons in China. We ain't G at enough chinks over. I got him to write to his sons asking at M over. You know the stuff, selling them the idea of what a grand time he's having and what a lot of dough he's making. They'll come all right. Those chinks are suckers for that stuff. Fenner pushed back his chair. Do I come in, he said. Maybe you'd like a trip over the strait and collect some cargo for me. I'm sending over in a day or so. Fenner nodded. I'll do that, he said. LL look in each day. Your joint's a little too elaborate for me. It makes me feel coy. I guess I'll stick to the Hayworth for a while. Carlos shrugged. Yourself, he said, Bugsy and keep in touch with you. Fenner nodded and pushed back his chair. He said. He went out into the street, leaving Carlos still sitting at the table. Bugsy suddenly appeared from nowhere and tagged. Along behind Fenner. Fenner turned his head, saw him and stopped. Bugsy drew up with him, and they went on together. Fenner said, a racket, ain't it? Bugsy nodded. S all right if. You're some big shot he said, without enthusiasm. Ain't getting. Places. Fenner looked at him sideways, thoughtfully. T you getting. Anything out of this. Sure, Bugsy said hastily. I'm not. Grumblin. They wandered along the waterfront. Fenner thought this guy. Looked simple. He began to get ideas. He said, what's your rake off? Bugsy said, hundred bucks. S chicken feed. But it's tough. These, days. 
Fenner agreed that it was. They moved along the waterfront idly watching, the shipping. Fenner paused suddenly. He regarded a large luxury motor launch that was lying off the short jetty. He said, boat. Bugsy screwed up his eyes. He said wistfully. Do you like a tub like that? Fenner looked at him. Curiously. In hell would you do with it, anyway, he asked. Bugsy heaved a sigh. They? I'd get a flock of dames and I'd take em out. In that tub. That's what I'd do. Fenner wasn't listening to him, he was. Staring at a girl who had come up from the big cabin. She was a red gold. Blonde with a neat figure, long legs, and long, narrow feet. She wore white trousers, red sandals, and a red high-necked jersey. Fenner felt a little prickle of excitement. He knew who she was. He could see the points of likeness. This was Marion Daly's sister. Bugsy noticed her, too. He whistled softly. A frill, he said. Fenner said, who she is. They? Don't make me laugh. Think I'd be. Standin' here if I did. Bugsy looked at her wistfully. Fenner didn't hear him. He saw the name on the boat, Nancy W., and he. Wandered on. You around cramps my style, he said. IDVE got to. First base. AFDLL like that's class. She's got no time for her hoods. Fenner led him to a bar. The same, pal, I'm gain to have a try he. Said. When the Harmon came to take the order, Fenner said, not a swell boat. Out there. The bartender stared vacantly out through the open door and. Nodded. LL you have, he said. Fenner two gin slings. When the bartender brought them back, he tried. Again. Owns her. The bartender scratched his head. Boat is it? W, that's a swell boat. Thaler's the guy. He's got a heap of jack. Bugsy sighed. D want a heap of jack to make a dame like that. What's his line? Fenner went on. The bartender shrugged. Spends dough. One of these rich playboys, I guess. He live around here. Guy don't want to eve around here when he's got a boat like that, does he? Fenner lowered half the gin sling. S the dame. The Harmon grinned. Can't keep up with them, he said. I guess that guy's got a contract with the authorities to test them. Bugsy said, S a swell job. Maybe he could do with a little help. Fenner said, Er can you meet a guy like that? Him. He gets about. He's out a lot at Noalan's casino. Noalan's got a casino, at. Fenner. Said, looking at Bugsy. Bugsy sneered. S the south end of a horse. Fenner put his glass down. On the counter. Am beginning to believe that, he said, and, putting. His hand under Bugsy's arm he led him into the sunlight. Noalan's casino was close to Ernest Hemingway's house at TH at corner of Olivia and Whitehead. F equals Hosk tab get a look at the Hemingway. On E stop T0 to HSE 7 Gen H the casino. It was a hot evening, full of noise and river smells. The casino stood back in a landscape garden, with a half-circular drive leading to the big double front doors. Double porches and arched windows, fitted with yellow slatted shutters, gave the big house a touch of distinction. A lot of cars crawled up the drive, unloaded, and crawled on back to the street. Fenner paid off I'm cab and wandered up the long flight of broad stone steps. The front doors were open, and he could see a brilliantly lighted lobby as he mounted. There were two men standing by the door who looked at him hard. He put them down as Noalan's muscle men. He went on through the lobby into a big room where two tables were in action. He wandered around, keeping his eyes open and hoping to find the 
girl from the boat. He hadn't been in the room five minutes before a short Cuban in evening. Dress came. Up to him. Ross, he said politely. Vivi had of it. Fenner said. Will you come into the office a moment? Fenner smiled. Am here to enjoy myself, he said. Do I want in your office? The two men who had been standing at the door suddenly moved through the crowd and stood each side of him. They smiled at him, but the smile didn't reach their eyes. The Cuban said softly, D better come, I think. Fenner shrugged and moved with him. They crossed the room, went out into the lobby and into a small room on the left. Noalan was walking up and down, his head on his chest, and a big cigar clamped between his teeth. He glanced up at Fenner as he came in. The Cuban shut the door, leaving the other two men outside. Fenner thought Noalan looked in better shape. He seemed cleaner and his tuxedo suited him. Noalan said, Are you doing here? This is public, ain't it? What's but in you? Don't have any of Carlos's mob in here. Fenner laughed. He went over and sat in a big Lee armchair. TB a mug he said. Noalan stood very still. Better get out AN7 stay out. Fenner raised his hand. The monkey away want to talk to you. Noalan hesitated, then he gave a sign to the Cuban, who went out. You're not going to get anywhere being tough with Carlos, Fenner said. Stretching his long legs. Don't you get wise to yourself? What, s? Your game? Noalan said. S something about you I don't like. Fenner said seriously, don't know. But string along. If my bet comes right, I may have to bust this town wide open. To do it, I might want you. I don't like Carlos and I don't like his racket. I think I'll wash him up. Noalan laughed. Re crazy. Carlos is big enough to smear you. Fenner nodded. S how it looks, but that isn't the way it'll pan out. You'd like to see that guy go. Wouldn't you? Noalan hesitated, then nodded. He said, but he ain't. Gain in my lifetime. Fenner studied the toes of his shoes. Got a mob. If I wanted one. Noalan came and sat down. I, V.E. got a mob, he said. Cautiously, they're not in the same class. They'd be scared to start. Anything. Fenner grinned. When Carlos starts to slip. T at hats win. Your mobs got to 90 to work while Noalan clasped his hands. There was. A long silence he brooded. Then he said, replay in a tricky game. Suppose I have a little talk with Carlos. Fenner shrugged. Should. You? You've got everything to gain by just sit in tight waiting for me. To clean up the town okay. Then go ahead. I'll come in when I see you. Getting somewhere. Don't think you're going to clean my territory. Because you ain't. One move from you I don't like, I'll clamp down on. You. Fenner got to his feet. Won't worry about that for a little. While, he said. LL be plenty of time to take care of that angle. Later. Noalan looked up at him suspiciously. Don't trust you, Ross. You're too cagey. S. Thaler. Fenner asked abruptly. Thal. R. What's he to you? Noalan's eyes were suddenly hot and intent. Saw his boat this afternoon. Swell job. Heard he came out here. Thought I'd like to look him over. Noalan got up and walked to the door. S out there now. Fenner followed him into the main hall. Show. Him to me, he said. Want to meet him. Noalan wandered through the crowd, looked right and left, then said, S play in on the third. 
the guy sitting next to the blonde twist. Fenner saw the girl. She looked fine sitting there. The soft light reflected on her red gold hair, making deep shadows of her eyes and making her red lips glisten. She was wearing a black dress that fitted her too well. Fenner said, S the frill. He said it very casualty. Glory Liedler. She's good, isn't she? The blood had mounted in Noalan's face, and his blue eyes were watery. Fenner looked at him curiously. Noalan went on, LL have to wait if you want to meet Thaler. He won't want to be interrupted. That's all. Right. This Liedler girl, what is she? Noalan turned his head and looked at Fenner. The excitement. Not. She's a riot, ain't she? Noalan sneered. LL leave you for a little while. I've got things, to do, he said, and walked away. Fenner looked after him, wondered what it was all about, and walked over to the small bar at the end of the room. He ordered a rye and ginger and leaned against the bar. From where he stood he could just see Glory's head and shoulders. He looked at T. Haler and studied him, a big man, with a very sunburnt complexion and black crinkly hair. His china blue eyes and his long thin nose made him look handsome. When Fenner glanced at Glory again he found she was looking at him. Fenner regarded her thoughtfully, wondering at the uncanny likeness. If this dame wasn't Marion Miley's sister, then he was a three-legged horse. T. Baylor leaned over a little and spoke to her, and she started. Fenner couldn't be sure, but he thought she had smiled at him. He thought maybe it had been a trick of the light, but it certainly seemed that she'd given him a come hither. He watched her closely, but she didn't look in his direction again. He stayed there for several minutes, then he saw her speak to T. Haler and stand up. Thaler looked angry and put his hand on her wrist, but she shook her head, laughed at him and walked away from the table. Thaler screwed his head round to watch her, then turned back to the table again. She came over to the bar. There were two other men standing close by. And the small Cuban manager. Fenner said, alone is a vice. Will you have one with me? She didn't look at him, but opened her small bag and took out a ten-dollar bill. Like vice, she said softly, and ordered a gin sling. She stood with her back three quarters to him. He could just see the lobe of her ear and the strong line of her chin. Fenner at bed his rye and ginger quickly and signaled the bartender for another. He studied her back thoughtfully, wondering. When the bartender put his order down on the polished wood, and had gone away, he said. Liedler, I want to talk to you. She turned her head. They. That's. Your name, ain't it? Dot. Her gaze began to embarrass him. He had a. Sudden uncomfortable feeling that she was seeing through him. No one had ever given him that feeling before. It confused him. My name's Ross. I'm staying at the Hayworth. I want he broke off. Thaler was coming over fast. A heavy scowl darkened his face, and he came up to the bar with long quick strides. He said to Glory, For God's sake, can't you just de? Glory, laughed at him. She said in a clear voice. Think. He's marvelous. I think he's absolutely incredibly marvelous. Thaler looked uneasily at Fenner. Cut it out. Glory, L he said under his breath. She went on. S the most beautiful thing I've seen, look at his arms. Look at the size of them. Look at the set of his neck, the way he holds. His head. Fenner took out his handkerchief and wiped his hands. He finished his drink. The Cuban manager was watching him, a cold look. 
of contempt on his face. T. Haler said savagely, don't have to rave about his arms or his neck. Him to have a drink. He's cute. Do you know what he said to me? He said, drinking alone suffice. Glory turned her head and smiled. At Fenner. T. Haler said to Fenner, out of here, you. Glory giggled. B. Friendly. You're making him embarrassed. That's no way to talk to a lovely man like that. Fenner said, yourself, playboy. You're a little too soft to talk big. T. Haler made a move, but the Cuban manager slid between them. He said something to Thaler in a low voice. Thaler looked at Fenner over the top of the Cuban's bead, his face was flushed with suppressed rage, then he turned, took Glory by the wrist and walked out of the room. Fenner said to the Cuban, Girl. The Cuban said, You'd better go. Too, and turned away. Fenner stood thinking, then he snapped his fingers and left. He ran. Through the lobby, out Iudo the Black Knight. A cab shot up to the entrance and the driver swung the door open. Fenner said, Fast, and climbed into the cab. Although the cab went fast, Thaler was already on board the Nancy W. When Fenner arrived, Fenner saw the light in the cabin flash as he paid off the cab driver. He looked hastily up and down the deserted waterfront, then ran along the jetty and climbed on board. Moving quietly, he reached the cabin. By lying full length, he could look down through the glass panel which was half open. Glory was standing in the middle of the cabin, rubbing her wrist and looking at the ear, who was leaning against the door. S time we had a showdown, he said. His voice came quite clearly to Fenner. I've been a sucker long enough. Glory turned her back on him. I get out of. She said unevenly, never want to see you again. Thaler went over to the sideboard and poured himself a drink. His hands shook so that the liquor slopped on the polished surface. I've done a hell of a lot for you, he said. It's always the same. I know you're crazy, but can't you try? That's what gets me, you don't even try. Glory moved round the room. She reminded Fenner of a caged animal. I'm sorry for you, Thaler said. She spun round. Re-crazy. Do you think your sorrow means anything to me? One sorrow has ever meant anything to you. You haven't any feeling, anyway. I have that sort of feeling. Thaler held the glass in his hand very tightly. Fenner could see his knuckles were white. This. I'm through with you. I'm not going to have another evening like this one. Glory laughed suddenly. I'm sending you away. Not you sending me. Shall I tell you why? I'm sick of hearing it. I know it backwards. Glory said spitefully, you don't. It's because you're no good. You were never any good. You're a flop. You don't know anything. You only think you do. Thaler put his glass carefully on the table. He walked over to her, and put his hands on her shoulders. His face was white. You know that's a damn lie, don't you, he said. She flung his hands off. V got through telling lies to you, Harry. She said. Isn't fun anymore. One time I DVE let you keep your silly little pride. I can't be bothered now. Thaler smacked her face. Fenner pushed his hat to the back of his head and moved a little further. Forward. Thaler said in a trembling voice, L I'll kill you for that. Glory. Felt her cheek. Haven't the nerve to kill a rumor, she snapped back. T you get tired using your head as a hat stand. 
Why don't you get wise? I'm through with you. I'm giving you the air. Thaler went very white. S this other guy, hi, he said. IES hand touched the glass. And he picked it up. Go easy with your blood pressure, Glory sneered, you'll bust. Something. As she opened the door, Thaler flung the glass at her. It splintered against the wall a yard from her head. Fenner drew away from the cabin skylight and stood up. Let fight, he thought, and, turning, he went away from the boat. Heading towards his hotel. Chapter 3 Fenner was in Nightingale's workroom, watch dot dash dot on the little man. Staining a box when Riger came in. Riger said, got a job for you. I'll pick you up here at 8. O'clock. Fenner lit a cigarette. S the job. LLC. Riger. You ain't getting that way with me. Either you work with me or to Bell. With it. What's, job? Riger scratched the side of his mouth with his. Thumbnail. V.E. got a consignment of chinks. We're bringing them over. Tom. Fenner said, I'll be here. Riger well, out. Friendly guy that, Fenner said to Nightingale. I don't think he in. Lit it off. Nightingale looked worried. Rehandlin' that guy wrong. He said, shaking his head. S mean. You'd better watch him. Fenner. Drummed on the top of a coffin lid with his fingers LL watch him all. Right, he said. He nodded to Nightingale and went downstairs. Curly was. Sitting at the desk writing in a ledger. She looked up hopefully as he. Went past. Fenner paused. Baby, he said. S a nice face and figure you're. We're in this morning. Curly opened her big eyes. She said. Don't. Get much of that syrup. Mind. It comes as a nice surprise when you. Do. Curly nibbled the top of her pen. She looked at him with thoughtful. Eyes. Re in this now, she said. Fenner nodded. Seen P.I.O. V.E. Seen dot. Curly sighed. T. He a beautiful guy. Wouldn't call him that. You don't think a lot of him. Do you? 63. Ed. Sure, he said. T get you'd like to put your curl tell me all. Your troubles. Fenner grinned she snapped. V got no troubles. Ned A.G. And went into the street. So that's the way it is, he thought. Curly had. Gone soft on Carlos and was getting nowhere. It was T. Carlos. Enough to fall for a little rat-like. He walked for some time through the narrow streets, retracing his steps. Going into a bar for a short drink, and all the time checking to find. Out if anyone was taffling him, when he was satisfied no one was, he. Headed due at toll, again. When he reached the federal building he loitered outside, keeping a. Close watch on the street, then he ducked into the building and took the. Elevator to the federal field office. The federal agent was named Hoskiss. He stood up behind his desk and offered a moist hand. Fenner shook hands and sat down heavily in the chair opposite Hoskiss. He took some papers out of his inside pocket and handed them over. They. Name's Fenner. Here's my license that permits me to operate as a private. Investigator. I'm on business for a client down here and I want you to know some facts. I Hoskiss examined the papers, frowned, and then said, Fenner. You the guy who broke the blandish kidnapping case. Fenner. Nodded. Well. That's fine, Hoskiss at Ed. Used to know Brennan. He told me. All about it why, sure, if I can help you I'll be glad. Can't give. You all the facts, but I'm looking for a girl. Somehow or other Carlos is tied up to the business. I've 
Curly said bitterly, Does it matter what I think? Fenner had a sudden idea. He sat on the edge of her desk. Wait a minute. Baby, don't get that way. Carlos mean anything to you. Curly said. Guy means anything to me. You keep your nose out of my business, will you? Her eyes told quite a lot. He stood up and me w little at twt got an introduction to Carlos which was a fake and I've a hook up with his gang. I want you to know about. Because I don't want to run foul of your boys. Tonight I'm going with Riger to collect a cargo of chinks. We are due to leave around eight o'clock. I thought maybe you'd eat to bear about that. Haas kiss blew out his cheeks. Hell, he said, don't seem to know what sort of an outfit you're bucking. Listen, if Carlos hears about this you'll be cat's meat. That guy is the most dangerous rat on the coast. Fenner shrugged. I know that, he said. Was careful. I don't think anyone spotted me. Coming here. Why haven't you clamped down on that gang? No evidence. We know what his game is, but we've never caught him at it. We've got aeroplanes and boats watching the coast, but he seems to slip through. Easily enough. Once we did catch up with him, but he hadn't anything on board. They're a tough gang. I'm betting they dumped the aliens overboard as soon as they saw our boat heading towards them. Fenner scratched his head. You catch up on us tonight you've got to let me out somehow. It's Riger I'd like to see in a EAE, but I've got to be in the clear. So I can carry on with my investigation. Hoskiss said, I'll fix that. For you. You wouldn't like to tell me what it's all about. Fenner shook. His head. Right now, he said cautiously. I guess maybe I'll need. Your help for the final cleanup but all I want now is for you to keep me in the clear if trouble comes my way. He stood up. Hoskiss shook hands. Don't know your course for tonight. Fenner shook his head. He said, LL have to find us. We'll find you all right. I'll have the straight lousy with boats. Out. In the street again Fenner went on to the waterfront and picked up. Bugsy. They went up to the Flagler Hotel. Carlos was by himself when they entered number 47. He nodded to them. He said to Bugsy, outside and rest yourself. Bugsy looked surprised, but he went out. Carlos looked at Fenner. Then he said, why did you go to Noalan's joint the other night? Fenner said, am working for your mob. But I don't have to play with them, do I? Carlos said, didn't play. You went into Noalan's office, why? Fenner thought quickly. Carlos was standing very still, his hand hovering near the front of his coat. Did go into play, but Noalan sent for me and told me to clear out. He didn't want any of your mob in his joint, Fenner said. Carlos said tried to talk with the Liedler woman why not Fenner thought this was getting on dangerous ground guy would try for a fffll like that she was on her own so I thought we might get friendly what do you know about her Carlos's eyes snapped mind about that I don't like the way you're acting Ross both those stories come too Easy. I think I'll watch you. Fenner shrugged. Relosing your nerve. He said contemptuously. You ain't scared of Noalan. Carlos jerked his head. Can go, he said, and walked to the window. Fenner went out thoughtfully. This guy wasn't such a dope as he'd thought. He would have to play his cards carefully. He said to Bugsy. I'll be with you in a second. I want to my hotel until I won't be. In tonight. He shut himself in a booth and called Noalan. Bugsy hung. 
about outside? Fenner said, keeping his voice low. Ross Beacon. Listen, Carlos has got a plant at your gambling house. He knew you and me had a talk, and he knew other things. That Cuban manager of yours. Had him long. Months. Noalan's voice sounded worried. LL check up. On him. Said Fenner grimly, D get rid of that guy quick, and he. Hung up. He walked out of the booth and took Bugsy's arm. LL Goan. Take things easy, he sz like I'll have a little hard work tonight. Bugsy went with him. He said in a low, confident voice, Eleven got a date. Myself. He closed his eyes and smiled. Fenner showed at Nightingale's two minutes before eight. Riger and Miller were already there. Miller was greasing a submachine gun. They both looked up as Fenner followed Nightingale into the workroom. Fenner said, smell rain. Riger grunted, but Miller said in a false, friendly way, s what we want, rain. Nightingale said to Fenner in a low voice, got a rod. Fenner shook his head. Nightingale went over to a drawer and took out a big automatic. Riger jerked up his head. Don't want a rod. Nightingale took no notice. He handed the gun to Fenner. Riger seemed to get quite excited. Tell you he don't want a rod, he said, standing up. Fenner looked at him. It a haircut, he said. Feel safer with a rod. They stared at each other, then Riger shrugged and sat down a gall. Nightingale gave a peculiar smile. Given up packing a rod, he said to Fenner. Tell me your dynamite. With a trigger tfuye in his hand. Fenner balanced the automatic thou I get by was all he said. Miller looked at the small watch that seemed out of place on his thick wrist. Esco, he said. He wrapped the machine gun in his dust coat and picked up his hat. Riger moved to the door. Nightingale said softly to Fenner, watch. Those two birds. There was a big sedan parked outside the funeral. Parlor. Riger got under the driving wheel, and Fenner and Miller got in behind. Fenner waved his hand to Nightingale as the car slid away. He caught a glimpse of Curly watching behind Nightingale. He could just make out the blurred outline of her face. He said to Miller, never comes on these runs, do she? Why should he? Miller said shortly. Riger swung the car south. Re always asking questions, ain't you? He said. They rode the rest of the way in silence. When they got down to the waterfront they left the car parked and walked rapidly down to the line. Of small ship Peeny. A tall negro and Bugsy were waiting alongside a 40-foot boat. As soon as the negro saw them coming he climbed aboard and disappeared into the engine room. Bugsy stood ready to cast off. Riger said, while Miller climbed aboard, any thine, don't do until they come alongside. Then you gotta watch them as they come aboard. Not. One of these chinks must have guns. The safest way to deal with them is to make them strip as they come on board. It takes time, but it's safe. If you think one of them, s got a rod, take it off him. If b looks like start in anything, give it to him. Miller will take them from you and put them in the forward cabin. Fenner said, sure, and followed Riger on board. Bugsy cast off and tossed the bullen to Riger. He waved his head to Fenner. Trip, he said. The Negro started the engines and the boat began to his hand on the wheel. Shudder a little. Miller was already down in the cockpit, Riger. Said, right, let her go, and the boat began to show her. Riger went over to the small but powerful searchlight on the foredeck. He squatted down behind it and lit a cigarette. IES back was intent and unfriendly, 
and Fenner didn't bother to follow him. He climbed down into the cockpit with Miller and made himself comfortable. What time will you pick these guys up? I he asked Miller. Around about ten. I guess. As the boat headed for the open sea, it grew suddenly chilly and a drizzling rain began to. And the visibility was bad. Fall. There was no moon. Fenner shivered a little and lit a cigarette. Miller said, get used to these trips. If you feel cold go into the engine room. It will be warmer. There. Fenner stayed with Miller a little longer, then he wi to the engine R, from. He noticed Riger still sitting T the searchlight. Immovable boat bounced a good bit in the rough, and Fenner suddenly lost interest in smoking. The Negro didn't say a word. Now and then he rolled his eyes at Fenner, but he didn't say anything. After some the Miller yelled and Fenner joined him. Miller pointed. An intermittent flash of light came from a long way off. Miller had altered the course and the boat was running directly toward the light. Guess that must be our man, he said. Riger suddenly switched on his searchlight, and almost immediately he snapped it off again. Very faintly Fen Nier heard the drone of an aeroplane. He smiled in the darkness. Miller heard it, too. He bawled to Riger, S a plane. Coming. Riger stood up and looked up into the blackness overhead. Then. He hurriedly put out the running lights. The boat went on through the. Curtain of blackness. Miller said savagely, Coast guards give me a pain. The aeroplane droned on, then, after a few minutes, faded away. Riger flashed on the searchlight again, let the beam on flickering. It was drawing nearer and nearer. Cut the darkness, and then turned it off. The other light call at Miller. Handed Fenner a torch. Forward, he said, we're nearly there. Fenner took the torch and climbed out of the cockpit. He felt the boat roll as Miller cut speed. Riger, who was standing well forward, shouted, it, and with a flurry. The engine stopped. Riger came over to Fenner, walking carefully as the boat rolled and heaved. Get your rod out, he snapped, watch these guys. He was holding the submachine gun. LL pass them to you. Make sure they an, T got guns, then pass them to Miller. They both stared in the inky blackness. Riger flashed on a small torch suddenly. He had heard the creak of oarlocks. A small rowboat came bobbing towards them. Fenner could see four men huddled in it and two men at the oars, then Riger put his lamp out. Your ears back for that aeroplane, Riger muttered to Fenner. Then, as the rowboat bumped gently alongside, he put his lamp on again. A thin scraggy Chinaman came aboard. Got four here, he said to Riger. LL bring the other in four lots. About the special. Sure, I'll bring the special last. Riger said to Fenner. Let's start. Fenner stepped back and waited. The sea at S.A. came on board one by one. Riger counted them, letting only one come at a time, waiting for Fenner to pass them to Miller, who directed them to the forward cabin. Each Chinese wore the same clothes, tight shirts and knee-length trousers. They stood sheep-like before Fenner, who patted them down and shoved them over to Miller. Two more boatloads came out and it all took some time. The scraggy Chinese who had stood on the right-hand side of Riger while this was going on, said, that's the lot I'll go back for the special. Now, Riger said to Miller, lock those chinks in. His voice sounded uneasy to Fenner. Bolts on, Miller assured him. Fenner wondered what the was. He sensed a sudden tension between Miller and Rigar. They all waited in the darkness their ears straining. 
for the long boat to return. At last they heard the faint splash of oars. Riger snapped on his torch and, reaching out with a boat hook, held the long boat steady. The scraggy Chinese climbed on board. He reached down and the oarsman handed a small figure over to him. A quick pull, and the special was aboard. Don't you worry about this, Riger said to Fenner. Fenner flashed his torch on the special. He gave a soft grunt. It was a girl. He'd guessed as much. She was about thirteen or fourteen years. Old, Chinese, and pretty. She looked very scared and cold. She wore the same tight shirt and knee-length trousers. With an oath Riger struck the torch from his hand. Keep out of this, he said between his teeth. Get her under cover. Riger turned to the Chinese, who gave him a package wrapped in oilskin. And then climbed into the long eye which disappeared into the night. Fenner said between his teeth, S a nice raping Tothi's sort of racket. Riger said, Yeah. You getting milky. I guess I was entitled to know. You were running women. That ain't a thing that gets passed over easily. Do you think? A. Twist is worth ten chinks, if you can get them. So shut up, will you? Fenner didn't say anything, he let Riger go to the cockpit. He stood there brooding. Was this the answer to the a woman? Was. Riddle? They'd picked up twelve chinks and that what at sister of Marion. S was trying to hint it. Or was it just a coincidence? He didn't know. Miller shouted. Her back, Riger, I've had enough of it rt her up. Riger said, tell the nigger to sta the boat quivered as the engines. Sprang into life. Fenner of and searched the sat down with his back to. The cockpit around darkness. His ears strained, hoping to pick up the s. Of a patrol boat. He neither heard nor saw anything. On? Riger shouted suddenly. Where the hell are Y.I.E., Ross? Fenner. Dropped into the cockpit. S the matter, he said. Scared of the. Dark, oh you lay off the funny angle? Listen, bright eye oi, sup in and chain them. I want you to go into the chinks cab together. There are the chains. Over there. Fenner looked at the heap of handcuffs linked together with. Rusty chains that lay in the corner. For, he said. What you think? We gotta be careful, ain't we? If a patrol boat gets on. Our tail we shove the rats over. Chained like that they go down quick. Eel Fenner said, Thin Jage you think of he took the WH out of Riger's. Hand. Do it yourself. That ain't up my street tea of the navigation. Riger looked at him in the dim light. Lamp. I don't think you're gain to be a lot of use with our mob, he said, and picking up the chains, he climbed out of the cockpit and disappeared. Fenner made a little face. He couldn't see how much longer he was going to keep this up. He was nearly satisfied that he'd got as much information as he wanted. It depended on what this glory leadler would have to say. If he got what he hoped from her, then he could strike and wash the whole business up. A muffled sound of a gun going off jerked his attention to the boat. Again. He listened, peering ahead but seeing nothing. There was silence. And after a little while Riger came back into the cockpit again. Fenner glanced at him as Riger took the wheel from him. Riger's face was hard and cold. Fenner said. Riger grinned. Don't like the chains. I had to shoot one of the punks. In the leg, before they'd quiet down. Fenner ran his hand through his. Hair. It had stopped raining, but he felt cold and damp. Go along and tell Miller to watch that broad. Riger said suddenly. Looked quiet but if she starts a squeal. There'll be hell on this ship. Fenner went aft to the small cabin. Behind the galley. 
he walked into the cabin and stopped. Miller was struggling with the Chinese girl. She fought him silently, blood running from her nose and from her lips. Fenner took a step forward and grabbed Miller by his collar. He heaved, dragging Miller away from the girl. WHC dash, he got him clear, he booted him hard, sending him sprawling to the other side of the small cabin. Miller sat up slowly. His great white face glistened in the lamplight. He focused on Fenner by screwing up his eyes. Get out of here, and leave me alone, he said thickly. Fenner didn't say anything. He just stood, his hands hanging loose at his side. Miller looked round the cabin, saw the girl, and scrambled over to her. Fenner, white-faced and thin-lipped, slid his gun so that he held it by the short barrel. He sucked in his breath and hit Miller on the top of his head. Miller stiffened, went limp. He twitched once, as if trying to command his muscles, then his forehead hit the floor with a little thud. Fenner shoved his gun away and took him by his arm and dragged him out of the cabin. Riger shoved his head over the top of the cockpit. The hell's gain. On, he shouted. Fenner took no notice. He dumped Miller in the scuppers. Miller sat up, holding his head. He mumbled a real R stream of obscenities. Fenner didn't tt look at him, he went over to the cockpit and climbed down. Riger said, Escoyan on. Fenner had difficulty in keeping his voice steady. Heel Miller was after the girl. I bounced him. Riger shrugged. Should worry about her. Fenner didn't answer. He was looking at a tiny moving light on their port side. He hastily looked away before Riger noticed. He wondered if it were a patrol boat Miller who had staggered to his feet saw it and yelled a warning. Riger looked and spun the wheel. Coast guards, he said, they won't spot us. The boat was still running without lights, but the moon had climbed above the belt of clouds, and the big white wash showed up pretty well. Fenner watched the light, saw it swing round a little and head towards them. He said gently, V seen us all right. Riger yelled for Miller. He gave the boat all the gas she'd take. Miller came staggering down. Into the cockpit. He glared at Fenner murderously, but Riger snarled. The wheel. I'm getting the gun out. Maybe this guy's faster than us. Miller took the wheel and Riger disappeared aft. Fenner climbed out of. The cockpit and followed Riger. The light was coming up now, and as they. Moonlight began to flood the sea, Fenner could make out the boat. It was fast all right. He could see the way the bows were lifted right out of the water. He said to Riger, boats gain to catch us. Riger shouted down into the engine room, and the negro handed up a Thompson gun. Riger gave it to Fenner, and took another from the negro. You get on the port side, Riger said lying down flat. Keep firing at them. Fenner lay down. He fired two bursts, taking care that the bullets would go well over the top of the boat. Almost. Immediately, Riger fired with his gun. Even from where he lay, Fenner could see a shower of white splinters spurt from the bows of the oncoming boat. Fenner ducked his head as the Coast Guard replied. He saw the long yellow flashes and heard the thud of bullets as they bit into the sides of the boat. The Coast Guards kept up such a heavy fire that it was impossible for either Riger or Fenner to show themselves to fire back. Miller, watching from the cover of the cockpit, screamed out. Something. They'll be up in a few seconds. Riger peered from behind. His cover saw the boat within six feet or so and ducked back as the wood began to splinter again. Fenner turned his head. He could see Riger lying flat, Riger shouted. 
to him, by for a headache, and leaning over on his side he tossed a small bike object right into the other boat. There was a blinding flash and a violent explosion and the Coast Guard boat immediately began to fall astern. Keep her going, Riger shouted to Miller, and sat up to watch the Coast Guard boat burst into flames. He scrambled over to Fenner. That's the first time we've tried that stunt. Carlos is some guy with his ideas. If we hadn't that pineapple on board, the chinks would be feeding the fishes by now, and we'd have had a lost journey. Fenner grunted. He couldn't take his eyes off the burning boat, which was rapidly becoming a little red glow in the darkness. He got slowly to his feet. Riger had already gone forward. He was pointing to a green light that flickered in the distance. Miller swung the wheel a little. That's the guy who takes our load, Riger shouted to Fenner. We've got through all right. Fenner stood watching the green light come nearer. He knew now that he must start things moving. He'd played with Carlos long enough. It was just after two o'clock in the morning when Fenner got back to the Hayworth. Before he switched on his room light he knew someone was there. He didn't hear anything but he knew he wasn't alone. He stepped inside. Feeling uncomfortably exposed in the dimly listed doorway. There was something in the air, a scent. He reached inside his coat and pulled his gun, then he groped for the wall switch and ficked the light on. A woman's clothes on the floor at the foot of his bed caught his eye. A black dress, a handful of lace and crepe chine, a pair of shoes glory. Laidler sat up in his bed. Two bare arms curved up over the sheet. Holding the sheet at Y against her body. When she saw who it was, she lay back again, keeping her NN arms out and arranging her red gold hair on FEER's pillow. Fenner put his gun away. The only thing he could add of was that he was tired and that he'd have to strip his bed when she had gone. He didn't fancy sleeping in the same sheets. Glory smiled at him sleepily. Fenner went over to the floor lamp, put it on, and turned off the ceiling lamp. The light was softer, but it lit up the floor brightly. He saw two little red marks on his carpet which hadn't been there before. He looked at the red marks and then he looked at Glory's shoes. I.L.E. moved further into the room. There were red marks on the shoes, as if Glory had stepped in something. Without picking the S.H. E.S. up, Fenner couldn't be sure. He knew pretty well the marks were bloodstains. But he didn't want her to know he'd seen him just yet. Fenner said, Have you come here, it, s you. You said Hayworth. You. Said you wanted to talk. I came here and waited. I got tired of waiting, so I got into bed. I. Thought you wouldn't come back tonight. Did you come here? Do you. Mean, when. Her slaty eyes went a little cold. What time? A clock. I waited until eleven and then I came to bed. See you come in. She shook her head. Fenner thought she had gone a little white. She moved restlessly in the bed. He could see Ti Hiong. Outline of her legs under the thin sheet. A lot of the ravado had gone out of her. She said. You sound like T big policeman as at nasty. Questions dash. Fenner smiled bleakly. Rehearsing you, baby, he said. You haven't. Much of an alibi, have you? I glory sat up in bed. She said, what? Are you saying? Fenner shook his head. Under cover. You reach a big a girl for this sort. A thing now she pulled the sheet up over her, but she didn't lie down. What do you mean, alibi? I he reached over and picked up one of her. Shoes. He examined it carefully. The sole was covered with dry blood. He. Tossed, the shoe in her lap. 
she gave a husky little scream and threw it from her. Then she lay back, put her hands over her face and began to cry. Fenner went to a cupboard, took out a bottle of scotch and gave himself a drink. He lit a cigarette and took off his hat and coat. It was very hot and close in the room. He walked over to the pen window and looked into the deserted street. D better tell me, he said. She said, don't know anything about it he wandered back to the bed and sat down. Then the quicker you get out of this room the better pleased I'll be. I don't want to be dragged into a murder rap. She said, between choking sobs, found him. He was lying on the floor. Someone had shot him. Fenner ran his fingers through Ms. Hare. Who, he said. Gently. Harry, Thaler. The man I was with Fenner brooded. Is he, he said. At last. Glory took her hands away. Fenner experienced a little shock. She. Certainly wasn't crying. She was play acting. She said, his boat. Did you find him, before I came to you Fenner rubbed his eyes. He got. Up and put his coat and hat on again. Here, he said. I'm gain down to have a look at him she said. LL come with you. Fenner shook his head. You keep out of this. Stay here. When I get back I want to talk to you. Illy too he went out of the room. And down to the waterfront. He found Nancy W and climbed on board. He went down into the main cabin. It was dark and he couldn't find Thaler. He searched the whole boat but he couldn't find anything. He turned on the light in the sleeping cabin after closing the porthole. From the clothes lying about, he thought this must be where Thaler had slept. He went through the chest of drawers carefully. A small photo of Curly Robbins, taken, as far as he could the only thing he found which really astonished him was Judd, several years ago. He took the photo and put it in G.E. his wallet. Then shut the drawer and snapped off the light. He went back to the main cabin again and examined the carpet. It was only when he looked very closely that he could see that the carpet had been recently washed in one small patch. He stood up, scratching his head. He was quite certain now that Thaler was not on board. Was Thaler dead? Could he rely on what Glory had said? If he'd been killed, who had got rid of his body and washed up the carpet. Had Gloric killed him? The last time he'd seen those two together they weren't exactly acting friendly. He said with exasperation, and went out of the eye cabin. As he stepped on the jetty he noticed a big sedan drawn up without lights on the other side of the waterfront. He gave it a quick look, and then dropped flat. A choked roar came from the car as he did so and he knew someone had let off a shotgun in his direction. He pulled his gun and kept flat. He heard the car start and the swish of tires on the sandy road. Then the car swept out of sight. Round the corner. Fenner got up and dusted himself. Things were getting complicated. He walked back to the Hayworth keeping in the shadows and using the back streets only. Glory lay just where he had left her. Her face was a little pinched. And the smile she gave him was only a twist of the mouth. He pulled up the chair again and sat down. He in the main cabin when you saw him, he said abruptly. She said, dot. Fenner nodded, as if he expected that. V take him away. Now. He said L don't know why they did that, because if they wanted a fall uiudve bin it. Either you killed him and tossed him overboard. Or you didn't, and B killer came back for some reason or other and took him away. Maybe you tossed him overboard. Glory showed her long arms. You think I could do it? He was big. Fenner thought of the almost perpendicular stairs leading. Into the cabin, 
and shook his head. He said. Guess that's Rigi. The color came back to her face and she didn't look so drawn. She said. They hid him away, no one will know he's dead, will they? Fenner. Yawned. S right, he said. She curled down in the bed, pulling the pillow off the bolster. Don't. You think I look snug, she said, her eyes getting at Aisha's again. Fenner said, S your sister Marion. She didn't jump more than an inch. But it looked like a couple of yards. Fenner leaned over her and pulled her round. Her eyes were startled. S your sister, he repeated. She said, Do you know about her? How do you know about her? Fenner sat down close to her. Re is like as two peas, he said, V never seen anything quite like it. He put his hand inside his pocket and took out the letter he had found in Marion's bag. At that, he said. She read it through blankly, and then shook her head. Don't know, she said. S.P.I.O. Who's no Allen? Fenner went over to the table, picked up a pad of notepaper and a pencil and came back to the bed. That letter. Out for me, he said. As she struggled you, he said hastily, he went to pee the cupboard and got his pajama jacket and threw it over to her. Then he went into the bathroom and waited a few seconds. When he came out she had put the coat on and was rolling back the long sleeves. She said, do you want me to do this? Do it he spoke very curtly. She scribbled on the pad and then gave it to him. He compared the two handwritings. There was nothing similar about them. He tossed the pad on the table again and began to walk up and down the room slowly. She watched high nervously. You've got a sister, haven't you, he said at last. She hesitated, then she said, Layut we haven't seen long. Why? Haven't you, each other for a very long time? Or five years, I Forget exactly. Marion and I didn't get on so well. She'd got ideas. About how I should live. We didn't quarrel, but she kept having ideas. So we split when father died. Fenner said gently, you're lying. If you hadn't seen each other for that length of time, why did she come to me? All fast because you were missing. Two little patches of red burnt in. Glory's cheeks. Didn't know she came to you. Who are you, anyway? Mind who I am. When did you last see Marion? Glory looked sulky. Was. In New York with Harry. We ran into each other. It was about a couple of. Weeks ago. I was up there on a trip. Marion wanted me to come to her hotel. I said. I would because she was so insistent. I had Harry with me. It was awkward. Marion wouldn't stand for Harry, so I gave her the slip and came back to Florida. Fenner came over and sat on the bed. Either you're telling a lot of lies, or else there's something I've missed in. All these, he said. Glory shook her head from side to side. I'm not lying, she said. Should I? Did you say anything to your sister about twelve Chinese? Chinu. Why should I? T keep saying why should I? Fenner said. Savagely. Confuses me. As far as he could see he was no further, now. He'd met this girl, than he was before. He thought, and then said. Liedler? Why not daily? Liedler's my married name. Glory said. Was. Divorced a year ago. Fenner grunted. S your husband. She shook her. Head. Don't know, she said. Fenner didn't answer. Instead he. Said, your sister was murdered last week in a house in Brooklyn. There. Was a long silence. Glory said, don't believe it. Her eyes crawled. 
up and down Fenner's face. Fenner shrugged. Don't have to, he said, she was murdered all. Right. I liked that girl. She came to me for help. I didn't like the way. She met her finish, and I'm promising myself to fix the guy who killed her. Glory took his coat in her hand. She twisted the coat and shook. Him. Dead, she said. Sit there like that and say that to me. You. Haven't any pity for me. Marion, Marion Fenner put his hand on her wrist and jerked her hand. Away. It out, he said. Can't act. You don't give a hoot what. Happened to Marion. Glory looked at him and then giggled. She put her. Hand over her mouth and her eyes looked shocked. Shootin' TV done. That, she said. Marion getting murdered. She rolled over in the bed. And buried her face in the pillows. She began to shake with laughter. Fenner had a sudden idea. He put his hand on her head, shoved her down. Into the pillow, and pulled down the sheet with his other hand. Still. Holding her, he jerked the pajama jacket over her shoulders and looked. Carefully at her back. He pulled the jacket down and pulled up the sheet, then he stepped back. Glory twisted round, her eyes bright. Why did you do that, she said. Did you know your sister had bruises all over her back? Fenner said. You know everything, don't you? And she began to cry. When Fenner saw the tears running from her eyes, he walked away to the window. He began. To feel horribly tired. He said abruptly, I'll see more of you tomorrow, and walked to the door. The sound of her sobbing followed him downstairs. He thought, LL. Go crazy if something, doesn't, soon, and he went to the night clerk. To arrange for another room. The bright sunlight came through the slatted shutters and lay like. Prison bars across Fenner's bed. He stirred restlessly as a clock downstairs faintly chimed ten. At the eighth chime he opened his eyes and grunted. His body still felt tired, and his head ached a little. He was dimly conscious of the sunlight, and he closed his eyes again. Then, as his mind struggled out of sleep he was aware of a weight at the foot of his bed and sent on the air. As he groaned, Glory giggled. He looked at her through half-closed eyes, and his half-awakened senses said. She looked very nice. She was curled up, with her back resting on the end of the bedstead, her long legs up to her chin, and her fingers laced round her knees. She rested her chin in the little hollow between her knees and regarded Fenner with bright eyes. When you're asleep you look kind and beautiful, she said. Isn't that... Wonderful. Fenner struggled up in bed. He ran his fingers through his hair. He felt terrible. Would you mind gain away, he said patiently. I want to see you I'll tell you. I dislike women in my bedroom on principle. I'm old-fashioned. And I'm easily shocked. Glory giggled. Recute, she said simply. Fenner groaned. He was sitting up his head ached sharply. Run away he. Said. It. Scram I glory through her arms wide. Her incredibly blue eyes. Sparkled. T you like me. Don't you think I'm marvelous, she said. Fenner said unpleasantly, you run away. Glory slid off the bed. She. Looked funny in Fenner's pajamas. They hung on her like a sack. Fenner said, you look like something the cat dragged in. Why not go away and get dressed, then maybe we'll have breakfast and another talk. Glory giggled and began dancing round the room. Fenner thought she was the most beautiful bit of corruption he'd ever seen. She laughed at him. You must like M.E.I. she said. Fenner sat up on his elbow. Away, he said shortly, don't want to be bothered just now. She said, you really mean that? 
doubt had come into her eyes, like the slow movement of a cloud across the face of the moon. She came over to the bed and sat close to him. Fenner nodded. You're freight, sister, he said. I'll see you later. He thought for a moment that she was going to hit him. Then she got up and wandered out of the room, leaving Ty door open. Fenner got out of bed and kicked the door to, and went into the bathroom. He thought, a hue of a note to start the morning on. After a shower he felt better and he rang for coffee. He was dressed when the waiter brought up the coffee. Two cups put him right and he went along to Glory's room. She was dressed. Her black evening dress looked out of place in the sunlight. She was sitting by the window looking into the street. Fenner wandered in and shut the door softly behind him. He said, Are you going to do? Glory turned and smiled at him. It was quite a shock. Her eyes were wide, candid and friendly. She said, Can I do? He leaned against the wall and stared at her thoughtful V. He said at last, re difficult to understand. I thought L was gained to have a lot of trouble with you. I see I was wrong. She swiveled round. Her back to the window. Still think you're cute, she said. Then she added, am going to grow on you. Fenner's eyes shifted past her, looked into the street. A black sedan was standing below. He'd seen that car before. Even as he started forward a man's arm came through the curtained window. The sun reflected on a gun. That was the flash picture Fenner had, a picture that paralyzed him, making him seconds late. He heard a faint foot as Glory screamed. Not a loud scream, soft, hoarse. Then, she bent at the knees. Before Fenner could do anything about it, she slid to the floor. The sedan went away fast. It all happened at such an incredible speed that no one seemed conscious of it in the street. Fenner leaned out of the window, saw the sedan swing round the corner and disappear. He stepped away and knelt down swiftly. As he turned glory, his right hand felt a wet patch on her side just above her hip, she'd gone very white, but she was breathing Fenner reached out and grabbed a cushion from a neural chair and put it under her head. Then he ran into the bat room. He filled a hand bowl with water, snatched up a small first aid case he always kept with him and went back. She watched him come across the room, her eyes wide with fear. She said, Can't feel anything. Am I badly hurt? Fenner knelt down. Take it easy, he said. LL look and see. He opened the case and selected a scalpel. Guess your dress'll have to go, he said, cutting the silk carefully. She said, I'm glad I was with you, and began to cry. Fenner cut the top of her girdle. Yourself in hand, he said, working quickly. Shock's bound to tilt you sideways. He examined the wound. And then grinned. I'll be damned. It's only a nick. The slugs just. Made a groove in your side. She said, was scared that I was going to. Die. Was I. Fenner fixed the wound with experienced fingers. They. Same, that was nice shooting. That guy was some sniper. Glory set in. A small voice, hurts now. Sure, it's bound to hurt. Fenner. Straightened and looked down at her. You'll have to lie up for a few days. Maybe that'll keep you out of. Mischief. I'm game to take you home. Where do you live? She looked away from him, her face suddenly blank. Then she gave a little giggle that finished on a gasp of pain. I haven't got a home she said, putting her hand on her side. Where did you live before you threw in with Thaler? She looked at him. Sharply, then looked away again. 
didn't throw in with Harry Fenner. Knelt beside her. Rhea Rotten Liar, he said. You said last night you and Thaler were doing a trip to New York. Together. Now you say you didn't throw in with him. Give it to me. Straight. She said jerkily, believe you're a detective. Fenner. Snorted. Redhead, you can't lie about floors all day. I've gotta get. You some at here. Either you tell me where you live, or else I'll send for. An ambulance, she said, want to stay here. Fenner smiled. Unpleasantly. I'm not going to be your nursemaid, he said. At Elgata I. Of to do. She said, I'm safer here. Fenner paused, thought, and then. Said, see. He went over to the bed and pulled the sheet down. Then he. Picked her up very gently, sitting her in a chair. She chewed her lip while he did this. He took the scalpel and cut the. Dress down each side. She said, a mess, and went so white he thought she was going to. Faint. Hold it, he said sharply, and stood her up. A grip on yourself. She. Put her face against his. Recute, she said in a small voice. He jerked his head away. It out, he said, and carried her over to the. Bed. He was glad to get her covered up she lay with her red old head. On the pillow and looked up at him. She looked suddenly very young and. Defenseless. She said, want to whisper. Fenner shook his head. Another one. That's got whiskers on it. She reached up her two arms. Ides. He. Bent his head and she kissed him. Her lips felt very soft against his. It was just a youthful kiss, and Fenner quite liked it. He straightened. And rumpled his hair. It easy, he said. I'm going to fix things. He. Pulled up the sheet to her chin, clear, her clothes, and the rest of. The mess into the bathroom, and went downstairs. The hotel manager looked at him with an odd expression. Fenner felt a little embarrassed. He said. Girlfriends run into a little accident. She'll have to stay in bed. I want you to send someone out and get her a sleeping suit and whatever else she wants. Put it all on the bill. The manager said quite seriously, this is a little irregular. Fenner interrupted him. LL say it's irregular, he said. Shortly, it ain't so irregular that it calls for a fan dance from you. So snap to it. He went over to a telephone booth and dialed a number. A hoarse voice floated over the wire. At Bugsy. Fenner asked. Bugsy. I got a job, yo. Yeah dot just the job. You've been wanting. Come on you you to my dump and bring a rod. He went. Into the bar and ordered two fingers of rye. He felt he wanted a drink. After all the excitement. While he waited for Bugsy he remembered. Something. He took out his wallet. When he opened the wallet a frown. Came to his eyes. He said, S a very funny thing. Ms. Money and his. Papers were all on the right hand side of the wallet, and he knew that. Yesterday there had been some on the right and some on the left. He went. Through the Y and counted his money. Nothing was Miss Paper's care for Ewing. So far as he could remember. Then he said. Well, because Kali's. Photo wasn't there anymore. He went through the wallet more carefully. But it wasn't there. He put the wallet back in his pocket thoughtfully. And finished the rye. Unless someone had come in while he slept, someone other than Glory, he. Knew he hadn't far to look for the photo. He wasn't going to get away as Ross anymore. She, or whoever it was, must have seen his license. Papers. He lit a cigarette and waited for Bugsy. He knew it would be a waste of time to try and get anything out of glory right now. She'd just pretend she felt bad, and that would be the end of that. 
Bugsy came into the bar with a look on his face a dog a stained suit of grey herringbone, and a greasy light felt gets when he thinks there's a bone around. He was wearing hat. A red flower decorated his buttonhole. Fenner found himself wondering if it had grown there. Bugsy wiped his mouth with the back of his hand and looked at the row of bottles with a smile of expectation. Fenner bought him a large beer and took him to the far end of the room. When they had settled, Fenner said, Pal how would you like to work for me? Bugsy's gooseberry eyes opened. Don't get it, he said. I got a little job you might like to handle. Nothing very much, but it's worth fifty bucks. If you and me get along, I might put you on my payroll, but I T5D mean kissin' goodbye Carlos. T you workin' for Carlos no more. Fenner shook his head. He said, I don't like his game. It stinks. Bugsy shook his head. Won't like it, he said. Uneasily. Never mind Carlos, Fenner said. I don't want to play, I don't. Bugsy wagged his head. Do I earn fifty bucks, he asked eagerly. This is a sweet job that means no work and not much worry. You remember. The Jane on the Nancy W. Bugsy passed his tongue over his lips. I. Likely to forget her, he said. A number. S upstairs in my bed. Right now. Bugsy slopped his beer. His moon-like face showed his. Surprise. He said, your bed. Fenner nodded. What a guy. Bugsy was almost overwhelmed with ad at ration. Bet it. Cost you a heap of jack to get her in there. Fenner shook his head. Again. Was, Bugsy, I had to fight to keep her out. Bugsy put the beer down on the table with a click. Ain't kidding, he said. Wouldn't tell a lie about a thing like that? No, she's up there all right. Bugsy brooded, then he said in a hoarse, confidential whisper, might tell me how you do it. That sort of dope comes in useful. Fenner thought it was time to get down to business. Ever mind about the details? Pal, he said. Guy pulled a rod on this. Dame and took a little meat out of her side. This guy might look in. Again and make a better job. I want you to sit around with a rod and see he doesn't. Bugsy said in. A faint, strangled voice, you're paying fifty bucks for a job like. That. Fenner looked startled ain't it enough. S a laugh. I'd do it. For no at. Maybe she'd go for me. Fenner got up. Okay, come on up, I'll. Introduce you. Only don't go getting ideas. You sit outside the door, get it? A day my Ike that hasn't any time for hoods. That's what you said. Wasn't it? A little crestfallen, Bugsy followed him upstairs. Fenner. Knocked on the door and went in. Glory was lying in a pink satin nightdress, all ribbons and frills. She gave a little giggle when Fenner paused, staring at her. Isn't it a dream, she said. You choose it yourself. Fenner shook. Head. V.E. got a bodyguard for you. This is Bugsy. He's gained to hang around to keep off the nasty men. Glory looked Bugsy over with surprised eyes. Looks nasty himself. She said. In, Bugsy, and meet a lovely lady. Bugsy stood in the doorway gaping. Fenner reached forward and pulled a chair out into the passage. This. Guy's going to sit outside and work, he said grimly. S what I'm. Paying him for. He pushed Bugsy out of the room again and nodded to. Her. V got a little job to do. Then I'll be back for a talk. Take it. Easy, won't you? Then, before she could say anything, he drew the door. Shut. Busy, he said to Bugsy, keep out of that room. No funny. 
business. Get it. Bugsy shook his head. Couldn't start anything with a dame. Like that. Gee. She makes my head spin. Away from the hotel, Fenner. Shut himself in a telephone booth and got the federal building. Hoss kiss. Came on the line after a delay. He said, you the guy who slung a bomb. At one of my boats. He sounded angry. Fenner said, mind about that. Your boys asked for it. There. Old fashioned. This guy Carlos has got a sorts of modern ideas. He'll be us. In poison gas soon. Hoss kiss made growling noises, but Fenner broke. In, want to locate a big black sedan with three C's and two sevens in. The makeup of the license plate. Can you get me that information? Quick. Hoss kiss said, D better come round. There's a lot I want to. Talk to you about. Fenner glanced over his shoulder through the dirty. Glass of the booth into the street. Em play in the game too close, he. Said. Ain't showing up at your place anymore. Maybe we'll fix. Somewhere to meet later on. What about that sedan? Hoske ISS said. On. Fenner leant against the wall of the booth and read the various. Scribblings on the white paintwork. When Hoskiss came over the line. Again, Fenner said, town wants cleanin' up. The things you guys write. In these booths Hoskiss cut in, mind about that I think I've e found. Your car. Would it be Harry Thaler's bus, do you think? Fenner screwed up his eyes. He said, could L, T. There are others the list, of course. But Thaler said, I won I. Q to B. The best bet. Mind about the others. That'll do to go on wit, I. Listen, Hoskiss, if I hand you Carlos and his mob at, plate, will you? Get some work done for me. Hoskiss said he would. I want everything you can get on Thaler. I want to know all about a. Dame named Glory Liedler and as much as you can dig up about her. Sister, Marion Daly. Then there's no Allen, I want his history, too. You. Might see what you can find out about this guy Liedler, Glory's. Husband. Then, when you've done all that, called Curly Robbins, who works at. Nightingale. I want a line on a dame. MD out what Thaler knows about her, parlor. I want to F.S. funeral. Two. And Hoskis got quite excited. He said. S a job of work. Digging up things like that will cost money. Fenner sneered. They. Hell's the use of your organy. Zashin if you can't do a little thing like that. You get all that for. Me, and I'll give you Carlos and maybe I'll donate five C's to your. Knitting club or something. Hoskiss said, I'll cover it. But it's. Gain, to take time. ITT take time. It'll mean starting from birth. Certificates and working up. I want. It all the dope, not some of. Now listen, about this business of the bomb, Hoskiss began heatedly. But Fenner hung up. He stepped out of the booth, wiped his hands with his handkerchief and walked in the direction of Duval Street. While he walked, his mind was busy. So Taylor was the guy who owned the sedan. That gave him ideas. There was something very phony about the whole business. This Glory Liedler was playing a five-ace hand. Had she any connection with Carlos? He'd caught her in one lie, why not another? Her Sister had said, can she want with twelve Chinese? Why had she said that, unless Glory had told her about the Chinese? If Glory hadn't written the letter, and he didn't think she had, who was the writer? Obviously the letter must have been a plan to give him a key to the whole business. Therefore it followed that the writer was anxious for him to crack it open. The handwriting was a woman's. 
there was only one other woman at the moment in this business and that was Curly. Had Curly written the note? Or, the idea so startled him that he stopped in the middle of the street had Marion written it herself? A fat man bumped into him, walked round him and went on, screwing his head to scowl at him. Fenner walked on to Nightingale's. The buzzer sounded as he opened the door. From behind the curtain Carlos suddenly appeared. The faint cloying smell of marijuana came from his clothes, and his eyes looked like pieces of glass in his white face. Pleasantly. Fenner was a little startled. Your box, he asked Carlos said, you want anything? Fenner wandered round the room. I look in and have a chin with Nightingale, he said casually. Guy, when you know him. Don't see you around here much. Given Curly a thrill. Carlos lent. Against the counter. The atmosphere was very brittle. Says you bounced. Him around on the boat, he said, don't like fightin' in my mob. Fenner raised his eyebrows. That's too bad. Every time Miller tries. To make any frill when I'm around, he's gained to be bounced, that is if. The frill doesn't like him. Carlos blinked. Didn't think much of your work either, he said. Fenner shook his head. S bad, too. But then I ain't surprised. Riger. And I don't get on so well. I with one thing and another, maybe it'd be better if you didn't work for me for a while. Carlos studied his nails. Fenner wandered over to him. Dot he said. At that suits me. Carlos twisted his mouth. It was his idea of a smile. Maybe you'd like to select a box. Nice to know that you're getting your wishes after you're dead. Fenner was quite close to him now. That things might happen? An accident or something? Carlos shrugged. Do know a lot now, don't you, he said. That it helped the cops. I've changed my office and you don't know where the boat picked up or landed. The chinks, but still, you know something. Fenner said, shouldn't. Try it. No, I guess it'd be a dopey move to try anything like that. Carlos adjusted his tie. Don't care a great deal what you think, he said, and turned away. Fenner reached out and jerked him round. Just want to show you where we stand, hop head, and punched Carlos high up on Miss Cheekbone. He didn't hit very hard, but he knocked Carlos off his feet. Carlos lay on his back, supported by his elbows. A bruise showed on his soft white skin. He began to hiss through his teeth. He made Fenner think of some slug-like thing. Fenner said, you know. I never let anyone talk big about my death, it makes me nervous. If you do want I'll oh start anything I suppose you'll have to try, but this I promise you. If you don't pull it off, I'm common. After you. It'll take more than your mob of hoods to stop me. I'm not gain to bother about them, it's you I'm common after, and when I catch. Up with you I'll bend you round a pole and break your back for you. Carlos got slowly to his feet. When he put his hand to his face his hand. Fluttered like a moth's wing. Dust, Fenner said. Home and have a shot of liquor, you need it. Without a word Carlos went out, closing the door behind him. Nightingale said, s a hell of a thing to do. How long he'd been. Standing there Fenner didn't know. The light on his glasses hit his eyes, but Fenner could see some sweat. Beads on his face. Fenner said, didn't you pick the punk up I means all that to you. Nightingale showed his white, sharp teeth. Means nothing to me, he said, his voice trailing off to a squeak. All the same, it was a hell of a it, Fenner broke in. It's time. Someone slapped that hophead down. He thinks he's the kingpin in this. 
joint is foreign are you with him nightingale made an expensive gesture he waved his hand round the room and shrugged this is his i'm just his front because you've got fenner grunted keep plugging nothing else nightingale nodded sure he said gotta live where does she come in on this the weak eye snapped behind the lenses leave her out of this fenner said s gone soft on carlos rd nightingale took two little shuffling steps forway he swung over a left that caught fenner flush on the chin it was meant to obi a sacker but a man like nightingale hadn't any iron in his bones fenner didn't even rock he said re under my weight forget it nightingale started another punch then switched to his pocket fenner sunk his fist in his ribs nightingale went down on his knees with a sigh rolled over on his side and got his gun out fenner stepped forward and stamped on his wrist the gun clattered on the parquet then bounced onto the pile carpet fenner knelt down and jerked nightingale round by his coat collar i said forget it he shook the little man you don't believe me then you'll believe someone else some other time but i ain't fighting with you over any dame nightingale drew his lips off his teeth started to say something stopped and looked beyond fenner over his shoulder ms anger changed to alarm fenner saw a man standing behind him he saw the miniature of the man in nightingale's glasses he saw an arm come up and he tried to turn something exploded inside his head and he fell forward he scraped the skin off his nose on nightingale's coat buttons chapter 4 fenner's first reaction was to the naked light hanging in a wire basket from the ceiling then he noticed that the room had no windows after that he shut his eyes again and drifted to the steady throb inside his skull the light burned through his eyelids and he tried to roll over away from it when he found he couldn't move he raised his head and looked they movement exploded something behind his eyes and he had to lie still again then after a while the throb went away and he tried again he found he was lying on an old mattress and his hands were tied to the ironwork of the rusty bedstead the room was completely bare except for the bed the floorboards were littered with cigarette butts and tobacco ash the dust was thick several pages of a scattered newspaper lay about and the fireplace contained a pile of black ashes as if someone had recently been burning a lot of papers it was a nasty room full of the smell of decay damp and stale sweat fenner rested he made no effort to free his hands he lay quietly his eyes screwed up a little to avoid the rays of the light and he breathed gently he listened with an intentness that caught at every whispered sound by lying like that and by listening hard he beard sounds which at first meant nothing to him but which he later distinguished as footsteps the murmur of voices and the distant breaking of the rollers on the shore he went to sleep finally because he knew that sleep was the only thing for him at the moment he was in no shape to try to escape he had lost all sense of time so when he woke he knew only that the sleep had been a good one because he felt well again his head ached dully and his brain no longer rolled around inside his skull he woke because someone was coming down the passage outside his door he could hear the lock and the door was kicked open he closed his eyes he thought it was too early to take an interest in visitors someone walked over to him and the light in his eyes went away as that someone got between him and the light 
There was a long silence, then a grant and the light began to irritate him once more. Footsteps walked to the door. Fenner opened his eyes and looked. The small squat back and short legs of the man going out of the door told him nothing, but the thick oily black hair and the coffee skin made it a good guess that he was a Cuban. He went out and locked the door again. Fenner drew a deep breath and began to work his hands. The cords holding him were tight, but not impossibly tight. He strained and pulled, chewing on his under lip as he did so. They effort made the light go black, and he had to stop. He lay still, panting a little. The only ventilation came from the transom over the door. The room was very hot and close. Fenner could feel the sweat gumming his shirt to his back. He gently wiggled his wrists. He thought, V shifted them. Yes, I've done something. If I could only stop this damn headache, maybe I'd get somewhere. Now. Once more. He pulled and twisted again. Ms. right hand, made slippery. With sweat, gradually slid through the circle of cord, but he couldn't. Do anything about his left hand. He was caught there all right. Slowly he sat up and felt his head with his fingers very gently. They back of his skull was tender, but there was no lump or bruise. He smiled. Bleakly. Then he twisted round and examined the knot that was holding. His left hand. It was knotted under the bed in such a way that he could only feel it, but he couldn't see it. The knot defied all the effort he made to loosen it, and he lay back on the bed, swearing softly. He thought, one up. I wonder who smacked me. Carlos? He could have gone out, watched through the door and come back quietly when Nightingale was getting tough. Or was it someone else? Where was he? More important, what was going to happen to him? He sat up on the bed again and swung his feet to the floor. Then he stood up shakily, his left hand preventing him from standing entirely. Upright. His head ached a lot when he stood up, but it began to pass as he moved to the door, dragging the bed with him. He satisfied himself that the door was locked, and then, pushing the bed back to the wall, he sat down again. He'd got to get his hand free somehow, he told himself. He lay down and began to tear at the knot feverishly. I.E.S. damp fingers slid off the cord, making no impression. The sound of footfalls made him pause, and he hastily roiled on his back, and slipped his wrist through the circle of cord. He'd barely done so. When the door opened and Carlos came in, Riger and Miller stood just inside the door. Carlos came over and stood by Fenner's bed. Fenner looked up and their eyes met, Carlos said, the punks awake. Riger and Miller came farther into the room, and Riger shut the door. They came around the bed. Fenner looked at each man slowly. He said casually. S the idea. Carlos was shivering a little. He was doped to his ears. Fenner could see the pinpoint pupils. Carlos said, regain to have a little talk. He drew back his fist and hit Fenner with his small bony. Knuckles just below his nose. Fenner had his head moving when he saw the blow coming, but it only took a little of the steam out of the punch. He felt, teeth creak. Carlos said, Oh you that one, don't I? Fenner said nothing. He hated Carlos with his eyes, but he knew that with his left hand pinned he wouldn't stand much chance with three of them. Carlos said, You're a private dick. He took from his pocket Fenner's papers and scattered them over the bed. You certainly pulled a fast one that time. There was a moment's silence. Carlos sat on the bed. Fenner knew that he could nail him down. If the other two cleared off he could grab Carlos by his neck and settle with him. Maybe the other two would clear off. 
he'd have to wait. Carlos leaned forward and slapped Fenner across his face. FFE slapped him very hard, twice. Fenner blinked his eyes, at UT he didn't. Move or say anything. Carlos sat back again. His shivering made the bed rattle against the wall. He had okayed a little. Insane. He said, have you come down here? What are you trying to find? Out. Fenner said with stiff lips, told you not to try anything. Now, by God, I'm got to start after you. I ain't letting up until I've broken at our lousy little back. Miller exploded seven in a higfee pitched. Laugh. S nuts he said, S stark raving nut at. Carlos had to put his hands in his pockets because they trembled so. Much. He said, we're gain to work on you. I want to know what you're doing here. Tell me quick. Or I'll start on you. Fenner sneered. He began to pull his hand out of the cord. He did it very slowly so that they didn't notice. He said. My tip and let me out of here. Carlos stood up. He motioned to Riger. On him he said. Riger got to the bed at the same time as Fenner slipped. The cord. Fenner swung his leg round in a long leglitning arc. He kicked Riger just under the kneecap. Riger fell down, holding his. Knee with both hands. His eyes opened very wide with the pain and he. Began to curse. Fenner sat up on the bed as Miller rushed in. Any ears. Hands caught his hair and jerked him over, but he swung a punch into. Miller rather low down. He put a lot of steam in that punch. Miller flopped on the floor, holding his big belly in both hands. I.E.S. Face glistened as he began to roll, trying to get his breath. Carlos backed away quickly. Was scared all right. Fenner got to his feet and started after him. Dragging the bed with him. Riger caught hold of the leg of the bed and hung on. Fenner pulled. Striving to get at Carlos who in his panic had circled away from the door. The bed moved A.I. at Ty Fenner's way, then jerked back as Riger hauled on it. Carlos said in a squeaky voice, Up W fix him. Don. T lie there, damn. You I he pulled a gun and pointed it at Fenner. Stay where you are. He said. LL blast you if you move. Fenner took another step forward. Dragging the bed and L at Iger with. Ahead, he said. S.I. he only. Think Iliat'll save you. Miller climbed to his and came at Fenner. With a rush. Ms. Great Fat Body knocked Fenner onto the bed. F at Inner fell with his right arm under him, and for a second, R so. Miller could hit him as, he liked. He smashed in a. Couple of punches. That didn't do Fenner any good, then Fenner got one of his legs up and kicked him off the bed. Miller got to his feet again and Riger came up behind Fenner and grabbed him round his throat. Miller stepped in then and slammed in three or four punches to Fenner's body. Miller was flabby, but he made his punches fell Fenner knew he wasn't the one to get worried about. Riger was the boy. Riger was hugging his throat with an arm like an iron band and Fenner felt his head begin to swim. Getting his feet firmly on the floor, he stiffened his body and heaved backwards. He, the bed and Riger all went over with a crash. Riger let go and tried to wriggle clear. Fenner was in a bad position. He was kneeling with his left hand twisted behind him and the bed resting on his back. The only way he could get out of the position was to heave the bed over again. As he straightened up, carrying the bed on his back, Riger kicked out at him. Riger's foot caught him behind his knee, and he went over. The muscles of his imprisoned arm seemed to catch fire, and, half crazy with the pain, Fenner slammed the bed over on top of Riger. The iron headpiece caught. Riger under the chin and Fenner heaved on the bed with all his weight. 
Riger's eyes started out of his head and he began to wave his arms. Violently. Fenner went on shoving. Miller dropped on him and started beating him about the head, but Fenner didn't take off the pressure. He knew he'd got Riger, and if he could stop him, he'd stand a chance with the other two. Riger was going a blackish purple, his arms only waved feebly. Carlos ran round and jerked the bed away. Riger flopped on his hands and knees, making a honking sound like a dog being sick. Miller had opened a cut just above Fenner's eyes and the steady stream of blood bothered him. He groped round with his free hand. He dug his fingers into N. Filler's belly. Miller gave a high whinny sound and tried to get away, but Fenner hung on, heaved, bringing the bed crashing down on both of them. Carlos stood peering down at them through the bed springs, but he couldn't get at them. He tried to pull the bed away, but Fenner held it with his arm. He kept the paralyzing grip on Miller, who began to scream and thrash with his legs. He tried beating Fenner's face with his fists. But Fenner just twisted some more, kept his head on his chest, and hung on. Carlos ran out, and Fenner could hear him shouting violently in Spanish. Miller gave a sudden heave and broke away. He went a whitish-green. Flopped him ply, and just lay there, staring at Fenner with frightened eyes. Fenner tried to smile, but couldn't make it. He kicked Miller away and turned the bed over slowly, he got his arm into a more natural angle. Then, working feverishly, he got the iron post out of the sockets of the bed and stood up. Even then, with his arm tied to the iron post, he was in a bad position. But not so bad Ash had been. He started for the door. As he passed, Riger, who was kneeling with his back to the wall, his hand to his throat, Fenner gave him a swipe with the iron post. Riger fell over on his side, covering his head with his arms. Fenner took more steps and got outside the room. He felt as if he was walking through glue. IES steps got slower as he reached the passage. And he suddenly fell on his hands and knees. He felt very lightheaded. And his chest began to hurt. He stayed on his hands and knees, wanting very badly to lie down, but he knew he had to go on. He put a hand on the wall and levered himself up again. He left a long smear of blood on the dirty yellow paper. He thought, I ain't gain to make it, and he fell down again. There came a lot of shouting downstairs and he tried to get back in the room again. He heard men coming up the stairs fast. He thought, this possible and tried once more to free his hand. It seemed welded to the thing. He struggled up as two excited little Cubans came rushing at him. They all went down in a heap together. One of them grabbed him at the throat and the six ther tangled his legs up. These little punks were strong. He heard Carlos's voice shout, not too hard, then something crashed on his head and he fell forward. Out of the blackness his hand encountered a face and he punched feebly, then a bright light burst before his eyes. And suffocating blackness blotted out everything. Fenner thought, must have taken a beating. They think. Can't start any more trouble he said that because he found they hadn't. Bothered to tie him this time. They had taken the bed away and left him. In the empty room on the floor. He gave himself a little while, but when. He tried to move he found he could just twitch his body. He, thought. The devil's the matter with me. B knew he wasn't tied. Because he couldn't feel any cord on him but he couldn't move. Then he became aware that the light was still on, but his eyes were so swollen that H, at, could only see a fuzzy blur. When he shifted his head, pain, like sheet lightning traveled all over him and he lay at again. Then, he went to sleep. 
He woke because someone was kicking him in the rib, not hard kicks, just heavy thumps, but the whole of Ida's body raved at the pain. Wake up, punk. Riker said, kicking continuously. At, T feeling so. Tough now, hey. Fenner screwed up everything he'd got in him, rolled. Towards the sound of the voice, and groped with his arms. He found Riker's legs hugged them and pulled. Rage R gave a strangled. Grunt, at led to save himself, and went over backwards. He landed with a. Crash that shook the room at Fenner crawled towards Shim grimly, but Riger kicked him away and scrambled to his feet. IES face was twisted with cold rage. He leant over Fenner, beat away the upraised arms, and grabbed him by his shirt front. He pulled him off the floor and slammed him down hard. Carlos came in and paused. D, in that for fun, H, asked. There was a faint rasp in his voice. Riger turned. P.I.O., he said through his teeth guys tough, see? I'm just softening him up. Carlos went over and looked down at Fenner. He stirred, with his foot. Then he looked over at Riger. Don't want him to croak. I want to find out things about him. I want to know why he came all the way from New York and got in with our mob. There's something phony about this, and I don't like it. Riger said. Suppose we make this guy talk. Carlos looked down at Fenner. Ain't in shape to be roughed around just yet. We'll try him in a little while. They went out Fenner came round again a little later. There seemed to be an iron clapper banging inside his skull. When he opened his eyes, the walls of the room converged on him. Terrified, he shut his eyes. Holding on to his reason. He stayed that way for a while, then he opened his eyes, slowly again. This time the walls move and he was no longer scared. He crawled on his hands and knees across the room and tried the door handle. The door was locked. He had only one obsession now. He wasifed going to tell them anything. They had beaten them over the head so much that he had lost much of his reason, and he was no longer aware of the pain that tortured his body. Be thought, V E gotta get O U T of this. T H pa on until they kill me. Then he remembered what T L the Chinese, and he went a little cold. Ku he thought. A cunning gleam came into his eyes and he put his hand on the buckle of his belt. He undid the belt and then he climbed pulled it through the loops of his trousers. Unsteadily to his feet. He had to put one hand against the wall to support himself. P of leather with exaggerated care he threaded the long street he passed the loop over his HEAD3 through the buckle. Then drew the belt tight round his neck. I.L.E. said, gotta find a now or a hook or something. I gotta fix the other end so ironware. He wandered round to do a complete the room. Searching the bare walls. He I'll circle of the room and stopped by the door again. He said, am I going to do now? He stood there, his head hanging on his chest. And the belt swinging from his leak. I.L.E. went round the room again more carefully, but the walls were naked. There was no window, no hooks, only the electric light bulb high up out of his reach. He wondered if by putting his foot through Jay's the loop made, GLE himself. He at the other end of the belt, he could strand decided he couldn't 70. He sat on the floor again and tried to think. The clapper went on banging. Inside his skull and he held his head in his hands, swaying to the beat then, he saw how he could do it. He said, "L guess I'm not as smart as I used to be. He crawled over to the door on his handle hands and knees and fastened the belt round the door. By lying face downwards he could hang himself all right. It'd take time, 
but he guessed if he stuck it held croak. He spent quite a time fastening the belt securely to the handle. He made it short so that his neck was only a few inches from the brass handle. Then he slid his feet away slowly until he was stretched out, his weight supported by his hands. He had no thoughts about his finish. He could only think that he was cheating Carlos. He remained still for a few seconds, then he took his hands away, allowing his whole weight to descend on the belt. The buckle bit into his neck sharply and the leather sank into his flesh. He thought triumphantly, s going to work I the blood began to pound in his head. The agony in his lungs nearly forced him to put his hands to the ground, but he didn't. He swayed on the belt, a blackness before his eyes. Then the handle of the door snapped off and he fell to the boards with a crash. He lay there dazed, breathing in the hot air in great gasps. Blood trickled from his neck where the buckle had bitten into him. A sick feeling of defeat was far worse than the pain that racked his tired body. Pulling the belt from his neck, he lay on his back staring up at the dirty ceiling. The blood from his neck set him thinking. IES mind was so dazed that he couldn't piece his thoughts together, but he knew that if he kept thinking he was going to find another solution. He stayed still for a time, then he sat up again. Once more the cunning look came into his eyes. He groped for the belt and examined the buckled a. It had a sharp, short spike that caught in the belt holes. Somewhere in his arms, he knew, were his main arteries. He'd ore to pierce them with the spike and he'd bleed to death. He said, way to go. I must be crazy not to have V. T round to that. Before. Laboriously he felt for the artery. When he thought he'd found. It, he took the buckle and pressed the spike into Leah's flesh. A tiny speck of blood appeared, and he pressed harder. The artery began to pulse and throb. Then suddenly the. Spike sank deep and the blood welled up. He was so X. F. Hosted that he fell back on the floor. His aching head struck the wall. And he went out in a bright flash of light. A shadowy figure materialized out of the bright mist. Fenner looked and wondered vaguely if it were an angel. It wasn't, it was Curly. She bent over him and said something he couldn't hear, and he mumbled, Hello, baby, softly. The room was building up into shape and the bright mist was going away. Behind Curly stood a little man with a face like a goat. Faintly, as if he were a long way off, Fenner heard him say, LL be all right now. Just make him lie there. If you want me, I'll come round, Fenner said. Me a drink of water, and fell asleep. When he woke again, he felt better. The clapper in his beat had stopped. Banging and the room stayed still. Curly was sitting on a chair near him, her eyes very heavy, as if she wanted sleep. Fenner said, God's sake minus one but Curly got up hastily and arranged the sheet. Tea talk yet, she said, re all right. Just go to sleep. Fenner shut his eyes and tried to think. It wasn't any use. The bed felt fine and the pain had gone away from his body. He opened his eyes again. Curly brought him some water. He said, T I get anything stronger in that. Curly said, Jughead, you're sick. You're slug nutty. So take. What's given you? After a little while, Fenner said, am I, anyway? Re in my room off White Street. Please, baby, would you mind? Skipping the mystery and I ding me know how I got here. Curly said. S late. You must go to sleep. I'll tell you about it tomorrow. Fenner. Raised himself on his elbows. He was ready to add Vince, but he didn't feel. Any pain. He was weak, but that was all. He said, V been sleeping too. Long. I want to know low. 
Curly sighed. Okay. You tough guys give. Me a Liam. Fenner didn't say anything. He lay back and waited. Curly wrinkled her forehead. Was mad with you. What did you do? Fenner looked at her, then said, forget. Curly sniffed. Told me. That P.I.O. had bounced you, and taken you to his waterfront place. I. Wanted to know what was happening to you. Nightingale got restless when. He cooled off. He reckoned he was letting Crotty down if he didn't look. After you. It didn't need much persuasion from me to get him to go and. Find out. He comes back with you looking as if someone had been working. Over you. He says for me to get a croaker and to look after you. Fenner. Didn't believe it. Little guy took me out of Carlos's place. Didn't. Carlos say anything. Curly yawned. Wasn't there. They were all over. At the hotel. Fenner said, see. He lay still, thinking, then he. Said, s the date. When she told him, he said, at it's still May. She. Nodded. He reckoned painfully. He'd been away from glory for four days. It seemed a lot longer than that. Then he said, missed me yet. Curly yawned again. Uh-huh, but he. Ain't linked me or Nightingale up with it. Maybe he'll get around to it. He thinks of everything air Fenner shifted. He passed his fingers. Through his age gently. IES skull was very tender. That guy won't like. You too much if he finds out. Curly shrugged. You're right, she said. And yawned again. S a lot of room in your bed. Would it embarrass you? If I got me some sleep. Fenner S at Ed. You come on in. Curly smiled and went out of the room. She came back. In a little while in a pink woolly dressing gown. Fenner said, well. That's homely, isn't it, B? She came round and sat on the far end of. The bed. Okay but it's warm, she said. She kicked off her slippers and. To off her dressing gown. Wouldn't think it, but I'm always cold in. Bed, she said. She was wearing a pair of light wool pajamas. He watched her climb in beside him. Sleep in suit looks kind of. Unromantic, too, doesn't it, he said. She laid her blonde head on the pillow. A bit. She yawned and blinked. Her eyes. I'm tired, she said. After a guy like you is hard work. Fenner said gently. You sleep. Maybe you'd like me to sing to you. Curly said, drowsily, and fell asleep. Fenner lay still in the darkness, listening to her deep breathing, and tried to think. He still felt dazed and his mind kept wandering. After a while he, too, went to sleep. The morning light woke him. He opened his eyes and looked round the room, conscious that his head was clear and his body no longer ached. Although he was a little stiff as he moved in the bed, he felt quite well. Curly sat up slowly in bed and blinked round. She said, Hello, how you? Making out. Fenner grinned at her. It was a twisted grin, but it reached his eyes all right. V.E. been a good pal to me, he said. What made you do it, baby? She turned on her side. T. Worry your brains about that, she said. Told you first time I met you I thought. You were nice. She closed her eyes. Fenner said drowsily, are you thinking? She put her hand up to his. Face gently. She said, was just thinking how tough it is to run across. A guy like you when it's too late. Fenner moved away from her. Mustn't look at it like that, he said seriously. She suddenly laughed, but her eyes were serious. L I'll get you some. Breakfast. You'll find a razor in the bathroom. By the time he'd shaved. His beard off, 
breakfast was on the table. He went and sat down. He said, looking at the food. The dressing gown he'd found in the cupboard must have belonged to Nightingale. It reached to his ankles and pinched him across his shoulders. Curly giggled at him. Do look a scream. Fenner made short work of the food, and Curly had to go outside and fry him some more eggs. She said. Guess you're mending fast. Fenner nodded. Am great. Tell me, baby. Does Nightingale mean anything to you? She poured him out some more. Coffee. Es a habit. I've been with him for a couple of years. He's kind to me, and I guess he's crazy about me. She shrugged. Know how. It is. I don't know anyone I like better, so I feel I may as well make him happy. Fenner nodded, sat back and lit a cigarette. S. Thaler. Mean to you. Kali's face froze. The laughter went out of her eyes. Once a dick, always a dick, she said bitterly, getting to her feet. Ain't talking shop with you copper. So you know that. Curly began to. Stack the plates. I'll know it. Dot. But Nightingale pulled me out. Of that jam. Owes crotty something. Curly took the plates away. Fenner sat thinking. When she came back, he said, T get that way. Baby. You and I could get places. Curly leaned over the table. Her face. Was hard and suspicious. Re not getting anywhere with me on that. Line, she said, forget it. Fenner said, we'll forget it all. When she had shut herself in the bathroom, Nightingale came in. He stood. Looking at Fenner with a hard eye. Fenner said, pal. I guess you got me out of a nasty jam. Nightingale. Didn't move. He said, you're okay, you better dust. This Berg's too. Small for you and Carlos. Fenner said, bet it is. Sort of pull you. Got with Crotty, policeman. Nightingale asked. S the idea. Has no. Use for Carlos. I'm gunning for that guy. This is the way Crotty wants it to go. Nightingale came further into. The room. V gotta get out of town quick he said. Carlos knows. That I've helped you, what do you think he'll do to me? Fenner's eyes. Were very intent as they watched Nightingale. Am starting for Carlos. You better get yourself on the winning side. Yet. Yeah. I'm on it already. You get out of here, or I'll help to run you out. Nightingale was very. Serious and quiet. Fenner knew it was no use talking to him. It your own way, he said. Nightingale hesitated, took a .38 special from his pocket, and put it on. The table. S to see you out of town safe. Crotty did a lot for me. If you're still around by tonight. You better. S at shootin' when you see me, get the idea. He went out, closing the door gently behind him. Fenner picked up the gun and held it loosely in his hand. Well, well, he said. Curly came out of the bathroom. She saw the gun. Been in. Fenner. Nodded absently for. Friendly. The same as you. Curly grunted. Ready to leave. I'm. Getting my car. I'll drop you anywhere. Fenner said. He was thing. Then he looked. At her. Is gain to be washed up. You might like to talk now. Curly. Pursed her mouth. She said. Clothes are in the cupboard. They'll. Do to get you to your hotel. She went to the door. LL get the bus. Fenner dressed as quickly as he could. His clothes looked as though. They'd been mixed up in a road smash. He didn't care. When he de finished dressing, he went to the door and stepped into the passage. 
IIIS. Intention was to meet Curly downstairs. He walked slowly to the head of the stairs. He found that he wasn't as tough as he thought. It was an effort to move, but he kept on. At the head of the stairs he paused. Curly was lying on the landing below. Fenner stood very still, and stared. Then he pulled the gun from his hip pocket and went down the stairs cautiously. There was no one about. When he came nearer he could see the handle of a knife sticking out of her back. He stopped and turned her. Her head fell back, but she was still breathing. It took a great effort for him to get her upstairs. She was heavy, and he was trembling by the time he got her on the bed. He put her down. Gently, then snatched up the telephone. Nightingale's number was on the address pad. He dialed, standing with his eyes on Curly. Nightingale said primly, is the funeral parlor. Fenner said. Over here quick. They've got Curly. He hung up and went over to the bed. Curly opened her eyes. When she saw Fenner she held one of her hands out. To him. Me right for helping a dick, she said faintly. Fenner didn't dare pull the knife out. He held her so that she didn't have any weight on the handle. He said, take it easy, baby, I'm getting help. Curly twisted. S going to come a lot too late, she said, then her face crumpled and she began to cry. Fenner said, it Carlos. Curly didn't say anything. Blood stained her chin. Fenner said, me a lead. Don't be a mug and let him get away with it. He'll only think you're a sucker. Curly said, was one of his Cubans. He jumped me before could scream. Fenner saw she was going very white. He said quickly, does Thaler carry your photo around with him? What's he to you? Curly whispered faintly, s my husband. Fenner saw. She was going fast. He put his hand round her back and pulled the knife. Out. Her eyelids fell back and she gave a little cry. Then she said, S a lot better. He laid her down on the bed. I'll. Even this up for you. Carlos will pay for this, he said. She sneered. Brave little man, she whispered. Carlos, if you like. But it won't do me any good. Fenner remembered seeing some scotch, and he went over to the wall cupboard and poured out two fingers. He made her swallow it. She gasped. S right. Keep me alive until I've told you all you want to. No, bitterly. Fenner took her hands. Kin put a lot straight. Is Thaler in with? Carlos. She hesitated, then moved her head a little. S in it all. Right she said faintly. S been a bad guy, and I don't owe him. Anything. S his angle. The labor syndicate. She shut her eyes. Then she said, T ask me anything else, will you? I'm frightened. Fenner felt completely helpless. Her skin now looked like waxed paper. Only a red bubble at her lips showed that she still lived. Someone came blundering up the stairs. Fenner ran to the door. Nightingale came in. IES face was glistening. He pushed past Fenner and ran across to the bed. He was too late. Curly had died just before he came in. Fenner stepped outside the room and pulled the door to. As he walked quickly down the passage a low wail came from behind the door. It was Nightingale. The manager of the Hayworth Hotel came round the desk quickly when he saw Fenner. Is all this, he spluttered, his voice trembling with indignation. Do you think this joint is? T ask me, Fenner said. Pushing past him. It's a joint, where are the girls? The manager ran. To keep up with him. Ross, I insist. I cannot have these disturbances. Fenner paused. 
Are you yapping? About. People are afraid to go up on floor 3. There's a rough. Hoodlum sitting up there, not letting anyone pass. I've threatened him. With the police, but he says you told him to stick around. What does it mean? Fenner said my check ready. I'm moving out. He went upstairs. For Uickley, leaving the manager protesting. There was no sign of Bugsy. When he reached his room, and kicked open the door and went in. Glory was sitting up in bed and Bugsy was sifting close to her. They were playing cards. Bugsy wore a pair of white shorts and his hat. Sweat was running down his fat back. Fenner stood still. S gain on here. Glory threw down her cards. Have you been, she said. S happened to you. Fenner went in and shut. The door. Plenty, he said. Then, turning to Bugsy, you think you're doing a strip tease. Glorick said, was playing for my nighty, but I beat him to it. Bugsy grabbed his trousers. Sure came in at the right moment, he said feverishly. That dame's a mean card player. Fenner wasn't in the mood for laughter. He said, out quick and get a closed car. Park it at the rear of the building in a quarter of an hour. Bugsy struggled into his clothes. Like someone's been pushing you. Around. Never mind about me, Fenner said coldly, is urgent. Bugsy. Went out, pulling his coat on. Fenner said, you get up, do you think? Glory threw the sheet off and slid to the floor. Only stayed in bed. Because it upset poor little Bugsy she said. What's been happening? Fenner dug himself out a new suit and changed. T stand there gaping he snapped. Dressed. We're moving out of this. Joint fast. She began to dress. She said. T you tell me where you've been. Fenner was busy emptying the drawers into two grips. Was taken. For a ride by a gang of toughs. Just shaken off. Are we going? Fenner said evenly, regained to stay with Noalan. Glory shook her head. Am not, she said. Fenner finished strapping the grips and stood up. He took two quick steps across the room and put his hand on her wrist. Redoing what I tell you, he said. Not Noalan's. S what I said. I'm not standing for any comeback from you. You can walk, or I'll carry you. He went to the house and rang for his check. While waiting, he paced the room restlessly. Glory sat on the bed, watching him with uneasy eyes. She said, are you starting? Fenner looked up. He said, this mob started on me, and... Now I'm at Shing it. I'm not stopping until I've bust the mystery right. Out of this business and got that little punk so short he'll scream. Murder. The bellhop brought in the check and Fenner settled. Then he picked up his grips in one hand and took Glory by her elbow. With the other. Esco, he said, and together they went downstairs. They found Bugsy sitting at the wheel of a big car. Bugsy was looking. A little dazed, but he didn't say anything. Fenner climbed in behind Glory. S. Fast, he said. Bugsy twisted round in his seat. S, he said. Why no Allens? Listen, you don't want to go to that guy. He's the south end of a horse. Fenner leaned forward. No Allens, he. Repeated, looking at Bugsy intently. You don't like it, get out and... I'll drive. Bugsy gaped from Fenner to Glory. She said, ahead. Brave heart, this fella's making his orders stick. Bugsy said. Well, and drove off. Glory sat in the corner of the car, a sulky expression on her face. Fenner stared over Bugsy's broad shoulders at the road ahead. They... 
drove all the way to New Orleans in silence. When they swept up the short circular drive Glory said, Don't want to. Go in there. She said it more in protest than in any hope of Fenner's. A greeting. He swung open the door and got out. Come on, both of you, he said impatiently. It was half past eleven o'clock as they walked into the deserted lobby of the casino. In the main hall they found a Cuban in shirt sleeves. Aimlessly pushing an electric cleaner about the floor. He looked up as they crossed towards him, and his mouth went a little slack. His eyes fastened on Glory, who scowled at him. No all in around. Fenner said. The Cuban pressed the thumb switch on the cleaner and laid it down. Almost tenderly. LLC, he said. Fenner made a negative sign with his head. Stay put, he said shortly. He cut across the hall in the direction of Noalan's office. The Cuban said, feebly, but he stayed where he was. Glory and Bugsy lagged along in the rear. Fenner pushed open the door of the office and stood looking in. Noalan was sitting at his desk. He was counting a large pile of greenbacks. When he saw Fenner his face went blotchy and he swept the green backs into a drawer. Fenner walked in. Is no hold up, he said shortly, s a council of war. He turned his head and said to Glory and Bugs Why, who hung about outside, in, you two, and shut the door. Noalan sat very still. Behind his desk. When Glory came in, he put his fingers to his collar and eased it from his neck. Glory didn't look at him. She went over to a chair at the far end of the room and sat down. Bugsy shut the door and leaned against it. He, too, didn't look at Noalan. There was forestrained tension in the room. Noalan managed to say, The hell's this? Fenner took one of Noalan's green dapple cigars from the desk box clamped his teeth on it and struck a match with his thumbnail. He spent a long minute lighting the cigar evenly, then he tossed the match away and sat on the edge of the desk. Noalan said, V got a lot of crust, Ross. I told you I wasn't interested in anything UVP, got to pedal. It still stands. Glory. Said in a flat voice, isn't Ross. IES name is Fenner, and he's a private investigator's holding a license. Fenner turned his head and looked at her, but she was adjusting her skirt, a sulky, indifferent expression on her face. Bugsy sucked in his breath. IES gooseberry eyes popped. Noalan, who was reaching for a cigar when Glory spoke, paused. His fat. White hand hovered over the box like a seagull in flight, then he sat back, folding his hands on the blotter. Fenner said, you were half alive, the news would have got round to you. Before. Noalan fidgeted with his bands. Out of here, he said. Thickly. Dicks are poison to me. And me ve got a job to do, Fenner. Said, looking at it the fat man with intent eyes. Law doesn't come. Irate, I this Noalan said viciously, out I without any effort, Fenner. Hit him on the side of his jaw. Noalan jerked back, his fat thighs, pinned under the dacama at, saved him. From going over. Fenner slid off the desk, took four quick steps away. And turned a little so that he could see the three of them. Bugsy's hand was groping m his back pocket. His law at comma showed the indecision that was bewildering him. Fenner said, It. If you start something, I'll smack your ears for. You. Bugsy took his hand away and transferred it to his head. He scratched his square dome violently. Guess I'll scram, he said. You'll stay if you are wise. Fenner said evenly. Might be interested. To know what you've been doing playin' around with a dick. Bugsy went. A little green. Didn't know you were a dick he said sullenly. Fenner sneered. 
it to Carlos. You don't have to tell it to me. Bugsy. Hesitated, then he slumped against the wan. Fenner glanced at Noalan, who sat in a heap, rubbing his jaw. All the fight had gone out of him. He said. Maybe I can get down to things. You and me are game to run Carlos and his mob out of town. Bugsy here can either come in on our side, or go back to Carlos. I don't care a lot what he does. If he goes back he'll have a lot of explaining. If he sticks, he'll pick up 500 bucks a week until the job's cleaned up. Bugsy's eyes brightened. LL stick for that amount, he said. Fenner felt in his wallet, took out a sheaf of notes, crumpled them into a ball, and tossed them at Bugsy. That's something to go on with, he said. Noalan watched all this in silence. Fenner came across and sat on the desk again. Would you like to be the kingpin in this burg, he said. S what you can be if you work with me. Noalan's voice was very husky. We'll get your little mob and me and Bugsy and we'll make the town. Very hot for Carlos. We'll hijack his boats, we'll sabotage his organization, and we'll go gunning for him. Noalan shook his head. No. We won't, he said. Fenner said evenly, yellow big shot. Still scared. V never worked. With the cops and I never will. Don't understand. Four days ago. Carlos had me in his waterfront place. He made things pretty tough, but. I. Got away. I'm making this a personal business. I'm not inviting the. Law to come along. Noalan shook his head. Ain't play in dot. Fenner. Laughed. We'll make you play. He stood up. In this, he said to. Bugsy. Bugsy nodded. LL hang around, he said. Fenner nodded to Glory. On, baby he said. Me and Bugsy'll look. After this until this punk decides to fight. Glory got up. Don't. Want to play either. Fenner showed his teeth. A shame, he said. Walking over to her and taking her arm. You're not Noalan, you'll do. As you're told. Noalan said, her alone. Fenner took no notice. S. Go, he said, and they went out of the room, Glory walking stiffly. Beside him. Out in the street, Fenner paused. He said to Glory, LL stay at your. Place. Glory shook her head. Told you I haven't got a place. Fenner. Smiled. LL go where you keep your clothes. That evening dress looks sort of out of place at this time. Glory. Hesitated, then she said, I honestly don't want to be mixed up with. Carlos. Will you please excuse me? Fenner pushed her into the car. S. Too late, baby, he said unpleasantly. Can't have anyone shoot in you. Up whenever they want to. You've got to stick by me for a while. She. Heaved a sigh. I've got a little place off Sponge Pier. Fenner. Nodded to Bugsy. Pier, fast, he said. Bugsy climbed into the car and Fenner followed him. He sat close to Glory, keeping his grips upright between his legs. S. Gain to be an awful lot of run in this joint pretty soon, he said. I'll get somewhere or maybe I won't, but whatever happens to me. Carlos will go first. Glory said, quite hate that guy, don't you? Fenner looked ahead. IES eyes were very cold. Betby said curtly. About half a mile past Sponge Pier, hidden by a thick cluster of palm trees, was a small bungalow. Bugsy ran the car through the small landscape garden and parked it outside the door. A wide piazza screened. By green sun blinds encircled the house, and every window had green wooden sun shutters. 
Fenner got out of the car and Glory followed him. She said to Bugsy. Garage is at the back. Fenner said, got a car. Yes. Do you mind? Fenner looked at Bugsy. That rented car back. We'll use this baby's. We can't afford to be extravagant Glory said. T mind me. A staff here. Fenner asked, looking the house over. I've got a woman who runs the place. S fine. Bugsy can help her. Once more Fenner turned to Bugsy. The car back, then come on here. Miss. Leadler will tell her woman you're coming. Then you make yourself. Useful until I want you. Get it. Bugsy said, repay in the bill. And he drove the car away. Fenner followed Glory into the bungalow. It was a nice place. A small. Spanish woman appeared from nowhere, and Glory waved her hand. This is. Mr. Fenner. He'll be staying a little while. Will you fix lunch? They. Woman gave Fenner a quick look. He didn't quite like the smirk in her. Eyes, and she went away again. Glory opened a door on the left of the lobby. In there and rest. Yourself. I want to change. Fenner said, and wandered into the. Room. It was comfortable, cushions, divans and more cushions. The open windows led out to the piazza, and the room was dim with. Subdued sunlight. The Spanish woman came in and laid a table for lunch on the piazza. Fenner sat on one of the divans and smoked. He said, you're through, you might get me a drink. She took no notice of him, and he didn't bother to speak again. He sat quite still. Glory came in after a while. She wore a white silk dress, ankle length, and white doeskin sandals. Her red gold hair was caught back off her ears by a red ribbon. Her mouth was very red and her eyes sparkled. She said, me, and pivoted slowly. Yeah, he said, getting up. Re all right. She made a little grimace. At him and went over to fix drinks. The ice cold cocktails had a bite. When they sat down to the meal. Fenner felt fine. They got through the meal without saying much. Fenner was conscious of Glory's eyes. She kept looking at him and then, when he glanced up, she'd look. Hurriedly away. They talked about the bungalow and the Spanish woman and. Things that didn't matter. After the woman had cleared away, Fenner lounged on the divan. Glory. Moved restlessly about the room. Fenner followed her with his eyes. Because she was beautiful to watch. She said suddenly, T sit there. Doing nothing. Do you want me to do? She went over to the window and looked out. Fenner watched her with interest. She said, On, I'll show you my place. Fenner got off the divan and followed her across the lobby and into another large room. It was very bare. Polished boards, rugs, and a large divan bed, that was all. A small dressing room and a bathroom led off to the right. She stood aside to let Fenner pass and then shut the door behind her. He looked into the dressing room and then into the bathroom while she waited. Nice, he said. He could hear the sound of her breathing from where he stood. He didn't look at her. He kept moving about the room while she waited. Then he said suddenly, S talk. She sat limply on the bed. She put her laced fingers behind her head. Fenner looked down at her. His face was expressionless. Thaler's the guy who runs Carlos's labor syndicate. He was married to Curly Robbins, Nightingale's assistant. Carlos has just killed her. You ran with Thaler. Did you know what his racket was? She said down here, and I'll talk to you. He sat down. Close to her. Me your hand. He put his hand in hers. You know. He repeated. 
She gripped it hard. I knew, she said. Fenner sat very still. You know he was married to Curly, she lay with. Her eyes closed, her teeth biting her underlip. Fno. Knew all about Carlos as well. I knew all about him. She. Sat up. She wound her arms around his neck, pulling his head down to. Her. Before her lips could reach his mouth he shoved her away. Cut it out, he said harshly, getting to his feet. Don't get anywhere. With me. He went out of the room, unlocking the door and leaving it. Open. He passed Bugsy wandering in from outside. He didn't say. Anything, but went on into the garden. Chapter 5 Towards evening Fenner returned to the bungalow. He found Bugsy sitting. On the porch steps, making patterns on the gravel path with a piece of wood. He said, as he went past, in a pipe dream, Bugsy started, but before he could say anything Fenner had passed into the bungalow. He went straight to Glory's room. Glory was sitting on the window seat, dressed in a pale green wrap. She was looking out of the window, and she turned quickly as Fenner walked in. It, she said. Fenner shut the door. V.E. got a little story to tell you. The Federal Bureau have been digging up the past, and I've been looking the dope. Over. Some quite interesting stuff. Glory sat on the bed. I'll tell. You, he said evenly. Of it's just guesswork, some of it's facts, but. It makes a nice little story. It starts off in a hick town in Illinois. The guy who runs this town gets himself a young wife. That's all right. But the young wife has got big ideas. She begins to spend more money. Than her hubby can make. The name of this guy is Liedler, and he's a. Politician of sorts. You married him because you thought you could get. Out of the cheap song and dance show you were touring in. Well, you did. Liedler, to keep you in silk pants, helps himself to a lot of dough that belongs to the town. You both take a powder to Florida. Glory folded. Her hands in her lap. You can't do anything to me she said. Fenner shook his head. That's not the idea, B said. Wouldn't want to do anything to you. Let me go on. You and Liedler part. I don't know why, but as Thaler now appears on the scene, I take it you prefer a younger and richer man. Okay, you lose sight of Liedler, and you go for a cruise with Thaler. Before you turn up, he was married to Curly Robbins. T. Baylor absorbs the chinks Carlos smuggles into the country. He pays Carlos so much a head, and sells the Chinks to sweatshops up the coast. Curly knew all about that, so it was dangerous to let her float around without being watched. Thaler gets her a job with Nightingale, who does odd jobs for Carlos. She gets good money, doesn't have to do much, and Nightingale can look after her. You want to divorce Liedler so you can marry Thaler. Thaler never told you he was married and you can't find Liedler. Then one day your boat comes into Key West and you go along for an evening's fun to the local casino. You recognize Noalan as your long-lost husband. That's a surprise, isn't it? Glory chewed her under lip. Think you're smart, don't you, she said, stormily. Noalan, or Liedler, if you like, isn't doing so well with Ms. Casino. So he's willing to give you a divorce if you pay him for it. You want the dough to give to him, but Thaler won't part. It's stalemate for a moment. You don't care a lot for Thaler, it's his dough you want. That guy certainly rolls in dough. You want to be always sure they're going to get it, and the only way you can be sure is to marry him. The cops have turned up some dirt that proves that, while you were with Thaler, you also had a chink running around. 
You two kept under cover, but not well enough. This chink used to work for Carlos. He disappeared about a couple of months ago. Maybe Thaler found out and tipped Carlos. I don't know, but he disappeared. What happened to him, baby? Glory. Began to cry. Fenner went on, mind. Maybe it doesn't matter. Now your mysterious sister turns up. She comes to see me. It's a funny thing, but the cops can't give me a lead on that dame. They can't dig further into your past than your song and dance days. This looks like your sister was a better girl than you, and she kept out of trouble. Why she came to me, and why she knew about the Chinese, Noalan. And Carlos, I can't explain yet. I'll get round to it someday, but right now it's got me beat. As far as I'm concerned, it's your sister who gets me to come down here. I find the situation lined up like this, s. Frightened of Thaler and Carlos. I can under stand that now. He doesn't want anyone to know he's Liedler, and I bet you've told Thaler that, or if you haven't he thinks you have. You and Thaler are not getting on too well. You're quarreling. Then, maybe, you learn that he's married. And you shoot him. You get scared and run to me. You like the look of me and you're looking round for someone to hook up with again, so after you've shot Thaler you come along to my hotel. Now you haven't killed Thaler. He's waiting in his car parked by the boat. He nearly kills me. And, later, he knows you've taken something from the boat, after you shot him. Isn't that right, all you know, she said. Oh not it, you're concerned. You and I can go after him. I'm going to smash Carlos and his racket and Thaler may as well go with him. What do you think? Glory said, must think. Go away now. I want to get things straight. Fenner got to his feet. LL be waiting in the other room. Make it snappy, he said. He went to the door and then paused. What was your sister to you, he said abruptly. Glory shifted her eyes. She said. Hated her. She was mean, narrow-minded and a mischief maker. Fenner raised his eyebrows. Don't believe a lot you say, he said, but maybe that's true. You're not sorrowing for her, are you? Should I, she said. Fiercely. Got what was coming to her. Fenner stood by the door. Then. He said slowly, gives me an idea. You and Thaler were in New York at the time of her death. You two girls were almost twins. Suppose Thaler fell for her. Suppose you came in and found them, got jealous and killed her. Suppose Thaler got those two Cubans to carve her up and get rid of her. Were those two guys working for him, Glory said, run away. You'll be thinking I'm worse than I am Fenner was quite startled at this new idea. He came back into the room again, that the way it went, he said. Come on, did you kill Marion Daly? Glory laughed in his face. You're nuts, she said. Course I didn't. Fenner scratched his head. He said, I don't think that's quite the way it went. It won't explain. The guy who said she was screwy, and it won't explain the chink in my office. Still, it's an idea. He stood looking at her for several moments, then walked out of the room, leaving her polishing her nails. Outside, Fenner went into the sitting room. A vague feeling of excitement stirred him, a feeling that he was approaching a solution of the mystery of this business. He went over to the sideboard and helped himself to a drink. Bugsy wandered in. One for me, he said hopefully. Fenner jerked his head. Yourself, 
he said, sitting down on the divan. Bugsy poured a long drink and stood blinking at the glass. He took a long pull and smacked his lips. Fenner glanced at him, but said nothing. Bugsy fidgeted with his eyes, then said cautiously, Ain't nice, is. She. Isn't. Fenner was thinking about other things. Her, in there. Bugsy jerked his head. S something the matter with. Her, or something, ain't there. Is all this. Fenner wished he'd go. Bugsy said, nothing, and finished his drink. He looked at Fenner. Furtively, then helped himself to another. Next time you go out, you might take me with you, Bugsy said. Somehow I don't feel too safe alone with her. Fenner scowled at him. Listen, pal, he said. You take a little walk. I've got a lot on my mind. Bugsy finished N.S. drink. Sure, he said apologetically. Guess I'll take a little nap. He shuffled off. Fenner lay on the divan, holding the glass of scotch, and staring out of the window. He stayed that way for a long time. Hoskiss, the federal man, had been very helpful. He had turned all his information over to Fenner, and promised to try to dig up some more during the next few days. He was even hopeful of finding a line on Marion Daly, although up to now he couldn't dig up anything. No Allen, so long as he kept to Florida, was safe. He couldn't be prosecuted. Fenner wondered how smart Noalan was, and if he could be bluffed. He thought he might try and see how he got on. He was still there when Glory came in at sundown. She sat by his side. Fenner said, you thought it over. She said, dot. There was a long pause. Fenner said, re-wondering what's going to happen to you, aren't you? You think if T. Haler goes, you've got to start hunting around for some other man to keep you? Glory's eyes hardened. Think of everything, don't you, she said. Don't get high hat. I've thought about you, too. It's going to be tough, but there's no other way out. Thaler's on the skids, and the sooner you cut away from him the safer it's going to be for you. You don't need to worry. Take a look at a mirror. A dame like you won't starve. Glory giggled. Recute she said. Want to hate you, but you're too cute. Don't you ever make love to a girl. Fenner said, S. Keep to business. Never mind what I do. I'm working now, and I never play when I work. Glory sighed. Guess that's all ho, E.Y. Fenner nodded. This was boring him. What about Thaler? Did you take anything from him? Glory pouted. Do you think I did? It's a guess. Why did he want to shoot you? Revenge? Too risky. He knew you were with me. To stop you talking? Yes, that adds up. Glory went over to the sideboard and opened a wooden biscuit chest. She came back with a small leather wallet. She threw it into his lap. Took that, she said defiantly. Fenner found a number of papers in the wallet. He lit a cigarette and went through them carefully. Glory at first sat close to him. Watching, then, when she saw how absorbed he was, she got up and went out on the piazza. She fidgeted around for nearly ten minutes. Then she came back again. Fenner said, without looking up from his reading, a meal together. Baby, I'm going to have a late night. She went out and left him. Later, when she came back, he was sitting where she had left him, smoking. They wallet and the papers weren't any longer in sight. Well, she said. 
Fenner looked at her. His eyes were hard. Of those guys know you've got this place. She shook her head. One. Fenner frowned. Don't. Tell me that you put this joint together all on your own. He wasn't. Sure whether her face had gone pale or whether it was a trick of the light. She said evenly, wanted somewhere to go when I was sick of all this. So I saved, bought the place, and no one knows about it. Fenner grunted. Know what's in that wallet? Well, I looked at it. It didn't mean anything to me. Well, it means a hue of a lot to Thaler. There are four receipts of money paid by Carlos to him. Two IOUs from Noalan. Four large sums of money, and particulars of five places where they land. The chinks. Glory shrugged. Can't cash that at the bank, she said. Indifferently. Fenner grinned. I can, he said, getting to his feet. Give me a big envelope, will you, baby? She pointed to a little desk. In the window recess. Yourself. He went over and put the contents of the wallet in the envelope, scrawled a note, and addressed the envelope. To Miss. Paula Dolan, Room 1156, Roosevelt Building, New York City. Glory, who had been reading over his shoulder, said, S the girl. Suspiciously. Fenner tapped the envelope with a long finger. S the dame who runs my office. Send it to her. Listen, baby, I'm playing this my way. If I liked I could turn this over to Hoskiss, the federal man, and get him to crack down on those two guys. It would be enough for him to start an investigation. But Carlos has been tough with me, so I'm gained to be tough with him. Maybe he'll get me before I get him, in that case the stuff gets turned over to the cops, after all. Get it? Glory shrugged. Then are either chasing women or getting themselves into a jam because of their pride, she said. I love a guy who takes on a mob single-handed to even things up. It's like the movies. Fenner stood up. He said. Said single-handed. He went out onto the piazza. I'm going to put this in the mail. I'll be right back, and then we can feed. On his way back from mailing the letter he passed a cable office. He paused, thought, and then went in. He wrote a cable out and took it to the desk. The clerk checked the message and looked at Fenner hard. The message ran, Dolan. Room 1156 Roosevelt Building, New York CIT. Report progress by Grosset of Daily Murder. Rush. D.F.Y. Fenner paid. Nodded, and went out again. He walked fast back to the bungalow. Glory was waiting for him with cocktails. Fenner said, I'm in a hurry. Let's eat and drink at the same time. Glory rang the bell. Are you going, she asked. Fenner smiled. I'm going to see your husband, he said gently. It's time he forgot his shyness and started to play ball Glory shrugged. Guy like that won't help you much, she said. While they ate, Fenner kept silent. After the meal he stood up listen. Baby, this is serious. Until these guys have been washed up you've got to stay here. On no account must you leave this joint. You know too much. And you've put Thaler in a spot. Any one of the mob would slit your throat if they saw you. So stay put. Glory was inclined to argue, but Fenner stopped her. Your age, he said patiently. Won't take long. And it'll save you for some other poor sap. Glory said, well, and went over to the divan. Fenner walked out into the kitchen. Bugsy had just finished supper and was making eyes at the Spanish woman, who ignored him. Fenner said, I'm going out. Maybe I'll be back. 
Tonight, maybe I won't. Lumbered to his feet. I bring a rod, he said. Fenner shook his head. Stay here, he said. Job is to protect MSS. Leadler. You keep awake and watch out. Someone might try and rub her. Out. Bugsy said, Boss, for God's sake Fenner said impatiently. Stay here, Bugsy shuffled us feet. Dame don't want protectin' I'm. The guy who wants protectin'. Are you yapping about? You always. Wanted a flock of dames. She's as good as twenty dames, isn't she? Fenner asked him, and before he could reply he left. Noalan said, thought I told you to keep out of here. Fenner threw two pieces of paper on the desk. A look at that, he said. Noalan picked up the papers, glanced at them, then stiffened. He looked sharply at Fenner, then back to the papers again. You'd better burn, Fenner said. Noalan was already reaching for a match. They stood in silence until they Charred ash drifted onto the floor. Fenner said, S saved you a little, hasn't it, Leadler? Noalan went. Very pale. He said hoarsely, T call me that, damn you. Fenner said. Did Thaler lend you ten grand? For how did you get those? Oh, I found them. I thought maybe you'd feel more. Disposed to play ball if you well e out of Thaler's debt. Noalan fidgeted with his eyes. S been talking, he said. There was a vicious, gritty quality in his voice. Fenner shook his head. Got it from the cops. Listen, buddy, you might just as well make up your mind. If you don't play ball with me, I'll take you back to Illinois. I guess they'd be glad to see you. Noalan sat down. He said. You start from the beginning. Fenner studied. His fingernails. Want a little war to start, he said. Of all I. Want Carlos's mob jumped. I want his boats put out of action, and I want. Carlos on a plate. Then we can start on Thaler. Noalan brooded. Mob's tough, he said. Ain't gain to be easy. Fenner grinned coolly. Shock tactics, buddy, he said. We'll have them running in circles. Who can you get to tackle Carlos? Got any muscle men? Noalan nodded. Know a little gang who'd do it for. A consideration. Then it's up to you to give. Them what they want. I've saved you ten grand, so that's something you can spend. Why did Thaler lend you that dough? Noalan shifted his eyes. Fenner. Lent forward. You rat, if you don't come clean with me I'll throw. You to the wolves. Hell. You're so yellow you'd want a pair of. Water wings in your bath. Spill it, canary. Noalan pushed back his. Chair. Didn't want me to divorce Glory, he said sullenly so he lent. Me the dough. Lately he's been yelling for it. Fenner sneered. Re a nice lot, he said, getting up. Show me your hoods. Noalan said, didn't say I'd do it. Am gain to smack you in a minute if you go on like this, Fenner said. Forget I'm anything to do with the cops. This burg doesn't mean anything to me. I want Carlos and his mob kicked out of here and I'm having the fun of. Seem it done. After that I'm clearing out. It's up to you to horn in. And make yourself the kingpin when they've gone. And, Olin got up. Think the outfit's too big, but if that s the way you put it, I'll see. How it goes. They went out together. A four-minute drive brought them. To a pool room on Duval Street. Noalan walked followed by Fenner. They. Harmon nodded to Noalan, who went on through the back. In a large room with one billiard table and two green. Shaded lamps, five men stood around making the atmosphere thick with. 
tobacco smoke. They all looked up quickly as Noalan and Fenner walked in. One of them put his cue in the rack and slouched out of the room. Noalan said, Want to talk to you boys? They came drifting up through the smoke, their faces expressionless and their cold eyes restless. Noalan jerked his thumb at Fenner. Guys Fenner. He's been getting ideas about Carlos's mob. Thinks if s time we rode them out of town. They all looked at Fenner. Then a tall thin man, with a cutaway chin. And watery, vicious eyes said. Well, that's a swell idea. That'll get us all a bang-up funeral. Sure thing. Fenner said quietly, me no. These guys. Noalan said, that's Shafe, indicating the man WHC, had. Just spoken. Scafani in the green shirt, Kamarinsky Holden the Q. And Mick Alex the guy with the squint. Fenner thought they were a fine. Collection of rats. He nodded. S get together, he said, wandering. Over to the long padded seats, raised to overlook the billiard. Table. How about some drinks? Shafe said to Noalan, S the guy, boss. Noalan smiled sourly, S the original white-headed boy, he said. Won't go wrong with him. They all sat down on the bench and fidgeted. Until the Harmon brought drinks. Fenner said, Is my party Newlands they? Guy who'll pay for it aid, got a date with a scaff and I, a little. Dried up Italian, s things dame in a little while. Suppose we get down to the others grunted. Fenner said, Has been the big shot in this town too long. We're going. To make things so hot for him he's going to take a powder. I want you boys to get together on this. This ain't a picnic, it's war. Es it worth? Shafe said. Fenner glanced at Noalan. S your side C, F it. Noalan thou ahed, then he said. Grand each and a safe job when he knee in the saddle. Kamarinsky picked his nose thoughtfully. You gain to run Carlos's racket, he said to Noalan. Noalan shook his head. V.E. got a racket that's a lot better than that. You leave all that to me. Kamarinsky looked at Shafe. Two grand. Ain't an awful lot, but I'd like to smack that mob if I could get away. With it Shafe said, it three. Noalan shook his head. T. do, he. Said briefly. S. Ample. 125. There was a moment's silence, then the squint-eyed Alex said, That's okay with me. The others hesitated, then agreed. Fenner blew out his checks. Far so good, he thought. We shall want a boat, he said. Of you guys got a motorboat? Kamarinsky said he had. Fenner nodded. S a spot just north of Key Largo called Black Seat Sars. Rock. That's where Carlos keeps his boats. That's where Thaler makes the exchange and takes the chinks for the rest of the ride. I guess we might go out and look that berk over. Scaff and I swung his short legs. Got just the thing for those guys, he said, with a cold grin. Would you like to take a load of bombs with you? Fenner looked vaguely round. The room. He said. Sure, bring bombs. A fixed ice cold look crept into his eyes. Sure. He repeated, S quite an idea. No Ollie. N said uneasily, the cops will make a hell of a row about bombs. Fenner shook his head. The cops won't worry about Carlos. They'll hang out bunting when that guy croaks. Scaff and I got up. Do we go, he said. There was a tight eagerness in his voice. We'll go now. We'll go just as soon as the boat's ready and you boys have collected some artillery. Scaff and I hesitated, then shrugged. I got a date, but I guess she have to wait. This sounds like it's 
gain to be quite a party. Fenner said, S your boat. 2. Kamarinsky. It's in the barber opposite the San Francisco Hotel. Sudi, Osu. Boys meet me in an hour's time on the boa. They all said they'd do. That, and Fenner went out with Noalan. He said gently, as they got into the street, I were you, I'd go along to the cops and get protection. If Carlos thinks you're in this he might get tough with the casino. You keep out of sight until it's over. Tell the cops you want some. Officer over at your place, that you're expecting trouble. Noalan looked uneasy, and said he'd do that, and went off into the darkness. 126. Keeping to the back streets, Fenner headed for the waterfront. He walked fast, his hat pulled well down over his face, and his eyes searching the black shadows as he went along. He had no intention or running into any of Carlos's mob just at present. He knew Carlos must be looking for him. Fenner told himself the next 24 hours ought to be a lot more interesting than the last 24 hours. As he approached the waterfront through Negro Beach he saw ahead of him a car drawn up under a lamp standard, with Parker's on. He looked hard at the car and came on, slowing his pace and not quite knowing why he did. So, somehow, in the almost deserted dark street that car looked too isolated, too obviously loitering. He suddenly ducked in to a doorway. Because he noticed the curtain of the rear window had shifted. There was no wind, and he had an uncomfortable feeling that someone had been watching him come down the street. The sound of an engine starting came to him in the silence, and gears grated, then the car began to move forward slowly. Fenner stood in the doorway until the red tail light disappeared round the bend in the road. He rubbed his chin thoughtfully then stepped out onto the pavement. Again. He didn't go forward, but stood very still, listening faintly he could. Hear the whine of a car, and a cold little smile hit his mouth. The car. Had gone forward only to turn. It was coming back. He ran across the road fast and stepped into another doorway in the dark. Shadows. Squeezing himself against the brickwork, he felt for his gun and jerked it from his shoulder holster. He thumbed back the safety catch and held the gun, with its blunt nose to the star-filled sky. The car swung round the bend. It was gathering speed. Its only lights were its parkers, and as it swept past a blaze of gunfire spurted from the side window, Fenner could hear the patter of bullets thudding against the wall on the opposite side of the road where he had been. Someone was grinding a Thompson, and Fenner couldn't help being thankful that he had crossed the road. He fired three times at the car as it went past him. He heard the crash of the glass as the windshield went, and the car lurched across the road and thudded up the curb, then smashed into a shop window. 11F. Running from his doorway, Fenner went a little way up the street passing the car, and ducked down a dark alley. He went down on one knee, and peered round, watching. Three men darted out of the car. One, he thought, was Riger. They ran. For cover. Fenner got the middle man in his gun sight and squeezed the trigger. The man staggered, tried to keep his balance, then fell on his face in the road. By that time the other two had darted into doorways. They began firing. At the mouth of the alley, one with an automatic and the other with a Thompson. Fenner didn't bother about the man with the automatic, but the Thompson bothered him a lot. The bullets chipped away the brickwork of the wall, and he had to crawl away from the opening as splinters of concrete made things dangerous. Remembering the night on the boat, Fenner crawled further away. He wasn't risking having a bomb tossed at him. Someone called, better duck in here. He saw a door on his left open. 
and a figure standing in the doorway. That door and get under cover. He shouted. Lively. It was a woman who spoke. She said unemotionally. I ring for the cops. Fenner slid over to her. It, sister, he said. Is a private row. You stay indoors, you're likely to get hurt standing there. Just as he finished speaking a blinding flash and a violent explosion came in the mouth of the alley. A sudden rush of wind flung Fenner forward and he and the woman went over with a crash into the narrow passage of the house. Fenner rolled over and kicked the front door shut. He said, These guys ve got bombs. The woman said with a quaver in her voice, This joint won't stand another like that. It'll fall down. Fenner got unsteadily to his feet. Me into a front room, he said quickly. He moved in the darkness where he thought a room ought to be, and stumbled over the woman, who was still sitting on the floor. She wound her arms round his legs and held him. It, she said shortly. Start firing. From my window and they'll throw another bomb at you. Fenner said. Let me out of here, savagely. Faintly the sound of a siren coming fast reached his ears. The woman said, Cops. She let go of Fenner and got to her feet. A. Match. Fenner made a light and she took the spluttering flame from his. Fingers. She went over to a naked gas burner and lit it with a plop. She. Was a short, fat, middle-aged woman with a square chin and determined. Eyes. Fenner said. Guess you did me a good turn. If I'd been outside when that pineapple went off, I should have been sticking to the wall. Now, I guess I better beat it before the cops start having a look. Round. The siren came up with a scream and died away in a flurry as brakes made tires bite into the road. She said, better stay here. It's too late to go out now. Fenner hesitated, checked his watch found. He had still some forty minutes before meeting the mob, and nodded. Somehow, he said, remind me of my best girl. She was always getting me out of a jam. The woman shook her head. A little gleam of humor showed in her eyes. She said, remind me of my old man when he was around your age. He was quick and strong and tough. He was a good man. Fenner made noises. She went on. Down the passage and sit in the kitchen. The cops'll come in a minute. I know the cops around here. I'll fix. Fenner said, and he went into the kitchen and lit the big paraffin lamp. He shut the door and sat in a rocking chair. The room was poor, but it was clean. The mat on the floor was thin and threadbare. There were three religious prints on the wall and two big turtle shells each side of the fireplace. He heard a lot of talking going on, but he didn't bear what was being said. To hear, he would have to open the door, and he thought they might see the light. So he just rocked himself gently and thought about Riger. That mob was tough all right. His head still swam with the force of the explosion. Then he felt inside his coat, took out his wallet and peeled off five ten dollar bills. He got up and put the bills under a plate on the dresser. Somehow, he thought the woman wouldn't like to take money from him, and from the look of the room she needed it. After a few minutes she came in. She nodded to him. They've gone, she said. Fenner got out of the chair. S mighty nice of you. Now I guess I'll run away. She said, a minute, stranger. Was that Carlos's mob? Fenner looked at her thoughtfully. Do you know about that mob, he asked. Her eyes grew hard. If it weren't for those punks, my Tim would be here now. Fenner said, it was them all right. What happened to Tim? 
she stood still, a massive figure of granite solidness. Was a good guy, she said, looking straight at Fenner. He wasn't rich, but he got by. He had a boat and he took parties out in the Gulf fishing. Then this Carlos wanted him to take chinks in the boat. He offered to pay, but Tim wasn't playing. He was like that. He was strong and tough, and he told Carlos no. Carlos couldn't get his own way, so he kills my man. Well, it ain't what happens to the one who gets killed. It's what happens to the one who gets left. Tim died quick, went out like a light. But I don't forget quick. I guess in time I'll go dead inside and I'll find things working out easier than they are now, but right now I'd like to do things to that Carlos. Fenner got to his feet. He said gently. It easy. Carlos will pay for that, all right. It wouldn't get you anywhere if you did kill him. Leave Carlos to me. I got a date with him. The woman said. Nothing. She suddenly stuffed her apron in her mouth and her face. Crumpled. She waved Fenner to the door wildly and as he went out she sank on her knees by the rocking chair. When Fenner got down to the harbor, Shafe was waiting for him outside the San Francisco Hotel. They went in and had two quick drinks and then Fenner followed him down to the waterfront. Shafe said, V e got two Thompsons and a lot of shells, South and Ice. Brought a bag of bombs. God knows if those bombs are are any use. He makes himself. That guy's been itching to throw them. At someone ever since he got the idea. Fenner said, LL get his chance. Tonight. Kamarinsky's boat was of a good size. Alex and Scaff and I were. Smoking, waiting. Fenner stepped aboard as Kamarinsky appeared from the. Engine cockpit. He grinned at Fenner. Everything okay he said. Can. Go when you say so. Fenner said, sure. We've got nothing to wait for. Let her go the other three got on board, and Kamarinsky went below and. Started the engine. The boat began to throb and Shafe shoved her nose. Off from the harbor wall. Fenner said, LL land on the village side and walk over. Maybe we'll have to leave in a hurry. Kamarinsky grunted. Old tub. Ain't too fast, he said, nosing the boat carefully through the lights. Towards he opened gulf. Scaff and I came up and climbed into the cockpit. He greasy skin shone in. The dim light. Got the bombs, he said. I am sure gain to get a. Kick when they go bang. Fenner took off his hat and scratched his head. Other guys ve got bombs, too, he said. They threw one at me about an hour ago. Scaff and I's jaw dropped. It go off, he asked. Fenner looked at him and nodded. It wrecked a house. I'm hoping. You've made a good job with your homemade bangs. We might need them. Scaff and I said, and went away to have another look at his bag. It didn't take much longer than fifteen minutes before Fenner spotted. Distant lights. He pointed them out to Kamarinsky, who nodded and said, Caesar. Fenner stretched and climbed out of the cockpit. He walked over to the other three who were sitting on the foredeck, watching the lights. S get this right, he said. We've come here to put Carlos's boats out of action. We've got to do this quick and with the least trouble. Scaff and I, you carry the bombs. Shafe and me will have the Thompsons, and Alex will cover us with his rod. Kamarinsky will stay with the boat. Okay. They grunted. As the boat ran into the small natural harbor, Shafe unslung the two Thompsons and passed one to Fenner. Scaff and I came up from the paven, a black bag in his hand. Don't you guys crowd me, he said. Pineapples are touchy things. They all laughed. Alex said, Guy'll put a slug in that bag, sure thing. 
It'll save you a burial, anyway. The boat swept in a half circle, and came up to the side of the harbor wall as Kamarinsky reached forward and cut the switch. The engine died with a little flurry. Shafe, standing in the stern, jumped onto the wall and Alex tossed him the bullen. He held the boat steady until the others landed. Kamarinsky handed up the bag of bombs tenderly to Scaffini. Fenner said, Out. Soon as you hear the bombs, get the engine started. We might have to leave in a hurry. Kamarinsky said sure, that'll be. Okay. Watch yourselves, you guys. They moved towards the village. They. Road leading from the harbor was rough and narrow. Big stones lay. About, and once Scaff and I tripped. The others swore at him uneasily. Careful, you punk, Alex said, how you walk Scaff and I said, M. Watch and okay. The way you're gain on, you'd think these pills were. Dangerous. Maybe they won't go off at all. Fenner said, we'll take the. Back streets. Two of you go first, and Scaff and I and I'll follow you. We don't want to attract attention. It was a hot night with a bright moon. Both Fenner and Shafe carried the Thompsons wrapped in a piece of sacking. They skirted the village and crossed the island through a series of small squares and dark alleys. The few fishermen they did meet glanced at them curiously, but could make out nothing except shadowy outlines. After a steep climb they suddenly came to the sea again, sparkling. Several hundred feet below them. Fenner said, guess this is it. Down the steep incline they could see. A large wooden cabin, a long concrete jetty, and six big motorboats. Moored, to moorings set in the reinforced wall. Two lights gleamed. Through two windows of the cabin, and the door stood half open, sending a strip of light on the oily water. They stood silently looking down. Fenner said. The bomb's out. Each of you take a couple. Scaff and I has the rest. We'll attack the cabin first. When it looks safe enough tackle the boats. They're all to be sunk. Scaff and I opened the bag and took out two bombs. He handed them to Fenner. The bombs were made of short sections of two-inch pipe. Fenner stood waiting until Scaff and I had given each man a couple of the stuffed pipes, then he said, Shafe and I will look after the cabin. You, Scaff and I, get down to the boats. Alex, stay here. And come down if we get into trouble. Scaff and I opened his shirt and piled bombs inside. You have a fall now and you'll certainly be in a mess, Fenner said. With a little grin. Scaff and I nodded. He said, makes me nervous to breathe. Fenner. Held the two bombs in his loft band and the Thompson in his right. He said, S go. Moving slowly, Shafe and Fenner began to slide down. The incline. Fenner said, go to the right and I'll take the left. I. Don't want any shootin' unless it's necessary. Shafe's thin face. Sneered. LL be necessary all right, he said. Halfway down they both paused. A man had come out of the cabin and he. Walked along the wall. Fenner said, complicates things. The man stood on the wall, looking. Out to sea. Fenner began sliding down again. Where you are for a bit. He said softly to Shafe. Might bear two of us. Down Fenner went. Silently. The man stood, his back turned, motionless. Fenner reached the waterfront and stood up. He put the two bombs inside. His shirt. He was so conscious of the man that he didn't shrink at the. Coldness of the metal against his skin. Holding the Thompson at the. Ready, he walked softly down the wall. When he was thirty feet from the man, his foot touched a small stone which rolled into the water, making a loud splash. Fenner froze. 
standing quite still, his finger curled round the trigger. The man glanced over his shoulder, saw Fenner and jerked round. Fenner said, the pose, jerking up the Thompson. In the moonlight Fenner could see that the man was a Cuban. He could see the whites of his eyes as they bolted out of his head. The Cuban shivered a little with shock, then he dropped on his knees, his hand going inside his coat. Fenner swore at him softly and squeezed on the trigger. He gave him a very short burst from the gun. The Cuban fell back, his hands clutching at his chest, then he rolled over into the water. Fenner moved fast. Two big drums of petrol stood close by and he ducked behind the M. He got there a split second before a machine gun opened up from the cabin. He heard the slugs rattle on the drum, and a strong smell of petrol told him the drum was pierced. The machine gun kept grinding and there was such a hail of bullets that Fenner had to lie flat, his face pressed into the sand, expecting any second to feel the rippling slugs tear into his body. He put his hand in his pocket and took out the two bombs. He balanced one of them in his hand, then tossed it over the drum in the direction of the cabin. He heard it strike something and then drop to the ground. He thought, much for Scaffini's homebrew. The machine gun had stopped, and the silence that followed its vicious clatter was almost painful. He edged his way to the side of the drum and peered round. Cautiously. The lights of the cabin had been put out and the door had been shut. He groped for the other bomb, found it, and threw it at the door. Even as his hand came up the machine gun spluttered into life, and he ducked back. Just in time. The bomb hit the door and a sheet of F.L. Arnie lit up the darkness. Followed by a deafening noise. Brick splinters and wood whizzed. Overhead and the force of the concussion made Fenner's head reel. He revised his opinion of C. Fenner's bombs after that. The machine gun stopped. Again looking round the drum, Fenner saw that the door had been ripped so that it hung from one hinge. The woodwork and paint was smoke blackened and splintered. Even as he looked, two more violent explosions occurred from the back of the cabin. He guessed Shafe was doing his stuff. Resting the Thompson on the top of the drum, he fired a long burst into the cabin and ducked down again. Someone replied from the wrecked cabin with a straggly burst from the machine gun and then Fenner gave him half the drum. After that there was a long lull. Glancing up, Fenner could just make out Scaffini crawling down the slope, clutching his chest with one hand. He looked very much exposed as he moved on down, but Fenner could imagine his triumphant grin. He must have been spotted coming down, because someone started firing at him with an automatic rifle. Scaffini didn't lose his head. He put his hand inside his shirt, pulled out a bomb, and heaved it at the cabin. Fenner followed the bomblin flight, then flattened himself in the sand. He had a horrible feeling that the bomb would fall on his head. The bomb struck the cabin and exploded with a tearing, ripping noise. A long flash lit up the sky and then the roof of the cabin caught on fire. Scaff and I came down fast without drawing any more shooting. Bent double. He ran past the cabin and joined Fenner behind the drum. Geez I he said excitedly. Work. What a night. I would not have missed this for all the Jones in the world. Fenner said. Out. They'll be coming out. Scaff and I said, give em just one more. Just one more to make up their mind for them. Fenner said, enjoy. Yourself. Scaff and I slung the bomb into the open doorway. The explosion. That followed was so violent that although they were crouching down. Behind the drum they both suffered a little from the concussion. A moment later someone screamed, I'm done. I'm coming out. Don't do any. 
more, don't do any more. Fenner didn't move. On out, with your mitts. Hi. A man came staggering out of the blazing cabin. His face and hands were cut with flying glass, and his clothes were almost all torn. Off. He stood swaying in the flickering light of the flames, and Fenner saw that it was Miller. He came out from behind the drum, his lips just off his teeth. Shafe came running up, his thin face alight with excitement. Any more of them? he asked. Miller said. Others are dead, don't touch me. Mr. 135. Fenner reached out and grabbed him by his tattered shirt. I thought I settled your little hash a while back, he said. Unpleasantly. Miller gave at the knees when he recognized Fenner. Don't start on me, he blubbered. Fenner cuffed him with his free hand. Elsa's in there, he said come. On, canary, sing. Miller stood trembling and shuddering. There ain't. Any more he whined. Re all dead. Alex came running up. Fenner said to. Him, care of this guy. Treat him nicely. He's had a nasty shock. Alex. Said, swung his fist and knocked Miller down, then he booted him. Hard. Fenner said. Don't get too tough. I want to talk with that punk. Alex said, S all right. I'll have him in the right frame of mind. He went on booting Miller. Fenner left them and went down the wall towards the boats. Scaff and I was waiting for orders. Fenner said, Keep one. We'll go round the island and pick. Camarin Slosi up. It'll save Walken. He went back to Miller, who had dragged himself off the ground and was imploring Alex to let him alone. Fenner told Alex to go and help Scaffani. Fenner said to Miller, told your little louse what would happen. This is only the start of it. S. Thaler, he repeated. You punk. Or I'll spread your insides. Miller said, don't come here. Honest, I. Don't know where he is. Fenner showed his teeth. LLC about that. He said. Scaff and I came running up. Refill in, he said. I toss in a few. Bombs to make sure. Fenner said, not. A few minutes later the. Shattering roar of the bombs exploding filled the silent harbor, and. Clouds of tense black smoke drifted from the boats. Fenner said to Miller, On, punk, you're going for a ride. He had to shove Miller in front of him at the end of the Thompson. Miller was so terrified that he could hardly walk. He kept on mumbling. T give it to me. I want to live, mister, I want to live. The others were already in the boat waiting for them. When they got on board, Shafe started the engine. Gee, he said. Is the grandest night's work I've ever, done. I never. Thought we'd get away with it. Fenner groped for a cigarette and lit. It. Fun will start as soon as Carlos hears about it, he remarked. Said shock tactics would succeed, and they have. Now Carlos knows what. He's up against, the rest isn't going to be so easy. They ran the boat round the island and signaled to Kamarinsky, who started up his boat and joined them outside the harbor. They all got into Kamarinsky's boat, Alex dragging Miller along with him. Scaff and I was the last to leave in before he did so, he opened the cocks and scuttled the boat. As he climbed on board Kamarinsky's boat he said, guess it's tough. Sink in these boats. I could have done with one of them myself. Fenner. Said, thought of that, but Carlos still has a fair size gang, and he'd. Have got them back. This is the only way. As Kamarinsky headed the boat out to sea he wanted to know what had. Happened. Heard the uproar, he said excitedly. 
certainly got the village steamed up. They guessed what was gain on, and no one had the guts to go and watch the fun. Fenner said to Alex, bring the punk into the cabin. I want to talk to him. Alex said, and brought Miller down into the small brightly lit cabin. Na with bloodshot Miller stood, shivering, staring at Fen. Eyes. Your chance, Canary. You talk and. Fenner said, S you'll survive. Where can I find Thaler? Miller shook. His head. Don't know, he mumbled. Swear I don't know. Fenner. Looked at Alex. Don't know, he said. Alex swung his fist hard into Miller's face. There was the faint sound. Of his arm in flight, then a thud as his fist crushed Miller's face. Fenner repeated coldly, S. Thaler. Miller sobbed, and mumbled. Something. Fenner said, leave him to me. He reached inside his coat. And. R. Pulled out his gun. He walked over to Miller and bent over him. Get. Up, he said harshly. Am not making a mess inside here. Come on up on. Deck. Miller looked into the gun barrel, his eyes bulging, then he said. In a low, even voice, exhausted with terror, S over at the Leadler. Dame's joint. Fenner remained squatting. He was very still. Did he? Know about it, he said at last. Miller leaned his head against the wall. Blood continued to drip from. His nose and eyes never left the gun. Phoned him, he whispered. Bugsy. Yet. Fenner drew a deep breath. Do you know this? With. Miller, fear had worn itself out, leaving him with the calmness of. Death. He said as if he was very tired, was just gain over when you. Arrived. Thaler me. He said Bugsy had got him on the and told him. Where the Leadler dame was hiding. Thaler said for me to come, and he. Was getting Nightingale, too, Fenner straightened and ran to the cabin. Door. He shouted to Kamarinsky, push your tub. We've got to get back. Fast. Kamarinsky said, can't do any more. She'll bust. Bust her. Fenner said. Want more speed? When the boat slid into Key West. Harbor Fenner said, Alex, you take this Miller to Noalan. Tell him to. Hide him until I give the word, then I'll hand high and over to the cops. Alex said, Hell. Suppose we bump him and shove him into the drink. Fenner's eyes snapped. What I say? Shafe was already making the boat fast. They all crow, let off the boat. Then Fenner saw the sedan. Parked in the shadow. He yelled, down, look out, and flung himself. Flat. Out of the wide window of the car came gunfire. Fenner had his gun out. And fired three times. The others had fallen flat except Miller who was. Apparently too dazed to do anything. A stream of bullets from the sedan. Cut across his chest and he crumpled up soundlessly. Scaff and I suddenly got to his feet, ran a little way towards the car and. Tossed his last bomb. Even as the bomb left his hand he clawed at his. Throat and went over solidly. The bomb, falling short, exploded. Violently and rocked the car over on its side. Fenner scrambled to his feet, yelling like a madman and rushed across. The street, filing from his hip. Three men crawled out of the car. One. Of them tumbled with a Thompson. They all seemed dazed with the. Concussion. Fenner fired at the man with the Thompson, who pitched. Forward on his face. Shafe came blundering up, charged one of the. Remaining men and went over with him, hammering at his head with his gun butt. The remaining man twisted aside and fired point-blank at Fenner, who hardly noticed the streak of blood that appeared suddenly in the middle of his right cheek. 
he kicked the man's legs from under him, stamped on his wrist so that his gun fell for Rhea his hand, and then leaned over him, clubbing him senseless with his gun butt. As he straightened up, another car came round the corner and charged down. Out of it, gunfire. Fenner thought, is the bunk. He zigzagged behind the Verdon 7 sedan. Bullets chipped the street at his feet. Shafe, trying to get under cover, gave a croaking yell and began to walk in circles. More gunfire from the car, and down he went. From behind the sedan Fenner fired four shots at the other car, then he glanced round to see who was left. Alex and Kamarinsky had got back to the boat. Even as he looked, Kamarinsky opened up with the Thompson. They night was suddenly alive with gun flashes and noise. Fenner thought that it was time he got moving. Alex and Kamarinsky in. Their position could take care of any number of hoods. He wanted to get to the bungalow. He waited his opportunity, then, keeping the overturned car between him and the line of fire, he backed away quickly and ducked down the nearest alley. In the distance he could hear the sound of police whistles, and he dodged down another alley away from the approaching sound. He was too busy to risk getting hauled in by the cops. A taxi crawled past the alleyway as he emerged into the main street. Running forward, Fenner signaled the driver, who crowded on brakes. Fenner jerked open the door, giving the driver the bungalow address. It fast, buddy, he said. Mean fast. The driver engaged his gears and. The taxi shot away what's breaking around here, he asked, keeping his. I, on the road. Like a battle going on. Fenner said, leaning. Back, s the right word. The driver leaned his head out of the cab and. Spat out. I'm glad I'm going the other way. It sounds kind of dangerous around. Here. Fenner didn't let the driver take him right to, the bungalow. He. Got him to stop at the corner of the road, then he ran fast down towards. The bungalow. Lights were showing in the front rooms, and as he walked. Up the short circular drive he saw someone come away from the front. Door. He put his hand inside his coat and loosened his gun from its shoulder holster. A boy with a peaked cap paused at the sound of Fenner's approach, and then came towards him. He was a messenger. He said, ain't Mr. D. Fenner. Fenner said, got a telegram for me. The boy gave him an envelope and his book. While Fenner scratched his initials, the boy said, Ring in for quite a while. The lights are on. But no one's at home. Fenner gave him a quarter. S how we fool. Burglar's son, he said, and went on up to the house. He shoved the cable. Into his pocket and tried the front door, opened it, and stepped inside. In the front sitting room Bugsy lay on the carpet, a small pool of. Blackish blood making a circle round his head. I.E.S. Gooseberry eyes were half shut and stared sightlessly at Fenner. His mouth puckered, showing his yellow teeth in a frightened, whimpering snarl. Fenner stood looking. He could do nothing. Bugsy was dead all right. Fenner pulled his gun out and walked slowly into the hall. He stood listening, then he went into the bedroom. Thaler sat in the small tub chair a look of startled surprise on his face. A little congealed blood traced its way from his mouth to his shirt front. His eyes were at blank and fixed. Fenner said aloud, well, and then he looked round the room. It was easy to see what had happened. Thaler had been sitting facing the door. Possibly he'd been talking to Glory. Then someone Thaler knew walked in. Thaler must have looked up, seen who it was, not taken fright, and then that someone had shot him through his chest. Fenner went over to him and touched his hand. It was growing cold, but 
there was still a little warmth in it. A chair grated as if someone had eased it back. The sound came from the kitchen. Fenner stood very still, listening. The chair grated again. Fenner stepped to the door and peered out. Then, moving very silently, he entered the kitchen, holding his gun forward. Nightingale stood holding on to the back of a kitchen chair. He held a blunt nose automatic in his hand, but when he recognized Fenner his hand dropped limply to his side. Fenner said. There was something about the way Nightingale was holding himself that made him ask the question. I got all in my belly, Nightingale said slowly. He began to work his way round the chair, and when Fenner came over to help him he said a little feverishly, T touch me. Fenner stood back and watched him maneuver himself down into the chair. When he finally sat, sweat ran down his face. Fenner said, it easy. I'll get a croaker. Nightingale shook his head. Got to talk, B said hurriedly. Croaker can give me a new belly. He bent forward slowly, pressing his forearms against his lower body. What happened? Shot Thaler, and that rat Bugsy got me. I thought I could trust him. He put five slugs into me before I could shoot him. Then I fixed B.I.I. and all right. Fenner said, why kill Thaler? Nightingale stared dully at the floor. When B spoke again his voice was very thick. Killed Curly. That settled it. I wanted to get Carlos, too, but I guess I shall tea now. Killed her. Because you and she got me out of the fix. But Thaler always wanted her out of the way. She knew too much. She and me, we knew too much. We knew F about you. Glory was at the bottom of everything. She and her Chinaman Chinaman Fenner asked softly. Chong The guy they planted in your office knew about that. Nightingale shut his eyes. He pressed his arms against his belly much harder. It was only by doing that, and by bending well forward, that he kept himself from falling apart. He said at last, in a faint, strangled voice, I can you about it. Carlos found out about the chink. Glory is cheating with him. When T.W. Haler took her to New York for a trip, Chong went along, too. That chink did jobs for Carlos. Carlos thought he was full of jig around with glory, so he sent a couple of guys to watch. They found out and they killed him. It was Thaler who had him moved to your office. Fenner stood very still, thinking. Why to me, for God's sake? Nightingale shook his head. Don't know. He'd got some deep game. He spoke slower taking more pains to utter each word clearly. Something phony happened on that New York trip. Something that started all this. Was Glory fond of him? Fenner thought he was seeing an end to this. Business. Nightingale shivered a little, but he wouldn't give up. Pain was eating. Into him and he was dying fast, but he pretend that he wasn't. Suffering. He wanted to show Fenner that he could take anything that was handed out without a squawk. Nightingale said, was crazy about him. He began to sway a little in the chair. Where is she now? Took it on the lamb when the shooting started. Un. Way, Thaler would have given her the heat if I hadn't broken in. I wish. Now, that. I dve waited, before I shot him. Fenner was too late to catch him. He rolled off the chair onto the floor. Fenner knelt down and lifted his head. Crotty's a good guy, Nightingale said faintly. Tell him I stood by you. That'll make things, even. He peered up at Fenner through his thick lenses, tried to say something and couldn't quite make it. Fenner said, 
LL tell him. You've been a good guy to me. Nightingale. Whispered, after. Carlos. He's got. A dive, back of Enski Joe's. He grinned at Fenner, then his face tightened and he died. Fenner laid his head gently on the floor and stood up. He wiped his hands with his handkerchief, staring blankly at the opposite wall. Just Carlos now, he told himself, then maybe he'd get through with this business. As he put his found the telegram, he pulled it out handkerchief away he of his pocket and ripped the envelope. It ran, dead woman you thought Marion proved by fingerprints to be kidnapped daughter of Andrew Lindsay. Suggest Mariah's not all she seems. Paula. Fenner crumpled the cable slowly in hand. That's that, he said. I guess I can finish this. He took one more 170AK at Nightingale, then walked softly out of the bungalow. Where was Glory? Now Thaler was dead she was footloose again. Fenner thought he might find her with Noalan. She might of course, have gone anywhere, but no Allen was worth trying. When a dame sees three men shot to death, and misses the same death by such a close at margin, she's not likely to make smart plans. She had the skids under her, and she'd go to the one person left whom she knew well. She ought to know no Allen all right, Fenner argued. He was her husband. Wasn't he? He got back on the main street, hired himself a taxi, and went over to the casino. Two patrolmen stood near the entrance, and they both gave him a hard look as he ran up P.S. Fenner grinned as he saw this evidence of New Orleans. The S.T. hall that was just closing. Caution! He went through the big down. Only one light burned, and apart. From two Cubans in shirt sleeves, covering the tables with dust sheets. The hall was empty. They glanced up when Fenner came in. No Allen in still. Fenner asked, heading for the office. He's busy right now, one of the Cubans said, trying to intercept him. Fenner beat him to the door, pushed it open. And went in. 143. No Allen, Kamarinsky and Alex sat around the desk. A black unlabeled bottle and glasses stood before them, and they all were smoking. They all looked up, their faces startled, then, seeing Fenner, they relaxed. No Allen scowled at him. Do you call this, he said bitterly. And Scaff and I dead, and these two guys nearly shot to hell. This your idea of smashing Carlos. Fenner wasn't in the mood to play. Around with Noalan. He put his hands flat on the desk and looked Noalan in the face. Pipe. Down, you jerk. What ve you got to bellyache about? Shafe and Scaff and I. Dead? So what? Think you can fight a war without any casualties? What? About the other side? We've wiped out all their boats. We've burnt their base. Thaler's dead, Nightingale's dead, Miller's dead, Bugsy's dead. And six or seven others of the mob. Ain't that giving value for money? Noalan sat staring at him. Thaler. His voice hardly reached above a whisper. Fenner nodded. Leaves Carlos and Riger. I particularly want those two. Guys myself. Then the gang's washed. Up. Seven. Kamarinsky said, Guy knows what he's talking about. I'll play along with him still. Alex nodded and grunted. Fenner said. What are we waiting for? Where's Whiskey Joe's? S.A. Joint near Nigger Beach. Fenner turned to Noalan. I'm gain after. Carlos. When I get back I've got something to say to you. Stick around. This is the finish of this business. He turned to the other two, a couple of Thompsons. We're gained to Whiskey Joe's. Carlos is over there. 
Alex went away. Kamarinsky said, We three. He sounded a little uneasy. Fenner shook his head. I'm going. You two come in later and clear up the mess. Fenner went out with Kamarinsky. Alex was waiting in the car. Nursing two Thompsons. As Kamarinsky drove off, Fenner said, To take the guns. You wait outside until you hear shooting, then come in and blast everything you see. Don't stop shooting until there's nothing to shoot at get it. Alex said, has been a swell night. The big car went down Duval Street fast. Duval Street stretched across the whole length of the island. It was late, and they met no cars. Kamarinsky drove very fast. He cut speed as he reached South Street and swung the car to the right. At the bottom of South Street he drew to the curb and killed the engine. Whiskey's over on the corner at Nigger Beach. Fenner got out of the car and began walking down the street. The other two followed him, holding the Thompsons under their coats. Fenner said, S got a place at the back. Would you know it? Alex said. S a warehouse round the back, maybe that's it. We'll go and look at it. it. Whiskey Joe's bar had closed for the night. It was just a small pile of black woodwork in the darkness. Alex said. Down this alley, softly. Fenner said, around while I have a look. I'll be back. He went down. The alley, which was very dark and smelt of decay and dark alley smells. He walked carefully, not sneaking, but making no noise. At the end of the alley was a small square. Turning right and coming up behind Enuski. Joe's, he could make out a big square building with a flat roof. That, too, was a black silhouette against the star-filled sky. He got closer. Found a door, tried it cautiously. It was locked. He moved along looking for a window, turned the corner, and worked his way along the south side. Still no windows. Round the next corner an iron ladder set close to the wall led upwards into the darkness. Fenner guessed it would take him on to the roof. He went back fast and noiselessly to the other two waiting at the mouth of the alley. Think I've found the dump, he said. S only one door. All you two V got to do is to lie out there and start with the meat grinkler soon as they come out. Don't show yourselves, just lie flat and grind away. He could see Kamarinsky's teeth as he grinned. LL go up on the roof and send out to you. Don't make mistakes and when you've done the job, beat it. I'll look after myself. The two grunted to show they understood and then Fenner retraced his steps to the building. He climbed up the iron ladder, testing each rung before he put his weight on it. He counted forty rungs before he reached the top. As his head came over the balustrade he saw in the center of the roof a square skylight, through which a light was shining. Fenner knew that he'd have to be mighty careful how he crossed over. They Slightest sound he made would be heard by anyone underneath. Before getting onto the roof he walked along the balustrade and looked. Over. He spotted Alex and Kamarinsky hiding in a long ditch that was. Exactly opposite the door of the warehouse. They saw him and waved. He. Raised his hand, and then lowered himself from the balustrade to the. Roof. Holding his gun in his right hand he inched his way across the space. That divided him from the skylight. It took him quite a time, but he did. It without a sound. Pushing his hat to the back of his head he looked. Down into the room. Carlos was there. Riger was there, and another man. He didn't know. They were within six feet of Fenner. The room was very. Low, like a loft and Fenner was so startled that he hurriedly jerked. Back. Carlos was smoking on the bed. Riger lolled, his head against the wall. 
In a chair, he was asleep. The other man dozed on the floor. Fenner looked at the cross pieces between the panes of the skylight, he felt their thickness gently with his thumb. There was no substance in them. Then he straightened and, reaching out. With his right foot, he placed it gently in the exact center of the cross pieces. He took a deep breath and pushed down with all his weight. The cross pieces gave with a splintering noise and he and the glass crashed down into the room. He landed on his feet, staggered, and jerked up his gun. Carlos lay very still on the bed, his cigarette jerking up and down in his mouth. The man on the floor went for his gun unconsciously. He was so dazed that his instinct took him to death. If he hadn't been dozing, nothing on this earth would have made him go for the gun. Fenner shot him between the eyes. Riger and Carlos were like frozen statues. They just stared at Fenner. With fixed glassy eyes. Fenner said, Want you, to Carlos. The ash from Carlos's cigarette fell onto his chest. He looked wildly. At Riger and then back to Fenner. A break, he said hoarsely. Fenner said, Up. I've been laying for you too. Now you're going to get. What's coming to you? I'm not going to do it. You two guys can do it too. Yourselves. You can fight it out. The one who wins goes out of this. Joint. I won't touch him. Maybe you've heard I keep my word. Either. That, or I'll knock the two of you off. K. Riger relaxed suddenly. He. Said, kill him and you don't touch me. He sounded incredulous. Carlos crouched further against the wall. He screamed. Don't do it. I'm your boss, do you hear? You're not to do it. Riger got slowly out. Of his chair, he had a fixed grin on his face. Fenner said. Put your mitts up and face the wall. Riger scowled at him, but Fenner rammed his gun hard into his side. He put his hands up. And turned round. Fenner took a gun out of his hip pocket and stepped. Back. There and don't move. He went over to Carlos, grabbed him by. His shirt front, and dragged him off the bed. A quick frisk told him. Carlos hadn't a gun. Fenner walked to the corner of the room near the door and leaned against. The wall. At you waiting for. Don't one of you want to go home? Carlos began to scream at Riger, but the look on Riger's face told him. He'd have to fight. Riger, his hands held low, a set animal expression. On his face, began to stalk after Carlos, who circled the room swearing. In a soft continuous flow. The room was too small to keep that up long. Riger suddenly rushed in blindly, grabbing Carlos round the waist. Carlos screamed with terror, beat Riger about his head with his clenched fists, and tried to get away. Riger began to hit Carlos in the ribs, driving in punches that sounded hollow. They swayed round the room, punching and mauling each other, then Carlos's heel caught in the mat and he went over with Riger on top of him. Riger hammered his head on the boards. He turned his head and grinned at Fenner. I've got the louse now, he panted. V.E. got him now. Carlos reached up with his hands and drove two hooked fingers into Riger's eyes. A horrible sound issued from Riger's chest and burst from his mouth in a sobbing croak. He fell away from Carlos, holding one hand to his eyes and beating the air with the other, he began to blunder round the room. Carlos crawled to his feet, shook his head, and waited for Riger to go past him again. As he did so, he shot out a foot and brought Riger down. Riger fell on his face and lay there, moaning and kicking with his feet. Carlos had forgotten that Fenner was in the room, he saw Ordi Riger. Dropping on Riger's back, he pinned him with his knees and fastened his red fingers round Riger's throat. Riger gurgled, 
groped feebly for Carlos's hands and then went limp. Carlos threw him away and stood up. Trembling. Fenner leaned against the wall, covering Carlos with his gun. You're lucky, he said. It before a I change my mind. Go on, dust, you. Carlos took two staggering steps to the door and flung it open. Fenner heard him blundering downstairs and he heard him fumbling at the lock. He stood, his head on one side, listening. Then out of the night came a sound of two Thompsons firing. Both gave a long burst, then there was silence. Fenner put his gun away slowly and groped for a cigarette. I guess I've had about enough of this burg. I'll go home and take Paula. Out for a change, he said to himself. He climbed out of the skylight. And let himself down the iron ladder. As he did so he heard the sound of. A car starting. It was Alex and Kamarinsky calling it a day. He went round and looked at Carlos. He had a tidy mind. He had had no doubt that those two would do a good job, but he liked to. Be sure. He need not have bothered. They'd done a good job. He brushed down his clothes with his hand, thinking busily, then he turned and walked back towards Noalan's place. Noalan started out of his chair when Fenner came in. He said, What? Happened? Fenner looked at At. Do you think? They're horse flesh. Both of them. Where's Glory? Noalan wiped his face with his handkerchief. Both of them. He couldn't believe it. Fenner repeated impatiently, S. Glory. Noalan put two trembling hands on the desk. Is she, damn you? Fenner's eyes were intent and ice cold. Noalan pointed. S. Upstairs. You can leave her out of this, Fenner. I'm going to look after her now. Fenner sneered. S. The idea. You're not falling for any line of repentance she's likely to hand out, are you? Noalan's face aren't a faint red. Don't want any cheap cracks. From you, he said. All, she's my wife. Fenner pushed back his chair. God's sake, he said, getting to his feet, there's no fool like an old fool. Okay, if that's the way it stands. He shrugged. A dame. This glory. Off with the dead money bags and on with the new Noalan sat. There his hooded eyes fixed, and his mouth a little twisted. He said. Cut out your cracks, Fenner, I don't like them. Fenner turned to the door. Am going to see that dame, he said. Shall I find her? Noalan shook his head. Ain't, he said, something here and you'll get a heap of grief. So. Okay, then I don't see her, but I'll tell you what. I'll do. I'll be back in an hour's time with the cops and a warrant for her arrest. Noalan sneered. Got nothing on that dame, he said. Sure, I haven't. Only a murder rap. Still, what's a murder rap? Small change in your circle. Noalan's fat hands twitched, and his puffy face took on a greenish tinge. Are you talking about, he said, with stiff lips. Fenner moved to the door. You'll know. I haven't time to play around with you. I either see her now, or see her in jail. I don't give a damn which way it is. Noalan's face glistened in the light of the desk lamp, he said, door on the right upstairs. Fenner said, won't belong, and you stay right where you are. He went out and shut the door behind him. When he got to the door on the right at the head of the stairs, he turned the handle and walked in. Glory started up from a chair, her face white, and her mouth making a big zero in her face. Fenner shut the door and leaned against it. Your stocking's up, he said slowly. 
and me are just going to have a little talk, that's all. She dropped back in the chair. Now, she said, her voice tight. S. Late, I want to go to sleep. I'm tired I told him downstairs not to. Let anyone up. Fenner selected a chair opposite her and sat down. He pushed his hat to the back of his head and dug in his vest pocket for a packet of cigarettes. He shook two loose and offered them. She said, out of here. Get out of here. I don't want Fenner took one of the cigarettes and put the packet back in his pocket. He set up. Then he lit the cigarette and blew a thin cloud of smoke up to the ceiling. And me are going to have a little talk. I'm talking first. Then you are at she got out of the chair and started for the door, but... Fenner reached out, caught her wrist, and pulled her round. She swung blindly for his face with hooked fingernails. He caught her hand, imprisoned her two wrists in one hand and smacked her face with his other hand. Four red bars appeared on the side of her face, and she said. He let go of her hands and pushed her away roughly. Down and shut up. She sat down, her hand touching her cheek gently. She said. Re going to be sorry for that. Fenner eased himself in the chair so that it creaked. That's what you think, he said. Me tell you another little story. It'll slaughter you. She clenched her fists and pounded them on her knees. Stop. I know what you're going to say. I don't want to hear. Fenner said, you there has never been anyone but Chong. When Carlos killed him, your life stopped. Nothing mattered to you. All you had to live for was to get even with Carlos for taking away the one thing that made your horrible life worthwhile. That's right, isn't it? She put her hands over her face and shivered, then she said, yes. And you went to New York for a short trip. You couldn't even be parted from Chong for a few days, so he came up and you saw him, when Thaler was busy elsewhere. Carlos sent two of his Cubans and they found Chong and killed him. That's right, too, isn't it? Came in the night when I was with him. She said. Her voice was expressionless. Of them held me while the other cut his. Throat. I was there when they did it. They said they'd kill me if he. Resisted, so he just lay on the bed and let that awful Cuban cut his. Throat. Somehow. B managed to smile at me when he was doing it. Oh, if you could have been there. If you could have seen him lying there with the Cuban bending over him. The sudden look of terror and pain in his eyes as he died. I could do nothing, but I swore that I'd get Carlos, I would smash everything he had built up. Fenner yawned again. I.L.E. was feeling tired. Re not very nice, he said. Can't feel any pity for you, because you always thought of yourself first. If you were really fine you would have had your revenge, even if it brought you down, too. But you hadn't the guts to lose what you already had, so you had to plot. And plan to keep Thaler and get Carlos thrown to the wolves. Glory. Began to cry. Fenner went on this was going on. Thaler had found himself a new toy. Thaler was a nasty bit of work, too. There was a girl called Lindsay. Maybe he met her at a party. He liked her and somehow he got her to go to his house. He knew you weren't about and he persuaded her to drop in. I can guess what happened. He tried to make her, but she fought him. That's how she got bruised, hey. Glory went on crying. He overdid it, didn't he? She died. When you got home, after Chong had been killed, you found Thaler running in circles with a corpse on his hands. That's the way it went, isn't it? Dot. She put her 
handkerchief to her eyes and began to rock herself backwards and forwards. You found the Lindsay dame dead, and her body badly bruised. Now, baby. It's your turn. Shoot. What did you do? Glory said, know all about. It. Why ask me? Why did you come to me? Heard about you. I thought. I saw my chance of saving Harry and starting trouble for Carlos. I heard. You were tough and wouldn't stop at anything. I got a black wig, and wore simple clothes and came to you. I thought if came to me as Marion Daly. You said your sister was missing. You thought if I took up the case I'd start eventually on Carlos. You gave me the hint. You said. Twelve chi, no men, because at they always ship Chinamen over in dozens. From Cuba, and I'd be smart enough to see that that was Carlos's racket. You planned with Thaler to have the Lindsay Dame's body, without arms. Or legs or head, planted somewhere where I could find it, and I'd think. That it was the body of Marion Daly. Since Marion never existed. Thaler couldn't be tried for killing a non-existent person. So you tried to establish an identity between Marion and the body. To do this you got Thaler to fake up marks on your back, and when you came to see me he telephoned to give you an excuse for undressing. I saw the marks, and naturally enough they impressed me. It was a rotten plan. And it could never have held water in a court of law, but you might have confused the issue if you'd played your cards right. But Thaler made mistakes. He wanted to get the body cut up and taken away from his house. He wanted to get your identity established with me as quickly as possible. Otherwise the fact that the body, when found, could have proved that it couldn't have been yours from a doctor's evidence of time of death. First, you had to see me, then I was to be held up for a day or so, to give him time to set the stage the way he wanted. To hold me up, he planted Chong on me. You didn't know this. He got his Cubans to take Chong along and put him in my office, hoping that the cops would come up and hold me for questioning. I beat him to it, found out where the Cubans came from, got there, killed them before they could get rid of one of the hands and arms of the Lindsay Dame. By slipping up like that, he made a complete mess of things. That's the way it went, isn't it? Glory sat limply in the chair. She said, yes, that's right. It was a mad idea, but Harry was so scared he'd have done anything I told him to. I hadn't much time to make plans, but I thought it was an opportunity to get Carlos. I shook Harry down for ten grand. I gave you six, because I knew then that you'd follow up the case. I forged the letter giving you the necessary clues and then, when your secretary took me to the hotel, I waited my opportunity and ran away. That was the end of Marion Daly. I went back to Key West with Harry and waited for you to come. Thaler had told the Cubans to leave the body and the clothes at the Grand Central in a trunk. We were going to give you a tip so that you could have found them. I left that to Harry, but he messed it. Fenner lay back in his chair and stared at his ceiling. Was cockeyed, he said. UDVE come to see me and told me about Carlos. I'd have gone for him just the same. A guy who handles people the way he did deserves all he gets. Glory. Sat up very straight. Talk as if he's dead, she said. Fenner looked at her. S dead all right. You're lucky. Seems like you've always managed to find a sucker to do your dirty work. Anyway, it was nice to see him go. Glory drew in a long shuddering. Breath. She started to say something. But Fenner interrupted. Guy who killed Lindsay's daughter is dead. You're still my client. The Lindsay business is for the cops to work out. Maybe they'll find out about 
Thaler. Maybe they'll even get a line on you, but I'm not helping them. As far as I'm concerned I'm through. You can link up with Noalan and go with him as fast as you like. I don't. Like you, baby, and I don't like Noalan. I'll be glad to get back home. Whatever happens to you means nothing to me. You can be sure something. Will happen to. You. A Jane with your outlook can't last long. Rai leave. It like that. He got up and wandered to the door, then, without looking. Back, he went out of the room. Noalan was standing in the hall, staring up, as he walked down the stairs. He didn't even bother to look at him. Out in the street he took a deep breath, pulled at his nose thoughtfully, then set off at a fast pace in the direction of the Pan-American airport. The end.